Hello. Good morning, all. On, be on behalf of uh, Rajasthan Hospital Pulmonary Medicine team, I, Dr. Aishwarya, welcome all of you, all of you to the first interventional pulmonary update 2022. Apna Hospital, Rajasthan Hospital, from its name and mission, has always given each of us, including me, to t gave us a homely feeling homely feeling and a freedom to work. Today, with immense pleasure, we welcome each and everyone on behalf of Rajasthan Hospital to our first interventional pulmonology update 2022 conducted here and we would like everyone to coordinate to make it an interactive session. As we all know, interventional pulmonology has revolutionized the field of pulmonary medicine and it is only because of it you all are here. So let me, let me tell you that the field of pulmonary medicine was providing the most minimally invasive procedures in the field of pulmonary medicine. I am taking few minutes of each of you to tell you about the pulmonary medicine journey of RHL. To start with, we started with basic bronchoscopy. Now we have progressed to rigid bronchoscopy, thoracoscopy, cryobiopsy, EBUS extending, dilatation, and many more, and to conquer many more. Now, I'm not taking much of time. Let me start this session. Let me invite our chairperson, Dr. Shubhra Jain and BK Meghwal to the dais. Good morning, everyone. Uh, so let's uh, start our uh, beautiful morning with one of the best orator and debater, Dr. Sahjal Duria. And he will be introduced by Dr. Meghwal. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Dr. Sahjal Duria. <coughs> is the at present associate professor in pulmonary medicine at PGI Chandigarh. His areas of interest is interstitial lung diseases, sarcoidosis, international pulmonology. He received so many awards. Satbir Award in 2016, awarded by the Indian Council for the Medical Research. And uh, he also received TR Raghupati Rao Oration at the Broncocon 2019. He has so many publications, 256 at least, very large number. Now I invite Dr. Sajal for his presentation. Ladies and gentlemen, a very good morning. And thank you, Chairperson, for the kind introduction. Thank you, organizers, for giving me a chance to talk to you. So as this uh, entire conference is all about interventional pulmonology, and I'm opening the game, uh, we'll start with the most basic of all procedures, which is flexible bronchoscopy. And basics of flexible bronchoscopy is itself a kind of a full day workshop. But because we have limited time and we have uh, such a comprehensive program with advanced uh, IP lectures, so I'm, I'm going to limit myself to a few subtopics. So I'm going to deal with indications of flexible bronchoscopy. And uh, then I'm going to take up all the different basic uh, flexible bronchoscopic procedures, including BAL, that is bronchoalveolar lavage, endobronchial brushing, endobronchial needle aspiration, endobronchial biopsy, and transbronchial lung biopsy. And uh, as I go along, I'll also discuss some of the contraindications and complications of these procedures. So indications of flexible bronchoscopy may be divided into diagnostic and therapeutic procedures. Amongst the diagnostic procedure, what you can do is you can have a radiologic lesion which you want to sample. And there, based on the radiology, you perform a diagnostic procedure. The other way can be, which is 
much less common is that you have a symptom but don't have a radiologic uh, lesion but you still go ahead with the flexible bronchoscopy the most important thing uh, to ensure a good bronchoscopic diagnosis is to have a differential diagnosis in mind so it all starts with clinical history and examination that is the clinical evaluation and there you have you uh, form in your mind some kind of clinical suspicion then you do a radiologic uh, test which may be a chest x-ray and it may be followed by a ct scan and before you proceed to bronchoscopy you should have a pre procedure differential diagnosis because sometimes bronchoscopy is not a definitively diagnostic procedure sometimes it helps you to exclude certain things so if you have a few differentials in mind before going ahead with the procedure then you can really exclude some of them and reach to a diagnosis even if the bronchoscopic diagnosis is not definite so what are the indications indications of flexible bronchoscopy are based on clinical radiologic uh, entities so you might have clinical suspicions of certain etiologies for example infections malignancy airway disorders diffuse lung diseases and certain miscellaneous disorders and then you have corresponding radiologic lesions which are more morphologic or anatomic part of the diagnosis so for example you might have infections acute or chronic which may present with lung nodules a consolidation which may be non resolving a cavity or a ground glass opacity malignancies might present with lung nodules or masses there can also be mediastinal mass or nodes sometimes they may be cavitating malignancies or non resolving consolidation airway disorders may present themselves as lung nodules which may be uh, localized to the airway in the ct scan itself they may sometimes present with just a consolidation or a collapse then you might have diffuse lung diseases which may be diffuse infection sometimes or it may be diffuse inflammatory lung diseases the so called ild there you might have uh, findings of interstitial thickening or ground glass opacity and then miscellaneous disorders can present with any of these so again I'll, i would like to stress upon the fact that you have a etiology in mind you have a morphologic uh, lesion in front of you on the ct scan but then form some kind of a differential diagnosis of two or three or four differentials before you proceed with the bronchoscopy therapeutic flexible bronchoscopy i'm not going to go into the details i'll just tell you the indications because i'm just talking about the basics so uh, therapeutic uses of bronchoscopy especially flexible bronchoscopy may be in the form of tracheobronchial toileting a foreign body removal which is one of the commonest indications and especially in the pediatric uh, age group it may be a bronchoscopy guided intubation in critically ill patients it may be tackling malignant central airway obstruction using uh, ablation of tumors by using instruments such as electrocautery apc cryotherapy brachytherapy pret that is photodynamic therapy or lasers stents are more advanced and they may be self expandable metallic stents which may be deployed with a flexible bronchoscope silicone stents require a rigid bronchoscope for sure and benign central airway uh, obstructions are sometimes treated with radial electrocautery cuts as in the case of uh, tracheal stenosis that is post intubation or and or balloon balloon dilatation is also used for the same purpose then moving on to the individual basic bronchoscopic procedures so the first one is bronchoalveolar lavage which is also called a liquid biopsy of the lung the minimal lavage fluid that you use during a bal is 100 ml uh, but it varies from 100 to 300 ml and it is 2 to 3 ml in uh, per kg in pediatric age group a lavage is done when it is done with a volume of 120 ml it samples approximately 1 million alveoli which is about 1.5 to 3% of the overall lung panel it is different from a bronchial wash so in a bronchial wash what you do is you take the sample from the larger airways while in a bronchoalveolar lavage you go to the smaller airways and the alveoli which is done in alveolar filling disorders or diffuse lung diseases the amount of fluid instilled in bronchoalveolar lavage is as i said it is 100 ml with washings it is about 20 to 30 ml typically so when you are doing a bronchial volar lavage you first have to choose the site so you choose the area of the greatest abnormality on a ct scan or a chest x ray it is mostly uh, a good idea to perform a ct scan on a chest x ray it's usually not able uh, you are usually not able to make out the particular segment of uh, interest if it's a diffuse lung disease then one of the segments or sub segment of the middle lobe or the lingula should be chosen because that will give you a better return in the lower lobe the return of the fluid is poor generally you can go to the upper lobe the anterior or the posterior segment of the upper lobe 
if there are localized lesions some uh, if there are uh, more diffuse lesions sometimes two to three sites can be chosen for better representation so the procedure is that during a bal you first take the bronchoscope to the specific segment that you want to sample wedge the bronchoscope into that segment so that there is no leak around the scope because once you are going to instill the fluid fluid if it is not wedged properly it will just come out so how you wedge you just push the scope against the wall of the airway and wherever it stops due to the resistance then that is called wedging then you instill warm physio uh, warm saline physiological means warmed at a temperature of the body about 37 degree centigrade that is mostly approximate because in colder uh, climates you may might have at room the room temperature is very low so there it might induce stopping in the patient and if you are doing large lavages then uh, like for example in whole lung lavage it can actually cause hypothermia but in bal it will not cause so uh, after that once you have instilled the saline then you uh, better wait for some time so it is called the dwell time you can give some uh, most guidelines would say that a dwell time is not required but giving a dwell time of about 3 to 5 seconds is mostly a good idea then apply gentle suction or aspirate with a 20 ml syringe so the suction can be applied in various ways it can be connected to the wall suction which is a greater strength of suction it can go to several hundred millimeters of mercury but if you are using wall suction limit yourself to 100 millimeters of mercury negative pressure so we are uh, we don't know which is the better technique whether using a syringe is better or whether using a wall suction is better so at our center we are conducting this rct where we are comparing three different techniques which have been described in the literature one is to apply the wall suction with a mucus strap the other is to put the syringe uh, connect the syringe to the instrument channel and then suck it with a 20 ml syringe the third one is that you insert a catheter into the uh, suction channel that is the instrument channel attach a syringe and through that catheter the return comes so we are comparing these three techniques in an rct which is still ongoing then the use usefulness of bal basically has so when bal started several decades ago when it was the only available procedure was when biopsies were not being done during flexible bronchoscopy then bal had a lot of utility because just the kind of cells that you are getting from the bal or if you are finding malignant cells in the bal then it used to be hugely useful nowadays because better procedures more advanced procedures like biopsies are available so bal is using some of its utility because in some of the cases the sensitivity is really low and in some of the cases it is not very specific also and because you have biopsies especially cryo biopsies now in case of diffuse lung diseases the utility of bal and the indications for bal alone are coming down although you can combine it with other procedures like biopsy so it is most useful i would say in today's era with pulmonary infections because a bal with a good return mostly will give you a microbiologic diagnosis even if cytologic diagnosis is not possible pulmonary malignancies especially which affect the airways the smaller airways or the parenchyma so for example if you have bronco alveolar carcinoma that spreads through the air spaces so there if you do a bal because it is sampling the alveolar uh, compartment it can, it may give you a diagnosis but if you have a a uh, central lesion then bal is not useful there you have endobronchial biopsy and endobronchial as i told you washings which can be used a differential cell count is useful mainly in eosinophilic pneumonia where it is almost diagnostic at least you will be able to find that the lung is showing eosinophilia although you may have differentials after that and the other thing is the other kind of diffuse lung diseases for example hypersensitivity pneumonitis where a 30% lymphocyte differential count might give you might give you a kind of differentiation from other disorders like idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis however in our practice we have seen in, and dr shitu would agree that mostly our patients with hypersensitivity pneumonitis have fibrotic disease and they have long standing disease so in that case we usually uh, do not find lymphocytosis in most of these patients so i would say that in our in our center maybe 30 to 40% of hp patient will have 30% lymphocytosis because they have long standing disease and mostly uh, later in the course they will just reveal neutrophilia in pulmonary alveolar proteinosis bal is diagnostic because even on gross appearance you find a milky kind of appearance which is almost diagnostic of pap because there there are hardly any differentials for that kind of appearance one should not mis mistake it for past ct test when you do a uh, 
हिस्टोलॉजी और माइक्रोस्कोपिक एग्जामिनेशन ऑफ बाल एंड पैप देन यू फाइंड पास पॉजिटिव मटीरियल विच इज ऑलमोस्ट डायग्नोस्टिक सो पलमरी इन्फेक्शन एंड पलमरी एलवियोलर प्रोटीनोसिस आर द टू डिजॉर्डर्स वेयर बाल इज मोस्टली डायग्नोस्टिक इन एलवियोलर हेमरेज यू विल हैव आइदर सीरियली इंक्रीजिंग ब्लडीनेस ऑफ द फ्लूड और इफ यू डू अ माइक्रोस्कोपी यू विल फाइंड हीमोसिडर इन लेडन माइक्रोपेजेस so the procedure uh, this is a procedure video of bal so as i told you what you uh, this is the trachea and you are moving to the right side of the uh, airways and then in this particular case you can see the secondary carina here the upper part this is the upper lobe bronchus this is the intermediate bronchus and here you are moving into the uh, right upper lobe bronchus into the anterior segment and there also in uh, you keep on pushing the scope and finally you get into one of the sub segment so this is a sub segment of the anterior segment of the right upper lobe and then you instill warm physiological saline generally it is instilled in alicots of 60 ml so uh, previously uh, and I, at a few centers i have seen that people are using very small amount of fluid maybe 30 ml 20 ml that will not give you a good ball return and that will not give you a diagnosis in most of the cases so go ahead with at least a 120 ml fluid take two alicots of 60 ml fluid in a 250 ml syringe and then you instill it in one of the segments which you select properly on radiology sometimes there will be multifocal disease and if you are not sure that you, you are going to get a diagnosis from sampling a single site then you can put 120 ml each in two different sites so you can go up to 300 ml but you have to be careful if the patient is for example very hypoxemic or if it's a thin built low like a short statured patient who has a weight of say 35 kg he is thin built then you should not go to the higher limit of ball that is 300 ml you mostly restrict yourself to about 120 to 200 ml but less than 120 ml you will not find a good diagnostic yield because there was in fact a study where they have studied 60 ml of ball fluid versus 120 ml so in the 60 ml arm they just found bronchial epithelial cells and it was mostly bronchial sampling so it does not even reach the alveolar compartment if you put 120 ml and give some 4 to 5 seconds of dwell time then you really get the alveolar fluid which will give you the diagnosis in filling disorders alveolar filling disorders so uh, moving on to the second procedure which is endobronchial biopsy endobronchial biopsy can also be combined with other endobronchial procedures for endobronchial lesions which is bronchial washing endobronchial brushing and endobronchial needle aspiration uh i would say that after ball endobronchial biopsy is the simplest and the most frequently used uh, technique because uh, lung cancer is a common uh, kind of uh, a disorder for which bronchoscopy is performed and in a lot of lung cancer patients the growth is more central so you can actually see the growth in the airways and there you uh, there you actually use these procedures endobronchial biopsy has a yield of about 75% on an average endobronchial brushing has about 60% endobronchial needle aspiration about 55% and endobronchial wash about 40 to 50% once you combine all the four procedures in a single patient then you can reach an yield of about 88 to 90% so it is uh, always a good idea to combine all the procedures if they can be combined this is uh, the picture of various kinds of endobronchial brushes that can be used so they can be thin small bristles and or they can be thicker uh more closely spaced larger bristles so any of them can be selected based on the size of the growth so this is an example video of an endobronchial brush you perform an endobronchial brush when you see a fleshy red colored growth if you have a whitish growth then that white part is mostly necrosis so if you do a uh, brushing over a necrotic area you are not going to find too many malignant cells you just find necrosis in the histology also so in this particular case we have this fleshy red looking growth and what we are doing here is this is the sheath and you the technician will just push the outer part and then the brush comes out and you just rub it over the surface of the growth so it uh, one thing is that it will give you a definite yield in some of the tumors where even a biopsy might not be required sometimes the tumor may bleed after a endobronchial brush and it may not allow you to do a biopsy there you have to be careful because if you are if you are suspecting a vas very vascular tumor 
then it's a better idea that you just go ahead with a single biopsy tissue because it will not allow you to conduct more biopsies because it will bleed profusely even in the first bite and you should have your uh, cold saline and adrenaline ready if you are expecting too much bleeding in tumors like suspected carcinoids or especially in rcc uh, endobronchial metastasis these tumors bleed even more so it is a good idea to do a ct bronchial angiography before you plan a bronchoscopy and if you see a feeding vessel in the ctba you go ahead with a dsa that is uh, the conventional angiography digital subtraction and along with a bronchial artery embolization before you go ahead with a flexible uh, flexible bronchoscopic endobronchial biopsy so a brush may also be useful because it can give you a slide immediately so you can make smears you can also make touch smears from biopsies which you can immediately see on site which is called rose rapid on site evaluation and immediately you might know that we have found some malignant cells in the tumor the final diagnosis may be made by the pathologist when they get the better tissue this is endobronchial needling so this is just the tbna needle which we use commonly for transbronchial needle aspiration so the sheath should be seen outside the scope and then you push in the needle into the growth and then you apply suction at the back end the technician will do it and you slightly move the needle in and out just like you do it in tbna but here you have to be a little more gentle with tbna you are just going through the tracheal wall which is quite rigid and solid here it may be a uh, in fact your sheath may sometimes dig into the tumor and cause bleeding so here you have to be gentle in your revolutions or agitations that you perform during the needling needling is especially useful if you have a necrotic growth so if you have a white slough covering the growth if you keep on doing a biopsy from that you'll just find necrosis so deep inside that necrotic part lies the core of the tumor where you can easily reach with a needle so needling is a good idea especially in necrotic tumor these are the different types of uh, flexible forceps which we use for endobronchial and transbronchial biopsy so this is a cup forceps this is an alligator this is this has this forceps has a spur it is especially useful if you are uh, sampling harder growths or if you are taking biopsies from the airway wall for example in cases of bronchiectasis we do an electron microscopy from tracheal biopsies so we usually use this kind of a spur biopsy forceps in that particular in those particular cases so this is uh, the way you perform a endobronchial biopsy you open the forceps you uh, put the forceps in open it then bring it close to the scope then take the scope near the uh, near the growth and then close the forceps over the growth so that you can get a good bite of the tissue generally it is uh, generally it is a good idea to use all modalities because as i told you that individual modalities will give you an yield of 50 to 70% while if you combine all the modalities you can reach an yield of about 90% with necrotic growth ebn is a good idea and bronchial needle aspiration but also what you can do is take multiple biopsies and once you keep on taking biopsies from the same spot the white thing will come out without bleeding and once that white part the necrotic part is taken away then once you uh, biopsy the growth then it will start oozing then you can take further two or three biopsies if the ooze is not much then you can take further two or three biopsies from the area which is oozing because that there you have reached the tumor before that whatever white part you are sampling is mostly necrotic slough it will not give you the diagnosis coagulation profile testing is usually not required for ebb and uh, if you have a thrombocytopenia uh, platelet count less than 50000 or the patient is on anticoagulants or antiplatelets then you should avoid ebb and or be very careful in doing that carcinoids and endobronchial mets as i told you might bleed a lot the major complication is bleeding if a patient starts bleeding it's a better idea to put him put the bleeding site down make the patient lateral so that the other part of the tracheobronchial tree is not uh, flooded then you put some cold saline adrenaline and you can use bronchial blockers or fugati so you can put a fugati balloon to control the bleeding and limit the bleeding to that segment the important thing is don't remove the scope if don't be afraid just looking at the bleeding and don't come out because you have to do a good hemostasis before you remove the scope transbronchial lung biopsy is basically uh, sampling the lung tissue going to the most peripheral part of the lung parenchyma acha okay 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 uh, the indications are diffuse lung diseases and uh, malignancies such as lymphangitis which present like diffuse lung diseases 
contraindications would be uncooperative patient bleeding disorders anticoagulants and a low hemoglobin the procedure as you know you go to the you select a segment go to the most peripheral part when you feel the resistance you come back 2 cm open the forceps and go again you can guide yourself with a fluoroscopic guidance if you have one and then you have to perform a chest radiograph after about 2 hours after the procedure so in this particular case we have selected the segment we have wedged the bronchoscope there we are pushing the forceps in and once a resistance is felt the forceps is withdrawn a bit it is open then it is uh, inserted again then the forceps is closed and finally you get a lung tissue and you might have some oozing if you are sampling the right uh, spot usually 4 to 6 medium sized biopsies are taken during tblb and the major complications are pneumothorax and bleeding so again if you have bleeding don't just come out just wedge the segment and wait for 2 to 3 minutes in 99% of the cases the bleeding will stop automatically you can push in some ice cold saline or adrenaline which is 1 is to 10000 about 3 ml so the take home message from this lecture is that the indications of flexible bronchoscopy mainly include diagnosis of endobronchial masses and parenchymal lesions which are mostly in the form of infections or diffuse parenchymal lung disease the therapeutic indications of flexible bronchoscopy include tracheobronchial toileting placing endobronchial tubes bronchoscopic tumor ablation and stenting so i didn't take up bronchial thermoplasty or endobronchial valves because those are more advanced the basic bronchoscopic procedures are bal ebb cblb and ebb may include other procedures like needle aspiration or washings or uh, brushing and if done properly the use of all these three procedures can achieve diagnosis in most of the patients in routine care if you are sticking to the protocol of taking the appropriate number of biopsies putting the appropriate amount of fluid during bronchial valve bath thank you yeah right okay So let's uh, start with our case. Uh, I would, uh, in between the case of start, I would just like to ask Dr. Sajid, uh, do you do bronchoscope in sitting position? In any case, like in SVC obstruction? Upper, upper, upper. Of bronchial sedation 
Dr. Divya, can you please guide us about the case history? Hello, can you hear me? Uh, yes, you're audible. Okay. I'm just asking, do you use propofol or dexmedetomidine? No, ma'am. No, ma we use uh, dexmedetomidine. Okay. We are not using propofol. Okay. Any question more, ma'am? No. Uh, let's uh, start with our case. Uh, let's, uh, uh, Dr. Shivraj, just give a brief introduction of the case. Yeah. So, this is a 66-year-old case. Coming up with shortness of breath, increased last seven days. Uh, he was having shortness of breath around four or five months with dry cough. And uh, he also had fever for seven days. So X-ray was bilateral lower zone uh, shadows, ground glass, and CT was also um, just please focus on CT scan. Yeah. Okay. Which is right more than the left. So what was your provisional diagnosis in this case? So first diagnosis is pneumonia. Okay. So and it's then uh, interstitial lung diseases. ANA of this patient is already positive, showing. Uh, Mixed connective tissue disorder pattern. So okay. we will go and we will try to take uh, Levas, bronchial velar uh, wash, and maybe uh, trans bronchial lung biopsy. Hmm. But so, main focus of this session is how to do a bronchoscopy with uh, fiber optic bronchoscope for the beginners, like segmental anatomy and the procedure itself. So our main focus will be on for the beginners. Okay. Right? So you are taking bowel from right lower loop. Yes. yes. So this is the fiber optic bronchoscope we are using. Uh, video person, please focus on Dr. Shivraj. So this bronchoscope consists of two parts, handle and a tube-like structure. At the end of which you can see the two light source. Yes, we can see and that. There is a channel which starts from here and continue till this handle and connect with these two channels. One is suction channel and one is this instrument channel, and we call it working channel all together. So here is a knob by which we can move the tip of the bronchoscope approximately 180 degree or distally 130 degree okay for sideways movement we don't have any knob so we use extension and flexion of the rib for the guiding and what is its outer channel this is diameter our suction channel this is our instrument channel the outer diameter is uh, 5. Point Eight and the working channel diameter is 2.6. So we can use this bronchoscope for therapeutic purpose also. Okay, let's start. So now I hand over this bronchoscope to ma'am to start the procedure. So just a note that endotracheal tube should be of size 2 mm larger than a conventional bronchoscope. Uh, cameraman, please focus so bronchoscope where ma'am is entering. Tube. So suppose it's having a channel diameter of 6. So ET tube should be of size 8 mm, at least 8 mm. Then only bronchoscope will be included. Uh, Shubra ma'am, you're not audible. Can you please repeat the question? Uh, no, no, I was just discussing with audience. Now am I audible? Ah, yes ma'am. Okay. Cameraman, please focus on the nose of the patient. So it's the topical so anesthesia. Is, uh, yeah. A simple procedure is once you master 
it requires hand eye coordination or muscle memory you and can uh, anatomy of the bronchial tree zoom out a little bit so we are entering from the no nasal route you can see here cameraman please bronchial. zoom out and now we are in the oral cavity you can just see just focus on video and glottis here yeah you can clearly see we have to see the movement of the nasal cord here yes are we clearly visible yes now? yes it's clearly visible just focus on yes so you can see Uh, airy epitonoid, airy uh, arytenoid folds and interarytenoid membranes here, and a V-shaped cavity which leads to the trachea. So we will check the movements of uh, vocal cords here, and inspiration and in expiration, we can see the movements are equal. So it appears that the vocal cords are normal. now we are entering in the trachea upper part of the trachea and this portion is basically hypopharynx you can see this, this part is this upper part is basically area of the thyroid cartilage yeah we have so are you using 1% lignocaine Dr. Shivraj, how yeah. much lignocaine are you using? Dr. Shubhra is asking. Yeah. Yes. So basically, one percent lignocaine, three to five aliquots are required. Okay. So we have entered trachea and we have reached up to the carina. This is C1 carina, and this is quite sharp. And you can see the two uh, tubes emerging from here. one right side and one left side so now uh, we will move our bron bronchoscope 90 degree to enter in the left side so basically there are two segmental classification boyden and jackson uber you can use either a segment name segment as apical anterior so posterior yes in left main bronchus and now hello yes we can hear dr shivraj yeah. now you can see the two division yes upper division and the lower division So, hello. Yes, yes, we can hear, and we can clearly see left upper lobe bronchus yeah. and left lower lobe. Left lobe. You lobe. just uh, so right show the lingual. The left upper lobe has a pico posterior and yes. anterior segment. Yes, and this is lingula. So you can see the left upper lobe is divided into again two segments. The yeah. upper one is the apical posterior segment. You can see two openings there. The left one is apical and posterior LB one and LB two we called it, and the lower one is yes. So LB one, LB two, and LB three we have seen. now we enter in the lingular segment but the lingula what is it so it's superior lingular and inferior lingular we will try to show you lingular segments again Yeah, I can. I think we can see that lingula. We can now. So now. 
now you can see left lower lobe there are three openings so you can identify two carina here one the left one is the proximal and the second one is the distal so the main division is from the proximal carina so what you can see the left one is the apical segment and the this one right one is the lower lobe proper yes we can remember by mal medial anterior lateral posterior segment yeah so medial basal is absent here and Yes, I think let's go to right side. Yes, sir. Yes. So you can see seven is the absent here, eight, nine, ten is there, and we count all these segments in clockwise fashion. I think this will also be better seen in live case workshop. Also. Yeah. so this is right upper lobe we can see here mercury's band sign there are three openings one is superior one is posterior which is which looks posteriorly and one is anterior so these are rb1 rb2 and rb3 this is secondary carina now we are entering in the bron bronchus intermedia and now we can see three opening again opening of the middle lobe and opening of the lower lobe how can you identify which is middle lobe and lower lobe you identify the carina which is, which is the proximal carina first identify the proximal carina and the proximal carina actually divides the middle lobe and lower lobe so whenever there is a confusion identify the carina which is the most proximal so this is lower lobe proper which we can so, see and yeah yeah and on the left side this is the middle lobe middle lobe so we enter in the middle lobe and clear cut two divisions are there so the medial one is the medial and lateral one is the lateral and the medial and lateral position is identified while li lying down in a position uh by uh, taking a line which is going uh, from the midline of the patient so all these lobes are clear there are no growth no hyperemia no erosion and this is lower lobe proper so you can see in the left you can identify again a carina is the division and you can see on the left that a uh, tube is out shooting what is this it was not there in the left side this is the superior segment and this is rb6 now we are entering in the basal segment Ma'am, we can't hear you. Now I am going okay. to take ball from the right lower lobe because the main pathology at the right lower lobe. And I wear the bronchoscope to the right lower basal segment. And now, please put normal saline in the liquid. Yeah. So at least 100 ml of the normal saline will we be pushed, and we'll try to derive at least 10%. Even 200 ml or 300 ml can be pushed, and the yield should be at least 10 percent. So 20 ml liquid, 60 ml 
as Dr. Sajal also pointed out. Yes, we can minimum, minimum for bronchiolar alveolar 60 to 100 ml and flexible should be minimum 10 percent and maximum we can add 200 to 300. So you can see total 100 to 200 ml can be given, giving. but if flexible is sufficient for the interest of investigation, we can stop at any time because more fluid can lead to the hypoxia. So whatever lavage is required. Can we focus on mucus tab, how much lavage is coming after, how much uh, volume you have put till now? Yeah, yeah we can see that. Yes. And this lavage should be sent for the culture as well as pathology. So, as it is a diffuse lung disease, a uh, differential valve is very important. And differential cell count is important to narrow down the interstitial lung disease causes. Okay. Second procedure we do brush. Sample is adequate, so we stop the lavage and now we proceed for the bronchial brush. Let's see. Yes. So in case you have like you have to do bowel, you have to do bronchial wash as well as biopsy. Then first procedure you will take is bowel, followed by bronchial washing, and then followed by endobronchial biopsy. However, some case may be different as pointed out by Dr. Sajal where we know that uh, if we do brushing it will lead to bleeding in case of necrotic tumor. So, we can directly do biopsy also. Washing can be taken at 3 as well as 4. Yes. And uh, biopsy is in between. And first sample procedure bath. Bath is very important. Now, I am In these cases, I think uh, CM guided or fluoroscopic guided uh, lung biopsy may yield better yield. Yes. But uh, ma'am, are you taking in this case also PBLB? Uh, yes, we are having doubt of the uh, mixed connective tissue disorder, so we also take the PBLB. Okay. Now you can clearly so, see the uh, breath here. Breath is here. Threshold for bowel is we know it's 20,000 and uh, for platelet count and for bronchial biopsy it's 50,000. So, uh, ma'am, are you taking brush? Yes. Yes, yes we are uh, taking not selected, but we have selected this brush is good for the quantitative culture and uh, preferable and use is PSB brushing, yes. Three to four bronchial brush, uh, brushings are required usually. And if we go for endobronchial pieces, then at least four to five bronchial biopsy pieces are required. MSP? Again, 
one of the most important contraindication for tblb is patient is extremely uncooperative and excessively coughing then we cannot do tbl because otherwise this will definitely lead to pneumothorax and bleeding Basically, in, yes. Uh, boss, please explain the technique of TBLB that uh, how long we go uh, with this yeah. needle. So, we have a very small tissue here, probably not visible. So, we do it again. We will wedge this scope in the basal segment and we will put this biopsy forceps and we will advance biopsy forceps till the resistance uh, field. Then we slightly push back the uh, forceps, we open the mouth of forceps and we again then advance and try to cup the tissue there and cut and we will come back after this cutting. So, the scope is wedged, now we are ending this biopsy forceps in the instrument channel, we gradually advancing this, so that we can see it coming out in the monitor. Now you can see it is coming out and it is closed, we are advancing it further till the resistance felt. So, I think here resistance is there. Yes. I so, slight withdrawal. Open, please. Open. Everybody. Again, advancement. We will pick the tissue. The forceps will cut. Close, please. And how? This is how we can cut the tissue and retrieve. Uh, another another contraindication for TBLB is, can anyone tell me apart from uncooperativeness and other thing, the severe pulmonary hypertension, that is also one of the contraindication for TBLB. Small, there is a small tissue, so we try again, there is no bleeding. Also, while doing this TBLP, though this patient is under sedation, if we are yeah. doing under conscious sedation, we can ask that whether you experience pain or not. Right. At the time we uh, take the piece. So that will show it us that we are reaching near pleura, and uh, it will be a good sample. So now a little bleed is there. It is still manageable. So, I think it is your third pass. You are doing this third, third pass? pass? Yes. yes. So slowly, I am advancing. The uh, do we have rows there? also? Hello? Do we, uh, do we have availability of rows rapid on site evaluation? Okay. So I'm entering the basal segment. And here I okay. felt the resistance. Okay. okay. Can you hold this scope here? I want to fix the scope to minimize the movement. Now I am withdrawing, open, I 
will again enter floor so it was not a good cut i can feel that only a little bleeding maybe try to take one more we want a complete diagnosis in this procedure only so we have to take adequate sample if we have a rapid onsite examination we are very sure about that yes the tblb we can also have those so that we can know the age no problem accessible with each so the area is not clear now it is clear so i withdraw slightly the scope just a uh, discussion just to reach competency in bronchoscopy uh, do you know how many bronchoscopy you need to so do now 50 I am supervised 50 and unsupervised this you must I do to reach competency in bronchoscopy open close and now i fed i have cut some tissue the line Saline, saline. Uh, for routine bronchoscopy, we usually don't go for PT INR, but for those patients who are having renal disease or those who are on anticoagulants, uh, in those patients we can go for uh, PT INR. One of the relative contraindication. Yes, the last yes. Tissue was adequate for our diagnostic test. Okay. So we are stopping here. I just want to show you a recap of normal anatomy. So beginners now can see and identify. what they are looking at the line so right right now i don't know i am where so i will retract the scope to identify any landmark which can guide me where i am so yes, this is very important if once you don't know where you are you just push back your bronchoscope little uh, uh, proximal and just go to the landmark which you know or if you don't know anything go back to carina bending of so there is much bending of the scope i think uh, this case is over now let's uh, can we finish should we finish this okay uh, dr shivraj and dr yes, chand bhandari yes, ma'am yes, yes. I will show again anatomy very fast. So beginners can see and identify themselves what we are looking at. Mm -hmm. Entering in the right main bronchus, right upper lobe bronchus. This is mercury so main sign. Yes. B1, B2, B3, apical, posterior, and anterior segment, and right side. This is Boyden classification and another yes. is Jackson Uber. Now this is? 
I think, uh, Dr. Shivraj, let's go a little faster because okay. inauguration is going to start. Okay. It was really a wonderful case. And you uh, did showed all the anatomy very properly. And they can also see in uh, stations also. Okay. Okay. So now uh, we are stopping the procedure. Thank you so much, boss. And let's finish this case and over to you. Thank you, the entire OT team. And I'd like to express my special thanks to Dr. Shubrajin and Dr. B.K. Meghwal. Ma'am, please take. Uh, now, uh, I'll request Dr. Shitu Singh, ma'am, to kindly uh, give a token of momento to Dr. Shubrajin, ma'am, and to Dr. B.K. Meghwal, sir. A token of momento will be given to all to our respective sir, Dr. Shahjal Duria by Shitun. Thank you all. To make this morning a blessed one, by the blessing of the goddess Saraswati, let's start the inauguration function. Let me welcome Dr. Neha to the dais. Unity is strength and there is teamwork with collaboration. Good fortune is what happens and when opportunity meets planning. A very good morning to one and all and a very warm welcome to beautiful pink city which post monsoon have turned into a green city. Standing here amongst the audience comprising of dignitaries and delegates with great wisdom, experiences, achievements. With this we uh, initiate with the inauguration ceremony. Mahavir Jaipuria Rajasthan Hospital, also known as Apna Aspatal Rajasthan Aspatal. This prestigious institution commences since 2018 with mission of, to provide quality care at affordable cost. The vision of healing for all are the strong pillars. The organizational values presides over with care, transparency, respect, understand, skill, and teamwork. International pulmonology is an exciting scope. Young doctors want to have a better understanding and knowledge in the similar prospects. 
So the objective for uh, RHL IP update is one of the first kind of live cases for bronchoscopy, cryo lung biopsy, thoracoscopy, EBUS. The unique updates are that we have we have hands-on uh, workstation. Also, we have exciting challenges. One of the first kind uh, live cases, cryo lung biopsy, would be demonstrated in Rajasthan hands-on station for the participants who want to do the procedures. Moving forward, I would like to request the dignitaries to face on the dais. Uh, for this, I would like to call upon uh, our chief guest for the day, Dr. S.K. Sarkar, sir. The name needs no introduction. He is better known as the father of bronchology in Rajasthan. Post his MBBS in 1968 and MS in 1973. In uh, 19, uh, thoracic, uh, thoracic surgery in 1974, he was formally associated as head department of thoracic surgery, chest hospital, SMS Medical College, Jaipur. And currently, he's working as the director and consultant, thoracic surgeon, Dr. Sarkar's Bronchoscopy Center. He's editor in chief of Current Medical Trends and indexed quarterly medical journal and past chief in. Uh, Editor-in-Chief to Indian Journal for Broncos Bronchoscopy. His lifetime achievement in the field of bronchoscopy uh, he received in January 2005 and a lifetime achievement award in the field of cardiovascular and thoracic surgery in February 2014. His achievements are not less. Uh, Dr. T. N. Sharma Orator Award by NCCP Rajasthan and the first thoracic su surgeon to start fibro optic bronchoscopy in Rajasthan in 1978 for 25,500 procedures. More than 100 publications are to his credit, national and international. He's organizing president to Fort APCB 2012. His contribution to society is not less. He's been devoted to science and associated with, uh, and contribution to society is also there. The social work for the upliftment of poor patients and suffering mankind by free distribution by drugs and free consultations to poor. I would welcome, sir. Um, I already uh, have Dr. S. S. Agarwal, sir, Chairman Swast Kalyan and RHL. He was a past in national president to IMA 2016. I also welcome Dr. Virendra Singh, sir, President RHL, former MS2 SMS Hospital and a proud recipient of VC Roy Award. I would also like to call upon Dr. Shitu Singh, former associate professor, SMS Medical College, and assistant editor to International Respiratory General Thoracic. Sir, uh, we'll wait for Sir Nalin, sir. So, um, Further, without ado, uh, I would like to call upon Dr. Nishtha, who is an executive uh, director and senior pulmonology consultant, Asthama Bhavan Jaipur, to welcome Dr. S.K. Sarkar with a bouquet. Light symbolizes victory over darkness and defeat ignorance. It marks the beginning of auspicious moments. Prayer is not asking. Prayer is about oneself holding hands in front of God for their blessings. God Saraswati can enlighten us from all directions when we seek for blessings with full dedication and devotion. As days are too long and busy, hours are few, seconds are fast, but here is the time to update ourselves. I would welcome our dignitaries for the lamp lightning. I would also like to call upon Dr. Sarvesh, sir, Dr. A.D. Mathur, sir, for the lamp lightning. Shine and 
Once again, I would like to invite Dr. S. S. Agarwal sir to um, give a welcome note for the gathering. Vande Matram.
आर एच एल यानी राजस्थान हॉस्पिटल के प्रेसिडेंट डॉक्टर वीरेंद्र सिंह पल्मोनोलॉजी और इस पूरी इंटरनेशनल जो आर एच एल पल्मोनोलॉजी अपडेट हो रही है इसकी संयोजक और यंग नई सितारा सितारी सितारा डॉक्टर शीतु सिंह यहाँ बैठे हुए मेरे मित्र और बैचमेट डॉक्टर भूपेंद्र मेघवाल डॉक्टर सर्वेश डॉक्टर ए बी माथुर डॉक्टर मधुर और सभी जगह से आए हुए सारे डेलीगेट्स राजस्थान हॉस्पिटल की फैकल्टी आप सबका यहाँ पर बहुत बहुत हार्दिक अभिनंदन और स्वागत राजस्थान हॉस्पिटल शुरू से ही अपना एक कुछ विजन मिशन और कोर वैल्यू के साथ अपनी ये जर्नी चालू करी 2018 सितंबर में हमने इसका आउटडोर चालू किया था और दो जनवरी के अंदर हमने यहाँ पर एडमिशन चालू किए थे लेकिन उस टाइम हमने केवल अपने जो विजन मिशन और जो कोर वैल्यूज अपने रखी उससे हमने समझौता नहीं करते हुए आगे की हमारी यात्रा चालू करी क्यों कि हम और डॉक्टर वीरेंद्र सिंह जो कि हम 50 बरस से उन्नीस सौ से हम साथ साथ हैं और इस वेंचर के अंदर भी कि जयपुर के अंदर और पर्टिकुलरली और इन जनरल राजस्थान के अंदर एक ऐसा अपना सेंटर बनाए जिसके अंदर क्वालिटी केयर एट अफोर्डेबल कॉस्ट हो हीलिंग फॉर ऑल हीलिंग का मतलब यहाँ पर केवल ट्रीटमेंट से नहीं है अगर पेशेंट का हीलिंग का जिसके अंदर की सारे के सारे होल ऑफ द स्पेक्ट्रम आ जाता है हेल्थ केयर का और उसके अंदर हम पेशेंट की हीलिंग से हमारा विजन है इसी प्रकार हमारी जो कोर वैल्यूज हमने रखी हैं वो कोर वैल्यूज हमारी केयर और ट्रस्ट केयर पेशेंट केयर और ट्रस्ट ट्रस्ट में आपको मालूम है कि पांच शब्द हैं टी आर यू एस टी टी का मतलब ट्रांसपेरेंसी हमारा अस्पताल के अंदर आप सबकी जानकारी के लिए टोटल ट्रांसपेरेंसी हमने रखी हुई है और उसका हमने सभी जगह शीशे भी लगाए हुए हैं जिससे कि कोई भी जगह किसी भी प्रकार का लॉक या अंधेरा नहीं है सब जगह जो है लाइट एक्सेसिबल है सन लाइट लाइट तो सब जगह होती है लेकिन सन लाइट दूसरा है रेस्पेक्ट आर से रेस्पेक्ट सिर्फ टी आर यू यू से है अंडरस्टैंडिंग और साथ ही हमारा जो अस्पताल का एक ए, मोटो बना हुआ है कि ये हॉस्पिटल के साथ साथ एक हीलिंग होम है और इसके अंदर हेल्थ केयर पर्सनल और जो डॉक्टर्स या जो जितने भी लोग बाग हैं वो एक तरीके से अपने आप को रेलिवेंट स्पेशलिटी के अंदर 
एक्सेल करें इस प्रकार का एटमोसफियर क्रिएट करने की कोशिश करी गई है आपकी जानकारी के लिए मैं आपको बता देना चाहता हूँ कि ये अस्पताल एन एक्रेडिटेड है एन एक्रेडिटेड है और सबसे बड़ी बात है कि सी एच ओ आइडेंटिफाइड बाई अमेरिकन फाउंडेशन एज वन ऑफ द टेन नेशनल सेंटर एमिनेंस फॉर द इंफेक्शन कंट्रोल अमेरिकी फाउंडेशन ने जो है ना हमारे इस अस्पताल को पूरे देश के अंदर दस अस्पतालों को लिए हैं उसमें से एक अस्पताल ये है जहाँ की हम एंटीबायोटिक एमिनेंस ऑफ द इंफेक्शन कंट्रोल एंड एंटीबायोटिक डेवर्टिव इसके अलावा भी ग्रीन अस्पताल का आप ही द्वारा 2022 के अंदर इस अस्पताल को अवार्ड दिया गया है और हमने पर्टिकुलरली ये फिफ्थ फ्लोर एकेडमिक ब्लॉक बनाया है जिसके अंदर की लाइब्रेरी डिमॉन्स्ट्रेशन रूम्स और ये ऑडिटोरियम ये बनाया है इसीलिए क्योंकि पहले से ही हमारी ये थी कि बिना एकेडमिक ब्लॉक के या ये कंटिन्यूस एक्टिविटी नहीं रहे तो हम आगे इसको किसी भी प्रकार बढ़ा नहीं सकते हैं मैं आपकी जानकारी के अंदर लाना चाहता हूं कि हमारे यहाँ बी एन बी कोर्सेज भी चालू हो चुके हैं और रेडियो डायग्नोसिस के अंदर हमारे को डिप्लोमा मिल चुका है और बहुत जल्दी ही रेस्पिरेटरी और एनेस्थीशिया के अंदर यहाँ डी एन बी नेक्स्ट सेशन से चालू हो जाएगी और हम इंटरवेंशनल कार्डियोलॉजी के अंदर भी फेलोशिप यहाँ पर चालू करने वाले हैं मैं इसके साथ ही हमारे यहाँ आप सबको आई डी सी सी एम के कोर्स हमारे यहाँ ऑलरेडी चालू हैं और उसके अंदर हम सब देश पूरे के पूरे कर रहे हैं हमारा जो बहुत जल्दी ही कैंसर सेंटर चालू होने वाला है इसके अंदर रेडियोथेरेपी डे केयर कीमोथेरेपी और पेट स्कैन कैंसर सर्जरी ये सारी की सारी हमारी विद इन ए मंथ और के अंदर या फोर वीक्स और टू टू से फोर वीक्स के अंदर हमारी चालू हो जाएगी आप सब लोग आज यहाँ के ऊपर पधारे मैं आप सब लोगों का बहुत बहुत आभार अभिनंदन प्रकट करता हूँ और आप सब लोगों का मेरे को उम्मीद है कि निरंतर सहयोग और आशीर्वाद प्राप्त होता रहेगा जय हिंद जय भारत sir thank you for the warm words now i would like to invite uh, dr shitu singh for the welcome address as an organizing secretary a very good morning to all of you it is my pleasure to uh, welcome you to rhl and uh, this is an event that we were have been trying since uh, now 8 9 months and last time uh, we were planning to keep it in december but due to covid this got postponed so uh, let me just introduce you to our hospital as uh, sir has already done a little bit short from my side as well so this is a hospital that is based on friendship friendship of two very close friends and this friendship blossoms into a partnership between dr s s agrawal and dr virendra singh so currently we boast of one of the most beautiful hospitals in the state of rajasthan built on a area of 3 lakh square yard uh, with a capacity of 450 beds and 250 of them are operational so this is one of the most beautiful uh, hospitals and the quickest to get any bh and any bl and uh, the architecture of the hospital is such that there are three blocks a b and we are currently in the c block and uh, as sir had mentioned we have sunlight on every bed and this has reduced the amount of uh, depression and psychosis especially in the icus and we are a multi speciality hospital and we are uh, based on team work and lot of multi disciplinary uh, discussions and uh, you know approaches let me now brief you about our department of uh, pulmonology which we fondly call as lung center and we uh, are led by the principals of dr virendra singh and me dr madhur joshi dr anupriya agrawal and dr ashwarya so we as a team work towards the benefit of the patient uh, and we had uh, actually i may say that this may be one of the finest departments in the country we pay a lot of emphasis on patient care as well as on academics 
and we have major publications in uh, journals uh, last year we had in plos 1 erj open journal of allergy and clinical immunology i have also uh, been uh, privileged to be uh, starting off as associate ed editor of thorax and our foray <laughs> into intervention you know dates back in 2012 we had you know very limited options available and we always heard of people in mumbai or you know pgi doing e buses and 2012 um, i had done an observership at cleveland and i had that you know wish to start e bus in our state so in 2016 we were the first center in the state to start e bus we have performed 500 e buses as of now and uh, along with that we have now you know went into a uh, whole lung lavages Uh, the first in the state thermoplasty the first in the state and now we have started off uh, rigid bronchoscopy tumor debulking and stent placement so since um, i have an interest in interstitial lung disease uh, we also started cryo lung biopsy once you know it got certified for ild so uh, in the end i will like to give a message to all the young physicians out there you know there's so many uh, physicians coming out every year uh, you have to make a mark at you know individual level and at hospital level uh, the second thing is uh, i would uh, wish to give you a message is that never ignore yourself you have lot of ideas whenever we start young and over the years we kind to uh, tend to suppress those ideas but you know always nurture them for example you know uh, so many fell uh, apples fell on so many people's head but it was newton who discovered gravity and same is a message that all the young pul pulmonologists sitting here i would uh, you know uh, emphasize that don't ignore yourself uh, kindle your ideas and that can become into you know things that can make you to stand apart from the rest of the crowd Uh, today so this workshop uh, is aimed to provide an opportunity to understand the procedures like right from bronchoscopy to advanced procedures like cryo lung biopsy ebus and thoracoscopy in addition we have hands on on mannequins and animal models in the evening also we have a very exciting quiz and there is a very exciting prize for that as well in addition to that the for the first time we have kept an interventional pulmonology uh, image challenge tonight at 8 pm at marriott hotel in which you know an interventional pulmonologist must have nerves of steel so you know whenever we are doing a procedure we face an complication so it is not a fault it is a complication if you are doing 10 procedures you will face two complications so we are going to showcase how the pulmonologist faced that complication and came out of it so uh, this is going to again have an exciting prize our workshop is also registered with rmc credit award uh, also along with that the unique part um, so that's about it i think and uh, i hope that you go more enriched at home please feel uh, free to uh, you know ask questions from our luminaries we have the best on board with us and uh, i hope you learn something and implement that in your clinical practice thank you thank you dr shitu for your motivational words now i would like to invite dr nalin joshi sir to address the esteemed audience मंच पर विराजित मेरे गुरुजन डॉक्टर सरकार साहब जो अभी यात्रा प्रदान्त आपने दिया एमओसी मैम ने कि ये किया वो किया वो यात्रा अगर शुरू हुई तो डॉक्टर रेन सिंह जी जो मेरे गुरु रहे जिनके मार्गदर्शन में मैंने अपनी पीजी की थिसिस लिखी और उन्नीस में, में वो थिसिस जनरल ऑफ अस्थमा में पेपर पब्लिकेशन के लिए लगभग एक्सेप्ट हो गई थी कुछ इश्यूज रहे स्टेटिस्टिक्स के जिसकी वजह से वो अटक गया मामला पर ये सब पार्ट ऑफ गेम है लेकिन वो क्या क्वालिटी ऑफ थीस रहा होगा वो श्रेय वहाँ से जो भी मैं कुछ हूँ अकिंचन आपके सम्मुख वो निर्माण की यात्रा 
वीरेंद्र सिंह जी से चालू हुई जो अवार्ड्स मैंने अचीव किए वो दूसरे गुरु एस के सरकार साहब जिन्होंने मुझे सारे प्रोसीजर सिखाए जिसमें ब्रॉन्कोस को भी था जिससे मैं मेरी रोजी रोटी कमा रहा हूँ और आपके सम्मुख खड़ा हूँ और न केवल यही जब मैं उस अवार्ड के लिए जा रहा था तो यूनिवर्सिटी ग्रांट कमीशन से आप ही की बदौलत मुझे वो ग्रांट मिला अदरवाइज मेरे पास उस समय रिसोर्सेज नहीं थे किसी कारण तो वो क्रेडिट फिर सरकार साहब को जाता है एस एस अग्रवाल साहब ये मेरे ख्याल से हर मेडिकल स्टूडेंट के जो थोड़ा सा भी लीडरशिप रखता है उसकी प्रेरणा स्रोत हैं और ये हमेशा ये सिखाते आए हैं कि मैनेजमेंट कैसे करना है और राजनीति के गंदे कीचड़ में से निकल कर के कमल के कैसे शुद्ध खिले रहना है ये सिखाने वाले एस एस अग्रवाल साहब इन तीनों का सानिध्य मुझे मिला और इनके साथ मंच साझा करने का अवसर मुझे अकिंचन को जो दिया वो मेरी छात्रा ने मुझे दिया शीतू सिंह ने ये एक अद्भुत मेरा भाग्य है कि मैं ये मंच इनके साथ साझा कर रहा हूँ जिनके तो मैं पासंग भी नहीं बैठ सकता पासंग एक छोटा सा रत्ती सा होता है जिसको तराजू पे सुनार रखता है कहीं एक आधे मिलीग्राम के भी इधर एरर हो जाए तो तो ये तो किलोज में तोड़ने वाले हैं और मैं मिलीग्राम की एरर वाला आदमी हूँ पर यह एक बड़ी अद्भुत बात है कि शीतू ने मुझे अवसर दिया तो सबसे ज़्यादा धन्यवाद शीतू का मैं कृतज्ञ हूँ कि इसने मुझे यह मौका दिया नाउ कमिंग टू शीतू शी वॉज अ स्टूडेंट मैंने जब इसको देखा तो ये एक छात्रा थी तो ये सिर्फ ज्ञान ले रही थी वहाँ और इसने ज्ञान लेते लेते इसने बुद्धि विकसित की ज्ञान बुद्धि और मेधा में अंतर है जब आप ज्ञान लेते हैं तो आप सिर्फ एक एकेडमिशियन होते हैं बढ़िया एकेडमी फिर आप उसको बुद्धि में कन्वर्ट करते हैं जिसमें आप देखते हैं कि आप बहुत सारी चीज़ें अपने आप से करने लगते हैं आपको वो जो अभी डिस्क्राइब कर रही थी कि फंस गए ब्रोंगोस्कोपी करते या ई बस करते हुए तो निकलना आने लगता है आपको और फिर आती है मेधा यानी फिर आप कुछ इनोवेटिव करते हो कुछ ऐसा करते हो जो किसी ने सोचा भी नहीं या कुछ ऐसा जो आ, कोई कर ही नहीं सकता क्योंकि धीरे धीरे अभ्यास करते करते आप अपने ज्ञान को बुद्धि में परिवर्तित करते करते उससे भी आगे निकल जाते हो आप स्वयं हो जाते हो मैं शीतु को अपने भाग्य को फिर से सराहता हूँ कि ऐसी स्टूडेंट मेरे पास रही है हालांकि मेरे से डायरेक्ट इसका संबंध नहीं रहा परंतु ये अद्भुत है कि पिता का मैं छात्र रहा और ये मेरी छात्र रही और ये मेधावी है न सिर्फ ज्ञान है बुद्धि है ये मेधावी है और उसी का ये प्रयास है जो अपन सब एक जगह बैठे हैं और ये सब सीखने का अवसर मिल रहा है मैंने इससे रिक्वेस्ट किया था कि मैं आपके इस समारोह में आना चाहता हूँ देखना चाहता हूँ सीखना चाहता हूँ क्योंकि ज्ञान जब तक धार न दी जाए बढ़ता नहीं राजस्थान हॉस्पिटल का भी आभार कि उन्होंने मुझे इस योग्य समझा और मुझे यहाँ बुलाया क्योंकि राजस्थान हॉस्पिटल के तो जब ये चालू होने लगा था तो वो एक वाचनिका बोलते थे ना बचपन में तीतर के तो आगे तीतर तीतर के तो पीछे तीतर तो इनके इधर दो हॉस्पिटल इधर तीन हॉस्पिटल बड़े बड़े वो तो बड़ा अजीब सा और सामंजस्य था पर ये कब शैशव काल में चलते चलते दौड़ने लगे दैट इज़ अगेन यू नो इट्स अ माइल स्टोन फिनोमिन ये एक अद्भुत बात है कि इन लोगों ने ये सारी अचीवमेंट्स किए तो कोई तो कारण है इनके पास अलग से बहुत सारी बातें एस एस अग्रवाल साहब ने बताई हैं और शीतू ने भी उनको एनलाइटन किया है अच्छी इमारत हो सकती है पर घर और मकान में एक अंतर है ये जो इनकी भावना है वो भावना इनको जिताती है हर जगह यहाँ शीतू या वीरेंद्र सिंह जी या जो भी यहाँ चिकित्सक काम करते हैं सारे चिकित्सक मैं उन सब को साधुवाद का पात्र समझता हूँ बिकॉज ये लिखा है पुराणों में पुराणों की बात है कि जो ना आत्मार्थ ना भी काम आ न अपने लिए स्वयं के अर्थ के लिए न किसी काम के लिए मैं अपने दोनों चीज़ों को छोड़ देता हूँ अतभूत दयाम प्रति एक जीव मात्र के लिए दया को प्रदर्शित करते हुए वर्तते यश चिकित्सायाम जो चिकित्सक चिकित्सा करता है सह सर्वमते वर्तते वो सभी जगह विजयी है तो धन्यवाद आपकी पूरी इस टीम को राजस्थान हॉस्पिटल की जिसमें ऐसे चिकित्सक हैं ऐसे चिकित्सा कर्मी हैं जो अद्भुत दयाम प्रति ही वाक्य को लेकर के चलते हैं और डेफिनेटली शीतु मैं फिर से वेद का एक रेफरेंस दूंगा अयम में हस्तो भगवाय मयम में भगवत अयम में विश्व भेष जो अयम शिवाभिमर्शन मेरा ये हाथ भगवान की कृपा से भाग्यशाली है 
मेरा यह हाथ विश्व के सभी औषधि और औषधीय चिकित्सीय गुणों से भरपूर है और मैं इस हाथ से जिसको भी स्पर्श करता हूँ उसको ईश्वर ठीक करता है ये भावना लेकर के मित्रवत अगर हम सामंजस्य बिठा के चलते हैं तो क्या अचीव किया जा सकता है उसकी मिसाल देने के लिए ये सब लोग सामने बैठे हैं और मैं क्रेडिट देना चाहता हूँ मेरे गुरुजनों को वीरेंद्र सिंह जी को एस एस अग्रवाल साहब को और शीतु को बहुत बहुत धन्यवाद आज के इस समारोह के लिए मैं चाहता हूँ आप सब लोग यहाँ बहुत सीखें और ज्ञान की ज्योति को आगे बढ़ाते हुए संघर्ष करें अपने जीवन में अपना नाम Thank you, Nalin sir, for being so generous and having the power of gratitude. Now I would like to invite. We would all love to hear from Dr. S K Sarkar sir. There is some kind, uh, some words of wisdom. Good morning. I'm very happy today to see the galaxy of upcoming oncologists, pulmonologists, senior pulmonologists, and the faculty. I am extremely thankful to Dr. Shitu Singh for inviting me to attend this function and. Be today in front of you. Dignitaries sitting on the dais, Dr. Virendra Singh, the president of this hospital, Dr. Sikhsa Agarwal, chairman of this hospital, Dr. Sarvesh, CEO of this hospital, Dr. Chitu, and the special guest of today's function, Dr. Nalin Ji. Recently, Shitu and Dr. S S have told you, made you aware about the inputs which they have given to build this hospital to such an extent. Uh, I must congratulate them because they have done a lot of things, and this is one of the exemplary hospitals in Rajasthan uh, which has reached its height. And it is catering to pulmonary medicine, not only pulmonary medicine but other subjects here. Uh, I once again congratulate the RHL dignitaries and the persons behind this hospital formation and organizing this function. I would like to recap recapitulate a few things with you because whatever facilities you are having today in hospitals to perform bronchoscopy and allied procedures, they were not there when I joined this hospital. I joined this hospital, Chest Hospital, Jaipur, in 1971, and after just three, two, three months of joining this hospital, I worked under. I learned about under Dr. Hans Kumar. He is no more there, and uh, I started doing rigid bronchoscopy, and we were doing rigid bronchoscopy under local anesthesia. We did rigid bronchoscopy under local anesthesia for next seven years because there was paucity of anesthetists. The drugs for anesthesia were not available that time. There was there was shortage of interventional radiologists. And ENT surgeons also who could do uh, foreign body removal and use rigid bronchoscopy. Then the chest hospital Jaipur, now known as IRD Hospital, was the only center in Rajasthan which was catering to all the patients with pulmonary tuberculosis and its complications like bronchiectasis, lung gases, hemoptysis, and sometimes foreign body removal also. And I must share this that because there were no facilities available, even we were not having uh, CT scan, no USG, no other facilities, and we were doing removal of foreign bodies even under local anesthesia. 
in 1978 1968 as you know was the year when the bronchoscope fiber optic bronchoscope was made commercially available all over india in 1978 was the year when fiber optic bronchoscope was brought in our test hospital and we started doing this for the first time in rajasthan we were the only we were among the only five centers in india which who were which was having uh, fiber optic bronchoscopy even in jaipur was not having uh, delhi was not having this facility so fob was going on this fob we started once we started fob the most of the cases of rigid bronchoscopy were not being done because the procedure of fiber optic bronchoscopy was very easy and patient comfortable with the help of fiber optic bronchoscopy the first thing we started innovation was the diagnosis of main negative pulmonary tuberculosis that time it was very common in 1978 and 80s and the first paper from india was published in tuberculosis about the use of fiber optic bronchoscopy in the diagnosis of pulmonary smear negative pulmonary tuberculosis this was the first paper from this center and i i published this another innovative procedure which was done using fiber optic bronchoscopy was fluoroscopy fluoroscopy now it is it is being replaced by thoracoscopy and we did diagnosis of undiagnosed fluoral effusion mesothelium and some other things of fluoral diseases with the help of fiber optic bronchoscope and again the first paper of from india gradually it took about 78 years to next 78 years there was almost rigid bronchoscopy was given up people were not new using even thoracic surgeons were not using fiber optic this rigid bronchoscopy then with the availability of fiber optic bronchoscopy various interventional procedures came into existence and that include diagnosis of occult malignancy with the availability of afb autofluorescence bronchoscopy oct and the staging of lung cancer was very important it started with the ebers in 1990 and i am proud to say that rajasthan was the first uh, state here in jaipur was the first city in rajasthan where ebers was started in 19 Uh, 2006 16 i think and it was with the efforts of dr virendra singh and dr nishtha and the first time the ebers was uh, started in patients and it was, it was being done that was very important uh, investigative procedure so i must congratulate uh, dr virendra singh and nishtha for this and then then with the use of other innovative procedures we started again using rigid bronchoscope that is with the advent of stents with the advent of stents we need to have use of uh, rigid bronchoscope of course this time the rigid bronchoscope is being done on the local general anesthesia and with the resurgence with use of rigid bronchoscope uh, in putting it stand there was a resurgence of rigid bronchoscopy again and most of the centers started using fiber optic bronchoscopy as well as rigid bronchoscopy together the other uh, importance of fiber optic bronchoscopy i am sure that so many procedures will be shown to you by the organizers of this international pulmonology hypothesis is one of the uh, severe complication of fiber optic bronchoscopy and sometimes it is very difficult to find out the site of bleeding in that case we we were using and we are still using rigid bronchoscope and fiber optic bronchoscope put together fob we pass through the rigid bronchoscope to locate the site and uh, it is diagnosed and whenever surgery is not possible we have to refer this patient for bronchial artery embolization another is use of fiber optic bronchoscopy is used diagnosis in thoracoscopy and the thoracoscopy is now being used in the diagnosis of emphysema we 
neural mesothelioma as peripheral tumors and particularly splitting small leaks of bronchospheric fistula with the use of bleach. In last uh, decade, in say about in five to seven years in Rajasthan, it has been many innovations and uh, the first, for the first time as to be told and bronchial thermoplasty was used in this hospital in January 2021. That is a big credit for this hospital and for Rajasthan also for the treatment of bronchial asthma. Then uh, Mahendra uh, at Udaipur has started uh, cryobiopsy, cryobiopsy. He has, uh, that is also another inno innovation and he has recently done navigation bronchoscopy also. So these are a few things. Recently, uh, uh, stenting was done in the structure of trachea by, uh, recently it was reported by Dr. Godara and this is another thing. So what I mean to say is that in last 30 years, last 20 or 20 to 30 years, we have seen so many innovations and there is a lot of competition in the market of this procedure. Market means why? Because one thing is very important I should tell you that we or we people all should try to reduce the cost of bronchoscopy which should be accessible to the poor patient. Nowadays it is very costly. I leave about, uh, leave aside the government hospitals but uh, in private sectors and all this all over India the charges are too high. That is a very important thing and we must take out the solution in this. So before closing uh, my lecture, I will not take much time. I will, I would like again to extend my sincere thanks to Kishu, Dr. Kishagrava, Dr. Virendra Singh, Ranin, uh, Nadin for joining this hospital and all of you senior people, junior people and faculty of this hospital and faculty and delegates and all this for joining this. I am sure that this intervention from pulmonology is going to help you uh, update will help you to enrich your skills, enrich your knowledge and you can do, you can learn more. Those are newcomers, they can do it on a hands-on session in Jami and all this. So before I close, I must tell you two, three points, salient points, what a bronchoscopist should learn, what a bronchoscopist should follow in his life so that it becomes an important bronchologist and that, that is more important that don't do bronchoscopy unless until there is an indication, proper indication. Not that you want to enrich your skill, you want to expertise, expertise. So don't do a bronchoscopy unless until there is a positive indication. And secondly, and uh, whatever work you are doing, whatever experiences you have got, what are the uh, problems you are facing, you try to accumulate them, consolidate them and try to publish them in a journal because whatever you write, the references becomes everything which lasts forever. That is an everlasting memory, everlasting asset for you. So whatever you do, try to publish it and I am very happy to see the academic interest of Jitu and uh, I congratulate her for being associated with the editorial board of Quebec. That is a very important prestigious. So I can congratulate you for this. Ladies and gentlemen, learning is an art. Learning is an art which will enrich your skill. And you must remember this, that learning never ends. And that is why I am still learning. So we will close this. Mahatma Gandhi said one thing. Practice to kari, a kaam kari, you do something. So you should be enthusiastic. So Mahatma Gandhi said that satisfaction lies in attainment, eh, in an effort. Satisfaction lies in an effort. Ek effort karne mein, that is very important, but not in attainment. So satisfaction ke liye, you have to make efforts. And full effort is a full victory. That is very important thing. I must congratulate, extend my sincere uh, good wishes for the success of this interventional bronchology update and thank you sir. Thank you so much sir for sharing your experience. Now I would like to call uh, Dr. Anupriya Agarwal, RHL Lung Center, 
to give a token of mo uh, a memento as a token to Dr. S. K. Sarkar sir. Now I would like to call Dr. Ashwarya from RHL Lung Center to felicitate sir with a memento, Dr. Nalin Joshi sir. May I request uh, Dr. Virendra Singh sir for the thank you note. नमस्कार दोस्तों सबसे पहला धन्यवाद भगवान का कि उसने प्रेरणा दी कि भाई पचास साल की दोस्ती को पार्टनरशिप में बना के राजस्थान का सबसे सुंदर अस्पताल बनाया सबसे सुंदर शायद आप चौंक रहे हैं लेकिन हुआ एक ही एक दो पेशेंट आए वैसा आपका अस्पताल राजस्थान का सबसे सुंदर है मैंने कहा यार मेरे को खुश करने के लिए कह रहा होगा मैंने कहा कैसे बोले साहब किसी अस्पताल में इतनी सेल्फी लेते हुए लोगों को नहीं दे दूसरा धन्यवाद डॉक्टर सरकार साहब का हमारे बड़े भाई और गुरुजन जैसे चितू ने कहा ना कि डोंट इग्नोर योर सेल्फ हुआ है कि वो बात है शायद बयासी तेयासी की चौरासी पिचासी की तो एक वो लगा कि नाक से सांस एक से क्यों आती है और जब चेस्ट को एक तरफ दबा देते हैं तो वो ब्लॉक हो जाती है दूसरी वाली खुल क्यों जाती है तो हमारे कई टीचर से पूछा तो हंसने लग गए मजाक बना दी फिर मैं डॉक्टर सरकार साहब के पास पहुंचा उन्होंने कहा यार ब्रोंकोस्कोपी में देखते देखते करवट लेने से वो होती है क्या तो ब्रोंकोस्कोपी वो देखते देखते उसकी फोटोएं खिंचाई एंड ये मेरे गुरु रहे ब्रोंकोस्कोपी सिखाने में बहुत बहुत धन्यवाद नलिन जोशी जबरदस्त एंथुजियास एस्मा पे इनकी थीसिस थी और ये घर मेरे आते थे और इतने सिंसियर एंड सीरियस जैसी कोई स्थानी नहीं एक एक केस वहाँ पे वो मेरा गैरेज में उस टाइम कमरा था उस कंसल्टेशन रूम में देखते थे जबरदस्त ये बहुत बहुत धन्यवाद नलिन आप आए आज धन्यवाद है हमारे रिनाउंड फैकल्टी का डॉक्टर सहजल धूरिया आप जानते हैं कि एक तरह से पूरे भारत के अंदर उभरते उभरते नहीं उभरे हुए सितारे पल्मोनोलॉजी फील्ड के अंदर इसके अलावा हमारे जो चांद भंडारी हैं जो कि हमारे वहीं यहीं के वेलकम साहब शिवराज और हमारे जो बाहर से आए हुए हैं उन सभी का मैं बहुत ही बहुत धन्यवाद करूंगा डॉक्टर सोनिया दलाल हैं या शायद निकल गए ओ रियली बिकॉज आई केम टू नो की शी इज वन ऑफ द मोस्ट पावरफुल लेडी और पल्मोनोलॉजी के क्षेत्र के अंदर इंडिया के टॉप के अंदर आती हैं तो ये इतने दूर से चल के यहाँ पे आए एंड सबसे ज्यादा
ज्यादा आप बच्चों का धन्यवाद कि यू आर सो कीनली लर्निंग दिस थिंग विथ इंटरेस्ट धन्यवाद लुपिन का जिन्होंने कि आपसे संपर्क करके आज सारा का सारा ये किया विशेष तौर से मिस्टर राजा को बहुत बहुत धन्यवाद हमारे जो टीम है आर एच एल की जो टीम है और नेहा है जो इतना सुंदर वो संचालन कर रही है मंच का आर एच एल लंग सेंटर की जो टीम जो कई दिनों से लगी हुई है उनका बहुत बहुत धन्यवाद तो आपका सबका धन्यवाद और आभार नमस्कार जय हिंद Sir, thank you for your kind words. IP update is the celebration of knowledge, and devoted teachers are here, ardent orators, and mesmerized scholars. So, people with varied caliber and intellect are at this platform. So, with a round of applause, I would like uh, now to, to hand over the mic to Dr. Ashwarya and keep the ball rolling. Thank you, everyone. thank you all the dignitaries in the dais now let me welcome dr ad madhu sir to the dais to hand over a token of gratitude to dr sajal duria sir I request Dr. Chand Pandari and Dr. Shivraj Sharma to the dais. I request Madhur sir to hand over the token to them. thank you all now with the blessing of ma saraswati let us continue the session i request dr at madhur dr vikas pilania and dr ashish jain to the dais to proceed the session गुड मॉर्निंग शुड वी स्टार्ट गुड मॉर्निंग लेडीज एंड जेंटलमैन आई वेलकम यू ऑल
Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. After a wonderful inaugural session, now let's begin the scientific session. And the first session is going to be very interesting. We are going to have a topic on a very novel subject, which is a relatively new subject, that is about the cryo-lung biopsy, know it all. As we know that the uh, so far the procedures available to pulmonologists for the lung biopsy are either he does the bronchoscopic biopsy or the open lung biopsy. Open lung biopsy is quite traumatic, whereas uh, bronchoscopic biopsy, you don't get the adequate tissue. So now this cryo-lung biopsy has been developed and uh, this has come to be accepted as a standard procedure for obtaining uh, biopsies for diffuse lung parenchymal diseases. So I, I am sure that you will enjoy this topic and we will learn something. And the speaker is very dynamic, Dr. Sheetu Singh. She is the chairman, head of the pulmonology department of Rajasthan Hospital. So uh, without wasting much time, I will invite Dr. Sheetu Singh to deliver her talk. Thank you, sir, for the kind words. And uh, can I have the presentation, please? What are these cryolung biopsies? Let's go a little bit in detail. So, uh, we published a paper way back in 2017, uh, the ILD India Registry, where we prospectively uh, went into 1,084 patients across the country with interstitial lung disease. And out of these, 47% of them were having hypersensitivity pneumonitis. However, our paper was much criticized because of the lack of the diagnostic criteria being validated. Only few of our patients were having uh, lung biopsies available, only 7.5%. So this very small number gave us an insight of the reluctance on the part of the patients to undergo a procedure, the reluctance on the part of the pulmonologist or the physician to get a biopsy done, the lack of facilities for biopsies. So it was not us only who was, you know, skeptical. Not many of the patients were willing for an open lung biopsy. So let me just go into what we had at that point. So we had a transbronchial lung biopsy, which you know all of us learn. It's a uh, the plus points are that it's a relatively safe procedure. Outpatient bronchocentric diseases such as sarcoid and HP can be diagnosed. Disadvantage that we all face. Uh, is a low yield, small piece, the crush artifact, not useful in diagnosing UIPs and IPS. Then we had the gold standard, the open lung biopsy. Large pieces, multiple lobes. Disadvantage, prolonged ventilation. Imagine your patient of interstitial lung disease getting an open lung biopsy. Anesthesia related side effects, prolonged air leak and acute exacerbations. So there, then came the new kid on the block, that's the cryolung biopsy. So, you know, the advantage of this technique is that it gets bigger tissues with less crush artifact. However, you know, there were a lot of debates, many paper came in that it's associated with a lot of complications. But all this got settled down after the publication of this study. And I recommend all of you to go through this beautiful study, beautiful design the coldest study that got published in the Lancet Respiratory Medicine. It was a multi-center prospective study conducted at nine centers across Australia. 65 patients recruited of ILD and each patient underwent first a cryolung biopsy and the open lung biopsy. What did they find out? High level of agreement in the, between the diagnosis of cryo and surgical lung biopsy for pathological interpretation and MDD. So we had a technique that was established. Now let me delve into a case, a case of an ILD and how we went ahead with the biopsy. So 41 year old female, cough, shortness of breath since 5 years, no uh, connective tissue disease, associated history, follow case of hypothyroid. She was a person, 6 minutes she was desaturating. Her CTD panel that we got done was negative. This was her CT scan. So, uh, who's going to help me, you know, read the CT scan? What do you see? Anyone? Rahul? Yeah. 
Yes, wonderful. So, looking at the upper lobe predominance, Dr. Rahul just mentioned that you know one of the differentials with the history of pigeons would be chronic hypersensitivity pneumonitis. And what you see here is relative lower lobe sparing. So there is interlobular septal thickening, some ground glass. And if you want to see ground glass and appreciate ground glass, compare the thing in the trachea. So the air in the trachea is more black. And the lung should be as black as the air in the trachea. But what you see here is that the lung is more white. That means there is some ground glass. So before I uh, go ahead with the case, who are actual candidates of prior lung biopsy. So here again I would like to, you know, every one of you should go through this paper published by Dr. Dhuria only here, the ICS and NCCP guidelines of prior lung biopsy. So if you really want to start, it covers everything very beautifully. So what they have mentioned is that ILD not diagnosed on the basis of clinical and radiological characteristics are candidates of prior lung biopsy. So let me just show a couple of cases. 70 year old ex smoker. What do you see on the CT scan here? Honeycombing is there. It's a UIP pattern. Will you like to biopsy? How many of you will like to biopsy? Good. I am really happy. So, again, same CT scan. However, this time it's a 30 year old female with joint pain and a connective tissue disease profile that's positive. Will you like to biopsy? Very good. No. Again, if you have a panel that's positive, you don't want. Now, you have a 30-year-old female. The CTD profile is negative. She does not have any symptoms. Now, will you like to biopsy? So, yes. So, that's the time when you would like to, you know, know why a young female is actually having an ILD. So, the investigations that you need prior to a cryobiopsy are a computed tomography of the chest, CBC, coagulation profile, creatinine, spirometry, ECG, echo. Uh, so, we get echo done for all our patients to rule out severe to moderate to severe pulmonary hypertension. Uh, serology against HIV and hepatitis BC. So, now you have a patient with undifferentiated ILD with an echo with a pulmonary artery, uh, artery systolic pressure of 55. Will you like to biopsy? So preferably no, because any pressure is more than 50, you will face a lot of bleeding on table and trust me, you don't want to do that. Case 2, pregnancy. Will you like to biopsy? Again, no. Case 3, if you have such a lung with extensive bulla, emphysema, will you like to biopsy? No. One is that there will be high chances of pneumothorax. Second, you will not get anything on the biopsy. It's, you know, burnt out lung. So, in each and every case, you have to weigh the risk versus benefit. Should I do? Should I not do? So, these are again uh, highlighted in the ICS NCCP guidelines. Absolute contraindication is high risk of anesthesia, pulmonary hypertension with pressures more than 50 uncorrected bleeding diathesis, severe hypoxemia, pregnancy, diffuse lung disease with extensive cyst and bulla, and relative contraindications are hemoglobin less than 8, FEC less than 50%, BMI more than 30. So, the one take home uh, message that I would like uh, to give you is avoid biopsy in patients with moderate to severe pulmonary hypertension. Our patient had, you know, good labs, everything was fine. Uh, we plan the cryolung biopsy. So the cryolung biopsy, should it be done with an artificial airway or would you like to do in your bronchoscopy suite without an artificial airway? How many for an artificial airway? Okay, so, so yes, uh, there are a lot of complications that we face during a cryolung biopsy. It's not a routine procedure. You have to be armed for this. If you know what you are facing, you will be prepared and you can, you know, manage the complication. So the artificial airway may include an endotracheal tube or a rigid bronchoscope or a laryngeal mask airway. So what you see here is a ET tube. The advantage of ET tube is that, you know, it allows rapid re-entry in and out. You know, patient desaturates, you can ventilate the patient in between. If the pa there is bleeding also, it is manageable. The second is getting it done through a rigid. So rigid will allow you to maneuver to the small lobe. So suppose you want to take the biopsy from the upper lobe. 
better you go with a rigid again if you want to take biopsy from the left side maneuvering your fogarty to the left side will be difficult you go to the rigid lma will not have that advantage and ventilating the lung after a bleeding will become very difficult with lma so it is preferred that you use the first two techniques anesthesia either you go for moderate to deep sedation or general anesthesia now the pieces that are obtained in cryo biopsy are big so if you have a big piece there will be a lot of bleeding so you have to be prepared with a balloon what will happen is that you will go inside and come out with a piece what will happen behind is a lot of bleeding and there will be a uh, period of time of 2 to 3 minutes when no one will be inside so at that time if you have a balloon in place that bleeding can be controlled along with that it will provide a tamponade effect to further bleeding so what is the occlusion balloon that you use you either use a fogarty endobronchial blocker that is an or angioplasty catheter what we normally use is a fogarty so what will happen here is let me just show this is a rigid scope first the uh, your assistant so you need couple of assistants here one is you push an uh, fogarty here then you go ahead with your bronchoscope what will happen with the bronchoscope to the channel of the bronchoscope you push in your cryo and one technician who is standing on the c arm so this is the c arm that is my cryo probe visible why because you want your cryo probe at the right place i'm going to come to that in a short while so once you your cryo probe is in the right place you take uh freeze it for 3 to 4 seconds pull it out and once you are out you ask your assistant to blow in the fogarty so in the third image what you see you are out with the cryo probe but the balloon is inflated and that is taking care of the bleed so c arm guidance is important let me show you why so this is the c arm this is one of our cases you have got inside will you like to biopsy from this point no it is too central what will happen there are all the major vessels are here and a lot of bleeding will be there so you don't want to biopsy from here so what will i do i will push push my cryo probe more further i am still not happy i will push it further so it should preferably be 1 cm from the pleural margin so the c arm will give you a guidance that you are not touching the pleura one number 2 you are not too central which will cause bleeding so you are at the appropriate place where you can get the piece of your choice from the place of your choice take these two things what will happen is you will either land up in a soup with bleeding or a pneumothorax so coming back to our patient post procedure we did all the biopsies we were very happy post procedure patient got extubated but after the extubation patient had lot of cough so we have all got ild patients who keep coughing 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 and what led to that so the patient developed uh, chest pain severe chest pain and this was the ct scan and trust me cryo biopsies they get good pieces but you can get very very uh, severe complications so this patient had a bilateral pneumothorax we had done biopsy from only one side along with that what you see here is a lot of subcutaneous emphysema so i am highlighting one case you know where we face the complications for you to you know understand the gravity this is not a simple test you have to be prepared for the complications so in our particular patient we put pigtails in we put subcutaneous catheters put her on oxygen shifted her to the icu and this was the lung before we sent her home so the biopsy so let us see what came in the biopsy uniform involvement of lung parenchyma interstitial infiltrate bronchocentric infiltrate epitheloid cells suggestive of chronic hp so tissue is always the issue next question comes how many pieces four pieces with two of adequate size and two lobes should be uh, sampled if you are sampling only one lobe preferably from different segments so implications now many patients ask and it is important because you need to counsel the patient that's another challenge you face 
how do you convince your patient of ILD to get a biopsy done? So the implication for this patient is that she had to change the job. Second, she had to be started on steroid. Nowadays, there's a lot of apprehension that doctor, I don't want steroid. So these are the things that will, you know, convince the patient to follow the treatment. One of our other patients, the first case actually, 2019, which again showed uh, chronic HP on the cryolung biopsy. So here, this one small clinical vignette, 31-year-old uh, female, non-smoker, cough, shortness of breath, weight loss, loss of appetite, history suggestive of CTD was negative, dampness was present. This was uh, the CT scan. Who's going to help me out? Rupal, what do you see on the scan? So, Rupal has uh, told us that there is some involvement of the upper loop, the interlobular septal thickening, a uh, consolidation versus a fibrotic lesion here. What you also see here in the lower lobes is an area of air trapping and centri acinar or centri lobular nodules, which are very difficult to see sometimes. But if you look very carefully, you can appreciate them in here. So this was a patient and we did a cryobiopsy. But this, we faced another complication and this is every bronchoscopist's worst nightmare. So we had a major bleed. So the uh, uh, solution to this is be prepared. You have to be prepared for a bleed on every patient of yours. You should be ready with ice cold saline, balloon occluders, adrenaline, selective intubation. So APC here I've highlighted because this will not work in cryobiopsies. It's a surface technique and it is for uh, bleeding from growth. So if you have the rest of these things, uh, it can be easily controlled. What we did was we prolonged the tamponade with a Fogarty for 3 to 5 minutes, gave Trenecta, Botropase, cold saline and adrenaline after we removed the balloon. And the biopsy again showed uh, chronic HP. So this is the experience at our center, 25 cases so far. Complications, surprisingly the complications that we faced were on all the post-COVID patients only. So probably because of the um, vascular fragility or the mucosal fragility, I'm not sure that why. So, thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, you will agree with me that it has been a wonderful talk. And uh, we have all become wiser about this uh, relatively new procedure which she has been doing and which has come to be accepted as a very standard procedure for getting the biopsies and uh, I am very happy that she emphasized the contraindications and uh, she emphasized the complications and how to handle them. So these are the very important points for the bronchoscopist especially the youngsters. So now I will say the topic is open for discussion. I am sure that she will be glad to clarify your doubts. Yes ma'am. Normally, see, you know, doctor shopping, you know, come to us, then uh, everyone would, when we say that you need a biopsy, they would go to another pulmonologist. We'll say, no, there are very nice Kleishner's criteria, right? And this is a absolute cranio, you know, cranial predominance and looks like a chronic HP, not even that acute or a subacute HP. I'll start on steroids, and maybe if need be, I would probably put you on a mycophenolet and you should be through. This is the of practical problems that we normally face in practice. So how, how difficult it is for you to convince them? I know ma'am. So uh, it is one of the most challenging, as challenging as doing a cryolung biopsy itself. So what we have is like if I get a patient, the patient will go to Dr. Virendra Singh or he'll go to Dr. Madhur Joshi or you know in Durlabji he'll go to Dr. ML Gupta and all of us will say cryobiopsy and only then the patient gets convinced. So it has to be, you know, uh, emphasis on the biopsy from all the uh, colleagues across the city. So it is uh, very challenging. Uh, even, you know, uh, we have, we are posting a case of cryobiopsy just now. So it was difficult to convince, but you know, you tell them the data.
data, give them the data that if you will be on steroid for life long, what is the fun? And now patients have, you know, understood the side effects of steroids and now sometimes they do agree that what, how long do I take the medicine? So at that point, you can convince them that down the line you will deteriorate. We will not be able to offer you a biopsy at that point. So once we have the accurate diagnosis, we can give you accurate treatment. So this is how you convince. It takes 15 to 20 minutes. So convincing a cryobiopsy is half an hour of an OPD consultation. You have to go through all the scans, all the reports. You have to convince yourself first before you convince the patient. I agree with you. So thanks, thanks, Dr. Uh, rigid bronchoscope versus a patient with uh, ET. Okay, so we actually initially did all with the rigid only. The problem that we were facing uh, with the rigid, we have the Novatex scope. So it does very well for all our interventional cases. But for the ILD patients, these patients desaturate so much because there are a lot of holes in it. So I have colleagues across who have the Carlstor scope. So they are more happy with their scope. So subsequently, we actually put a sleeve on our rigid scope for better ventilation. And now we have actually switched on to endotracheal tubes. So it is, you know, uh, no technique is uh, gold standard or, you know, it is the best. It is uh, depending on your expertise, depending on your comfort level and your anesthetist comfort level. So you have to improvise. This is for all intervention procedures. So one question from my side. <laughs> So thank you, Dr. Shitu, for this wonderful presentation. I would like to ask you one simple thing. What is the incidence of pneumothorax with cryo as well as in comparison to the normal conventional TBLB if we are doing? So I think it's a very wonderful question and very important. So uh, it depends on whether you are using C arm or not. You have to be safe first. So if uh, with the C arm, had it been TBLB, or cryobiopsy, it will be same if you are using it under guidance. That's the take home. If you're doing a blind TBLB, the chances are, you know, very high because it's a blind procedure. But if you are doing under C arm guidance, uh, the chances are similar to both the techniques. Thanks, Dr. Situ, for a um, wonderful lecture. And the cryo is an emerging uh, technique, basically, and it's still having a uh, lot of side effects. The research shows that uh, chances of pneumothorax is around 8 to 9 percent and chances of hemorrhage is around 20 percent. Although uh, it's a very new technique, not much of literature is uh, available with us. But very interesting thing that the maximum contribution of this literature is given by Dr. Sajal Durian at all from uh, team uh, PGI. And we are lucky uh, to having Dr. Sajal Duria with us today. And uh, the modifications are going on in this uh, technique. Now the mini cryo probe is also available. In this probe, we can, uh, we shouldn't, we ha don't have to pull the bronchoscope every time because we can uh, pull the uh, the cryo probe only with working channel. And now with uh, this mini probe, we can also biopsy the peripheral uh, as well of lung with, with the help of uh, radial ebus and all. And also very helpful in the post transplant patient to diagnose the. Uh, complications and infections. So with uh, these comments, I... Uh, yes, wonderful one comments. Question. One thing was that if you use the smaller probes, the size will be smaller. So this is what you have to weigh. So uh, a smaller probe means a smaller size of smaller tissue. Size. And tissue is always the issue, issue. with a pathologist. <laughs> Excellent presentation, Dr. Shitu. I have one question. Do you, uh, you do cryo with uh, G, under GA with ET tube? So and we do with rigid also if we are planning an upper okay. lobe or a left so side. So with the ET tube you pass balloon along with it or do you using are you using around endobronchial blocker? No, we are using Fugati only. Uh, we don't have the ant blocker. Okay. I think we discussed also all once. Yeah, yeah, because it has three ports. One we hmm. can pass the blocker, one uh, for the scope and simultaneously we can ventilate the patient. So do we you couldn't uh, get it actually. Okay, okay. So you are passing the balloon along with the, uh, the scope and the tube in from the yes. tube only. From the tube outside the scope to the, the channel, scope. the cryo goes. Okay, okay. Thanks. So, with this remark, I would like to close the session. Thank, Thank you. you.
थैंक यू मैम आई रिक्वेस्ट द डिग्नेटरीज टू बी सीटेड आई रिक्वेस्ट डॉक्टर माधु जोशी सर टू हैंड ओवर द टोकन ऑफ मोमेंडो टू डॉक्टर ए डी माधु डॉक्टर विकास पिलानिया एंड डॉक्टर आशीष जी thank you all now i request dr ambika sharma to the dais for the preliminary quiz round very good afternoon to all so this is a simple preliminary quiz uh, uh, only for the 10 minutes and the questions are 15 questions many of you may be able to finish in 5 minutes so this is kind of a screening round for tomorrow and tomorrow we will have main round which will be audio visual round and at the end of the all session so uh, topics are the intervention pulmonology what we are studying or listening today since morning and will be hearing tomorrow also so i would request everyone uh, uh, all the jr sr or young pulmonologists who or whoever want to participate in this uh, can quickly answer the questions and write your details like name age and which institution are from you and your mobile number so that for tomorrow we can contact you so yeah everybody is getting the we can have one more helping hand from the other side so we are starting at around 12:32 so we will be able to finish it by 12:42 and uh, if you do it earlier you can pass the uh, answer sheet to me so meanwhile i think our next session is getting ready from the ot for the cryo biopsy so we can do this time bank process
elections so about the tomorrow we will be keeping four teams each team with the uh, two candidates so kind of eight selections will be there and some will be informed for the waiting list also
it's always better to have full control over the airways. Uh, do we have transmission from the OT? Sir, uh, initially I will give an introduction about the case. Okay, uh, you will you will do it. Okay, we can sir, start. This is a 60 year old male with chief complaints of dry cough since one year, and he has a past history of type 2 diabetes mellitus and for a connective tissue disorders, and no significant history was there. He has exposure to pigeons and his QD echo reports within was within normal limits and his RA factor and ANA was negative and his FEC was 80 percentage. This is the CT scan of the patient. Now we will be connecting to the OTT. So I'll just try to go through the CT scan. So what we can see on the CT is basically, can we go back? So we have the upper lobe cuts and here you can see the carina. So above the carina, all what you see is mostly the upper lobes. You can see these interstitial thickenings, which is mostly in the form of fine reticulation. If you look here, it is mostly in the form of a fine meshwork like pattern which is basically due to intralobular septal thickening. There is some interlobular septal thickening here for example. This interlobular septa is also thickened. This is interlobular septal thickening. And there is some bit of ground glass. There is some bit of haze which you can appreciate. And first you should also comment on the distribution of the disease. So it looks more of an upper lobe predominant disease. If you can, if we have a uh, coronal and sagittal section it will be better appreciated but even in this you can see that some of the lower lung areas are more spared and the upper lobes are more involved and here too you can see all that interstitial thickening pattern there is some ground glassing what i cannot appreciate here is uh, mosaic attenuation which is in the form of alternating black and white areas and it will be a good idea in this case to do an expiratory scan because even if mosaic is not appreciated on inspiratory scans you can still see some amount of air trapping in some of these patients when you do an expiratory scan. So what will be the difference? What is the pattern? Uh, how will you label the pattern according to the say the IPF guideline? How will you label the pattern? What are the categories in the IPF guideline of what are the labels for labels for the CT appearance? Somebody was telling somebody did say something. Definite UIP, yeah, correct. Second is probable UIP. Third is indeterminate. And fourth is no. Fourth is alternate diagnosis. So, where does this CT fit in? Probable. So, what are the criteria for probable? What are the criteria for definite? So, if there is unicumbing traction bronchial. So, lower low predominant, peripheral predominant disease with reticulation and honeycombing, right? So that is definite UIP. What is probable UIP? Absence of honey. So all the features without honeycombing but with traction bronchiectasis, right? So here I cannot appreciate any uh, traction bronchiectasis in these in the films provided. Sometimes if you have the full picture on the console, the full DICOM data, sometimes you can trace individual bronchioles and you can identify some of those uh, traction bronchiectasis. Here it is mostly reticulation without any clear cut area of traction bronchiectasis. So where does it fit in now? Uh, is it definite UIP? Not definitive. Is it probable UIP? Not even probable. Is it uh, consistent with an alternate diagnosis? Not alternate. Not alternate. So where does it fit in finally? Indeterminate. So it's an indeterminate pattern of CT scan. So do we require a further diagnostic procedure? Yes. All of you agree? So what can be the further diagnostic procedure? What will be the procedure of your choice? What are the options we have? We can do a TBLB with a conventional forceps biopsy. We can do a bronchoalveolar lavage or we can do a surgical lung biopsy. But TBLB has, TBLB has a low yield, BAL is insensitive, non-specific. SLB has higher rate of complications including mortality. So the best bet here is a TBLC. Okay. We can go to the OT, I think. In the OT, can you hear me?
you are not audible from the ot now can you hear us yeah yeah we can yeah. okay and we start welcome back everyone we will now proceed to the second live case for the day cryo lung biopsy it will be done by dr shitu singh and dr madhur joshi before we start the case dr rakesh bhargav will brief us about the sedation good afternoon uh, this session we are doing under the general anesthesia we apply all the monitors ecg saturation bp and ecgo2 we intubate the patient with the endotracheal tube of number 9 we are trying to using maximum size number tube so our bronchoscope can negotiate through this so uh, we are using fentanyl mirage and uh, glycoprolate for the pre medication and the propofol and rocurinum for the intubation or uh, we maintain fir uh, anesthesia with the help of the dexam and the propofol is portability wa because we can, cannot give the inhalational anesthetic just like a pureflurane and the isoflurane okay. yeah so so why do we not use the inhalational agent actually, sir actually we uh, we continue we does not continue the ventilation at the time the bronchoscopy we have to detach the circuit from yeah. the machine yeah so it's not a closed circuit yeah, during yeah. the entire procedure yeah, yeah. the circuit is being opened yeah, so the gases will, will leak and maybe anesthetize the yeah, operator yeah. so that is the risk yeah yeah note to the doctor madhu so it will be a deep sedation or will it be no, a general it, anesthesia it is a complete general anesthesia complete general anesthesia yeah. hello madhu ha to madhu hello You can put the use the mic. Someone can hold it for Dr. Madhur. Is Dr. Madhur audible? No, Dr. Madhur is not audible. Hello. Yeah. Now we can hear you. Okay. So uh, a very good afternoon, all of you. I am Dr. Madhur Joshi. Uh, we would be starting the case uh, to begin with, uh, as you all know. Uh, we have uh, a brief history uh, he is a 62 year old gentleman uh, known diabetic and has been symptomatic since last 2 years the ct scan which you have just seen uh, prior to this there is hardly uh, uh, any other ct scan available with us we had a couple of chest x rays uh, the last previous x ray was couple of years back and then it was recently when his symptoms got worse uh, since last one month since he has been uh, coming to us so uh, this is his uh, uh, short background so we will be starting the case dr shitu uh, would be inspecting the airway first and he would be taking a bronchial valve lavage uh, and washings as well uh, so that we can also send it for uh, the cytoanalysis as we do in all our ind cases this will be followed by the cryobiopsy so uh, am i audible yes so we are starting uh, can you please focus here yes so here we are going inside we have to inspect the airways first as always so we are going to et tube number 9 and what we can visualize here is the carina so carina can be beautifully seen as was demonstrated earlier today morning the right main bronchus upper apical anterior posterior and what you see here is the right middle lobe right superior segment anterior lateral posterior the airways on the right side look good let's have a quick inspection on the left side what you see here is the left upper lobe the left apical so here it is a apical anterior and posterior slight difference in the anatomy like you have the lingula the superior inferior and now we can take a bronchoalveolar lavage the superior segment on the left side and the lower lobe segment so without wasting much time now i am in the right lower lobe segment i am wedging my scope inside but shitu can we do it from the upper lobe i think we'll get a better return so the upper lobe or the middle lobe let's see so we have pushed in this is the upper lobe posterior segment i have wedged in waited for two breaths of the patient and now i will be sucking in So the ideal suction pressure should be hundred, uh, and ideally these should not collapse. 
so many people you know advise to suck to a 20 cm but yeah. what i have personally felt is that the return is always poor so here the again one more aliquid so 100 ml divided into uh, 3 to 5 aliquids so can you please focus on the return seems to be about 20 25 ml i think yes you have put in 100 ml so that is more than sufficient yes what is of importance uh, for the yes. audience is to know that uh, it shouldn't be bloody if you're going to do a ball differential cytologic analysis then you should be very gentle with the suction because if some blood comes in then the differential cytology cannot be really uh, be accurate for nice. maybe nice. malignant cytology you are not that much concerned but for dif differential cytology it is of utmost importance so i think we have got a good ball here so we have taken a good ball which we are going to send for cytology and uh, we may as well send some molecular test for infection as well now we are going for the biopsy i have taken my scope out and at this point we try to uh, send the fugati first because there is always some space deficit so here my assistant uh, nutan ji is putting in the can you see the scope fugati it's a size 5 and i have pushed in my scope so can you push it more further so what is the size of the fugati balloon is it a 5 size 5 yeah yeah so once it is inside let's check inflate please can you pull it out a little bit good pull, uh, inflate good so you see that there is a good uh, seal that is there now i request my other assistant can you please pass me the cryo so this is the cryo uh, machine 2 we are still using the one and uh, the size of this probe is 1.7 so this is if you look carefully is going through the channel of the scope and the uh, balloon is outside so what you see here once it is out of your vision where will you focus the c arm please can i have a shot can you please camera uh, person please shift to the c arm can we focus on it yeah. uh is it vi visible yeah i think we need a better focus on that yeah now it is good yeah shoot again please so i think it's a little bit too inside yeah shoot again i have withdrawn it i think uh, dr shidu can try the lateral segment uh, just go into the lateral segment that will be better visualized there let's see can you uh, see arm again so again it's going there only i will take a piece from here uh, so i have withdrawn it a little bit so sometimes it goes into the posterior gutter at that point you just withdraw it a centimeter uh now can you focus on me please so what i am doing i have a uh, uh, leg paddle i'm pressing it counting it for 4 seconds 101 102 103 104 i am pulling it out can you focus on the piece please and meanwhile as my assistant is taking the piece out the fogati balloon as held by nutan is in place can you please show the piece so there's a lot of things happening at the same time and meanwhile dr rakesh is looking at the vitals and the saturation is also good patient is holding on well and the time i am out the balloon is still there inside now let us see how much havoc i have caused inside so the balloon is in place what a relief so can you deflate there is some bleeding can you inflate it again please at uh, this uh, you encounter such type of bleeding and these uh, at this point you just tamponade it for some more time can you pass me some cold saline also so uh, 
again. We look for bleeding, put in cold saline. So a bigger piece means a bigger bleed. Let's try uh, deflating again. Okay, sounds good. Let's put in cold saline. Push in some saline, please. So we have inflated the balloon again because of the bleed. We will wait for a couple of minutes before we go ahead. So the balloon is in place which has helped you massively. We will have to wait for a couple of minutes before we take another pass. So the freezing, uh, so what we have right now is the carbon dioxide uh, machine. So there are two reagents. One is the carbon dioxide, the other is the nitrous oxide. Uh, we have another nitrous oxide machine in that the freezing time is lesser and in the carbon dioxide the freezing time has to be more. So Dr. Dhuria, can you please elaborate on that? Yeah, so we have two cryogens as Dr. Shitu mentioned. One is carbon dioxide which, uh, so in the west side machine, where the uh, probe temperature goes up to minus 89 degrees centigrade with the nitrous and with the carbon dioxide it is minus 79 degrees centigrade. So there's a Can 10 degree difference which does not matter because both the temperatures are in, in like deflate? below minus 50 degree. So it doesn't matter whichever cryogen we are using. Uh, the time of uh, the time of activation of the probes is mostly dependent on the kind of machine you are using. So with the carbon dioxide machines, it is usually four to six seconds. And with nitrous, it is mostly starting with three seconds. But if you are not getting a good tissue, you can go up to six seconds. It also depends on the probe size. So if we are using a 2.4 millimeter probe, usually three Wait, seconds deep is deep enough. Deep if you are going ahead with a 1.9 or a 1.7 probe, then you go to five seconds, six seconds, sometimes even more. So uh, what we prefer is 1.9 millimeter probe because our patients are short statured and mostly they present late in the course of the disease. So there the segments are already very fibrotic and stenosed. So some of the sub-segments where you are uh, trying to enter, they are already stenosed. So it's better to use a smaller sized probe. The thing about 1.1 millimeter probe, 1.1 millimeter probe cannot be used for cryo lung biopsies. It is only used for cryo lymph node biopsies because it's such a fine probe 1.1 millimeter you can imagine how fine it is it just uh, goes limp so and it will not help you in getting good lung tissue for dpld uh, diagnosis so always so use 1.9 uh, or 2.4 sorry yeah. to interrupt yeah, sure. so here the bleeding has controlled yeah. and a coagulum sort of thing has been formed yeah. so we are putting inside the cryo probe again for our second piece So here I am encountering some resistance. Let us see. Uh, see arm please. So this looks fair enough. Let us take a piece. Freezing time because there was a bee bleeding. I am going to keep it less this time. 101, 102, 103, 104. So a lesser freezing time would mean a smaller tissue. So the freezing time uh, ranges from 3 to 4 seconds and if the piece is not adequate, you can increase the freezing time uh, up to 6 centimeters also. So let me just visualize the bleeding here again because the patient had bled a bit on the first pass. But we have the balloon in place to control. So good. So this time I had done a shorter freezing time so I expect that the bleeding should be less. Dr. Shitu, before you deflate just put your scope tip against the balloon so that you can see through it actually. Just yeah. That's so, interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So with the first bite it is absolutely it uh, at that time it is absolutely clear whether there is blood beyond or not. Here also you can see that it is not full. There is some bl blood from the previous bite 
but it is not really welling up right so you can just try to deflate slowly deflate? just go slow with the deflation deflate yeah i think there's no bleeding this time so you can so pa- yeah. i pass yeah. on the scope now to dr madhur joshi who's going to take the next couple of passes uh, can someone uh, hold a mic behind him I think the uh, Madhuri or Mike is working. So it's always a good idea to put a prophylactic occlusion balloon. So previously, the all this cryo biopsy started with a paper in 2009. So it has been more than a decade old. So initially there were a various uh, kind of uh, different uh, modifications of the techniques that were being used. For example, doing it without an occlusion balloon, doing it without fluoroscopy, doing it without an artificial airway. but with time all this has been standardized and now most guidelines including our iab guideline we recommend that artificial airway prophylactic occlusion balloon and preferably fluoroscopy should be in place when you are doing a cryobiopsy uh, because in the absence of an occlusion balloon the uh, the rates of moderate bleeding may be as high as 36% with occlusion balloon it comes down to 2 to 3% with fluoroscopy the risk of pneumothorax is about 6 to 7% without fluoroscopy it goes up to 21% and this was uh, there in a multi center study that we conducted so whenever you have a bleed just inflate the balloon right you are already doing it prophylactically when you go in again you just try to see through the balloon if there is blood there wait for 2 minutes 2 to 3 minutes because 3 minutes is the usual bleeding time so once you are waiting for 3 minutes most of the bleeds will resolve unless it is a proper arterial bleed if it is a proximal artery that will take a longer time to settle but if it's a venous bleed or a peripheral arterial I bleed it will uh, settle okay. within 3 minutes Madhu, uh, sorry to interrupt so we are going yeah. for another sample now uh, there is no bleeding as you can see the balloon is in place so we get fresh bleed yeah. so it, there is a bit resistance there on the cm how it is Shoot, please. So it was behind one of the wires. So Dr. Madhur is taking another position here. Okay, shoot, please. Can we try again for the lateral segment? Because with the lateral segment, it will really go to the lung periphery in this projection. Okay, shoot again. More bleed. somehow dr sejal it's not going in the yeah, lateral okay it's okay it's okay still will try okay one four two three i think okay. just take the bronchoscope ahead just try to visualize the alp segments the anterior lateral posterior clearly then maybe you'll be able to find this is the medial i think go further this will be the ap- apical this basal is, right this is a superior section yeah here you can try yeah just go I ahead i think uh, okay. go ahead any, go ahead yeah so we have to go ahead because uh, the saturation is yes 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 you can you can just finish off the procedure then 101 102 103 104 105 so when you are taking out the sample you have to come on un- n block so this was even a very small piece yeah so you don't use the 1.1 probe for this procedure and even if you are using it you cannot come through the channel because the channel is 2.2 mm what you are expecting the size of uh, the tissue is to be in the range of 4 to 5 mm so anyways it will get crushed or uh, at least damaged while coming through the scope so the entire scope assembly has so to come out if you see there's a lot of coordination going on a coordination between the assistant who's holding the balloon the yeah. coordination between the assistant uh, who's taking off the cryo piece so yeah. as soon as dr madhur is taking out uh, luton here is inflating the balloon so in the initial stages when you start off the piece may you know fall down somewhere the balloon 
coordination and the peace coordination is not totally in sync and this is often encountered so if you don't have an artificial airway in place sometimes it will get stuck at the vocal cord or in the upper airway somewhere okay cryoprobe once again please so the bleeding as we see is minimal this time also we have to be careful about the placement of the occlusion balloon it is a well placed occlusion balloon here you don't go too distal because once you are too distal the probe is frozen it may stick to the occlusion balloon because the entire thing is frozen because of that freezing both may get stuck and when you remove it the balloon will burst and then you will have a lot of bleeding so keep it a little more proximal and always check it by inflating before doing the procedure so it is also important to hold the biopsy uh, the cryo probe at the point of entry in the bronchoscope sometimes uh, there is a uh, miss coordination and it can get inside or outside so here i am pulling it out another problem that we have often encountered is that the fogarty balloon ruptures during the procedure always keep one spare so whenever we are starting off we always have one spare ki kahi acha dusra abhi to khatam ho gaya aur hai hi nahi aisa nahi chalega you need to have two balloons let's see how the bleeding is uh, ramkrup can you show me the pieces i will like to show on the camera how the pieces are so what till now what we have got is three pieces and one is really huge a black piece one second i can you focus a bit are they visible we uh, no not really you can hold it straight i think just hold it can you see the big black piece floating uh, maybe we need better focus uh camera person to focus it better yeah we can see a bigger piece yes yes we can make it out so i think uh, dr madhur is taking another piece let's see what comes we still need couple of more pieces before we call it a day because we in the end we want a diagnosis we have a good saturation before i go in because the circuit is open i want my patient to have a good saturation it's 95 dr rakesh are we good so uh, dr kushbu is there with us yes please deflate good so can i have the cryo please so with this 1.7 probe that what i have felt is that there is some uh, resistance that we feel when we are going inside and pulling it out so this was lesser when we are using the previous machine and the previous probe so balloon inflate theek hai fine deflate let's go in and see so now there is you know the field is we are encountering lot of resistance Siam, please, can you? Somehow the anatomy is such that we are getting stuck here only every time. So uh, I will take a piece here. One zero one, one zero two, one zero three, one zero four. And here you feel that there is a lot of pressure that you have to apply to pull it out, and you have to be prepared for that. So we have a huge piece here. So, ah, uh, how many? The ideal number of pieces, Doctor Dhuria's paper. I am quoting you only. So, I think uh, four. How many yes, do you want? Yes, yes, four are enough. Each of size five millimeters will be good, or at least two of five millimeter size. Clean, clean the scope. And don't uh, we shouldn't do too many attempts. I think not more than seven or eight attempts. So till now, the number of attempts has been. About six, I think. Six. So, uh, I think we have good pieces. There are three good pieces. Uh, although I would like to take one more. I think uh, there is uh, never chance. Issue is always the issue. Yeah. 
let's see the vitals are fine let me just take one more for the sake of a diagnosis he is holding on there is no bleeding if there is i will uh, stop it at that point so here what i actually mentioned i think the balloon uh inflated i was thinking that it has got uh, ruptured okay so let's control the bleeding first some normal saline you can carry on the discussion dr duria yeah and we'll just take a piece and wind off so there are certain advantages with the rigid bronchoscope for example you can do a selective intubation under vision so if you have suppose some bleeding from the right side you can easily go to the left side ventilate the left and uh, let the bleeding stop by itself on the right side you can initially put some adrenaline or ice cold saline on the right side cold and just keep on ventilating the left uh, when you are using a lma then it gives you a good uh, maneuvering space because uh, the lma is above the glottis but there you don't have this facility of selective intubation no. with the et tube you can still do a selective intubation if required although it will be more difficult if it, there is there is a huge amount of bleeding uh, the size of the et tube really has to be good so they have put a 9 mm and 9 mm is the size which should be used because sure. otherwise See, it will not please. allow your bronchoscope so and your i think dr duria you have go. your wish it's in the lateral segment 1 cm below the pleura can we focus clearly I yeah 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 this is a good location you can even push it further a bit a bit yeah 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 that's enough okay so i think uh, let's start 101 102 103 104 and we have do we have a piece ram through good so i think now i am happy we have good pieces now all we have to do is manage the bleeding so here one thing that i want to actually emphasize is that even you know uh, the procedure is done your work doesn't end you have to observe the patient till the patient is wheeled out let me go and uh, uh, even in the post op period one of us me madhur or anupriya are always there with the bronchoscope because these patients can bleed after some time also and even in the icu we generally move them to the icu we follow them up very closely because incidents of late pneumothoraxes are also there and second thing is before you you know uh, call it a day always uh, do a check cm to see whether there has been a pneumothorax on table can you put in some saline please is the balloon inflated don't if you are not sure about the balloon don't do too much of suctioning it will disturb the clot so here you can see the balloon i think it's all full of blood behind so let's wait for a bit i think uh, we will call it Uh, a day from the OT, we'll just yeah. observe and uh, extubate once the patient is settled. Thank you all, and uh, I thank the all the OT staff and uh, especially Dr. Rakesh, Dr. Kushku, who have been pivotal. And also, I would like to thank the Olympus team and uh, the cryo team here who have uh, made these things possible. Thank you. Over to you, Dr. Duria. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Shitu, for a very good procedure. so we were uh, discussing the uh, artificial airway part so each of these things has certain advantages the et tube comes with a lesser risk of upper airway trauma but it cannot be maneuvered that well as a rigid bronchoscope can be but if you are putting a 9 mm tube at least it is allowing the passage of an occlusion balloon and your 6 mm uh, 6 mm bronchoscope to go in deeply so uh, as i said the balloon placement has to be a little proximal so that it doesn't get stuck to the probe while coming out and uh, then the use of fluoroscopy so as you saw in the very last uh, uh, bite that if you are in the lateral segment then in the anterior posterior projection you will be able to see the probe reaching the periphery but if you are going into the anterior or the posterior segment then in this kind of a projection you will not be able to make out whether it is close to the pleural or not then you have to use a biplanar fluoro just turn it around by 90 degree 
and then you'll be able to make out whether the probe is coming close to the anterior part of the pleura or posterior part of the pleura. So any questions? Yes. Can we have a mic please? Yes. Pedal no, so removing. we press it for four seconds yes. and then remove the foot from the pedal. Okay, and then in total we have to remove. And the then scope. we have to uh, complete have to continuously uh, keep pressing the pedal. No, no. When you are removing it, you have to stop before it. So okay. after four seconds, you are kind counting one thousand one, one thousand two, one thousand three, one thousand four. That is about four is seconds. There any chances accidentally spilling of the tissue? If we the tissue. If no, the, the tissue pedal. is no. That doesn't happen because the tissue is very firmly stuck to the probe. Okay. It is completely frozen at a temperature of say min minus 90 degrees centigrade. Yes, yes. So it almost never falls off and once you come out even then it is difficult to really take it off the probe for, for a few seconds. So what you do is you put it in normal saline and then once the probe is thawed and the tissue separates itself then you immediately take out the tissue and put it in formalin. Okay. If you keep it in normal saline for more than a few seconds the fluid will enter the alveolar spaces and it can give you some deceptive appearances. It can also uh, not allow the pathologist to study how the alveolar spaces are behaving, whether they are collapsed, whether they are opened up. So it's always a good idea to either thaw it in air, but that takes a long time. It takes about say 15 to 20 seconds and at that time you are very anxious that uh, you have to go in and check whether your balloon is intact or not. So at that time you are not in a mood to spend 20 seconds on air thawing. So do a saline thawing, but that just takes three to four seconds and immediately you take off the tissue and put it in formalin. So we cannot do uh, directly thawing in the formalin? No, that is not right because your probe will get damaged or then you will be introducing formalin into the patient. Into the patient you right. can wash it, but it is not a good idea. It is a good idea because that will lead to corrosion of the probe over a long period of time. So okay, we okay. usually do it in saline and then immediately take it off and put it in formalin. And in the foreign body we have to keep pre continuously pressing the pedal in cryo extraction. Yes, yes. So in cryo extraction, there also you don't have to continuously do it because beyond a few seconds, okay. the entire probe will freeze and the, pr the part of the probe which is inside your bronchoscope will also start freezing. So if ice crystals are forming there and there is some movement of the probe within that channel, the channel may leak, okay. you may damage the scope. So for foreign body also we have to uh, keep pressing the pedal no, for you, four you keep seconds. On pressing. You keep on pressing with foreign bodies but don't go beyond a certain limit of time. Say maybe 10 seconds or 12 seconds. There is no fixed uh, higher limit to that time. But you have to keep on pressing the probe there because you have to be very sure with foreign body that you are not letting it drop inside the airways. And with certain foreign bodies for example if you are trying vegetable matter it will easily stick okay. but say if it's a say a non-organic foreign body then it usually does not stick to the probe so there what you do is you put some saline and due to that saline an ice ball will form between the probe and the foreign body for example we had a harad there is something called harad you know yes, yes. harad seed was there some patient had uh, uh, aspirated it so there we put in some spray uh, with uh, some saline spray because it's a very smooth foreign body. The probe will not stick easily and it's a dry kind of a foreign body. So we'll put some saline spray, uh, stick the probe, keep on pressing on the pedal. You can take about, as I said, about 10 seconds and you try to bring it out. Okay. But normally we have to freeze for 4 seconds. Right? Yes, for cryobiopsy, so what, we, what we do is with a 1.9 probe, we start with 3 seconds. If we are not getting a good what big tissue? tissue, we go to 4, 5, 6 seconds. Once we have gone up to 8 seconds also but that causes a lot of bleeding because mm -hmm. then a long part of the probe Hello. gets frozen then it sticks to the proximal airways where Hello. the major vessels lie. Yes. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, Dr. Sajid, so we have a quick question from uh, OT as well. Yeah. Dr. Durya, this is Sonia. Am I audible? Hi. Yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, no, not a question. Just one, uh, what we do is we uh, put in the Bogarty as a right tube from the nose. And we intubate the patient to secure the airways. Just in case, while pushing the bronchoscope along with the cryo, there is, uh, you know, the dislodgement of the pogati. So that is one more way how we can put it. We put in a pogati through the nose. Am I, am I, am, am, am but I? But then, uh, do you put it uh, uh, through the side of the ET tube, right? Yes, through the side of the ET tube. 
but then it is difficult to guide it in the glottis so and through the vocal so cord opening. Yeah, you can you can do yeah, it. I think yeah. it's a good idea, but yeah. sometimes it may be difficult to really maneuver it. Once you, Correct. if suppose it gets displaced, then it is very difficult to maneuver. So if you have space in the ED tube, it will be a yeah, better yeah, idea to put it through that. Times, you know, we are not able to intubate at nine or eight point five. You know. Yeah, then that it's a good idea. Then yeah, it's so a good idea. Because we have small stature, a short stature ladies or something. In that case, what we do is we put it through as a right tube. Yeah, that is a good idea if you. Yeah. Are not able to put a right. larger size yeah. tube. So this is just one feedback. Yeah. Now, uh, as you can see, uh, the patient is good, bleeding is controlled. He is waiting for him to uh, wake up. Dr. Madhu? Okay. Uh, so, before we end, I think uh, uh, Dr. Rakesh, our anesthetist, can also tell. Yeah, so we'll be looking at pressures, peak and plateau pressures of more than 30 if a pneumothorax develops, then we have to be careful. Yeah. That. yeah. 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 So we, if we have a fluoroscope in the OT, it is very handy. Immediately you can check for a pneumothorax. Okay. Uh, thank you very much from the OT. Last words from Dr. Chitu. So I think please uh, enjoy the lunch, and the uh, lunch will only be for you know 30 minutes. So please be back on your seats because we have exciting agenda ahead as well. Okay. Thank you. Over and out. Thank you. Do you have any more questions, or should we proceed for lunch? Yeah, please, please. It's please. up to you. Please yeah, yeah. carry on. Yeah, yeah, sure. Please. A check x-ray needs to be done after how much time, sir? We usually or do it after two to three hours. Immediately, if we have checked it with... Uh, we actually don't have fluoro in our OT. So, when we are doing it in uh, the bronchoscopy suite, we have a fluoro there. So we usually do our x-rays after two to three hours because delayed onset uh, pneumothorax can be there, especially when the patient comes out of the anesthesia and if he starts vigorously coughing, uh, it's always a good idea to give good amount of cough suppressants and then uh, pneumothorax can occur as a delayed complication. So mostly two to three hours. But if you're uh, placing your uh, probe well, in the, if you're using the fluoroscopy in the right plane and if you're use, uh, placing the probe well, about 10 millimeters from the pleura, don't Previous uh, uh, documents mentioned it is uh, like 10 to 20 millimeter from the pleura. It is not a good idea to go up to 20 millimeter. It is always better that you place it at about 10 millimeter so that you get some uh, subpleural tissue also, which is important for the differentiation of UIP from other patterns. You might have a pneumothorax, a high risk of pneumothorax if you are going peripheral, but it also gives you a better yield one. And if you are too proximal, the risk of bleeding is higher. And if you want to trade between the two risks, I would trade for the risk of pneumothorax rather than risk of bleeding because whenever we have a, a moderate to uh, large or massive bleeding, there the further outcomes of the patient are worse. If you have a pneumothorax, you just have to put a tube and the lung will expand. Any more questions? So there are other techniques. Uh, there is something called a two or three bronchoscope technique, which is called the kissing technique. And all those variations are there, wherein you put two bronchoscopes and with the one bronchoscope you do the sampling, with the other bronchoscope you can put the Fogarty or you can just visualize and do the suctioning. But mostly those procedures are uh, really very complicated and putting two scopes in a single patient is really a difficult task. It is, It may be uncomfortable for the patient also. So. It's a better idea to go stick to the internationally described procedures, which is this kind of a procedure where you have an artificial airway, prophylactic occlusion balloon, and fluoroscopy. Always, always take at least two samples. Better to take it from two different lobes. If you have upper lobe involvement, better to take one sample from the upper lobe also. But don't do it in the initial part when you initial 
uh, time when you are starting the procedure because there placing the Fogarty balloon is a real challenge and there is a higher risk of the Fogarty balloon getting displaced because the bronchus is such a small one, the right upper lobe bronchus. So if you have a displacement, there may be a good amount of bleeding. So at least initially don't start with the upper lobes. If you have done 20-25 procedures, then you should sample the upper lobe. And if you are doing all from the lower lobes, go to two different segments. It's better to take four, at least four bites, although some uh, international guidelines say that two bites may be enough. But try to go for four uh, tissues and at least two tissues with five millimeter, which are more than five millimeter in diameter. Then there is a greater chance of getting the diagnosis. And always you have to combine it with clinical radiologic data in a multidisciplinary te team discussion because sometimes you don't get as much amount of information as you get from a surgical lung biopsy. So even in the best of the international series, especially from the Venerino Paletti group from Italy, they have. Uh, found a good concordance of a UIP pattern between cryobiopsies and surgical lung biopsies. But they also state that with cryobiopsies, they are mostly able to get probable UIP pattern. With the surgical lung biopsies, there is a greater chance of getting a definite UIP pattern. But mostly, once you are combining the all the data, even a probable UIP pattern is good enough to reach a diagnosis. So especially if you want to differentiate between HP and IPF. With HP, most you'll get very nice peribronchiolar inflammation or peribronchiolar fibrosis, which will help you in differentiating it from UIP where the fibrosis or the, uh, there is no inflammation mostly and the fibrosis is more peripheral. It is at the periphery of the lobules. So even small amounts of tissue can give you a good uh, diagnostic differentiation. Any more questions? No? You break for lunch? Yeah, please, please. Yeah, so uh, so the literature says that uh, with the left, because the left uh, bronchus is longer, longer, so it will take a longer time for a pooling blood to go to the right side, to well up and to go to the right side. But we usually prefer as a convention on the right side because it is easier to place the probes because of the smaller bronchi. It is easier to push the Fogarty. It may be easier to uh, place the Fogarty in the right upper lobe. So just as a bit of habit and convention, we go with the right side. But if uh, the disease is more on the left side, it is a good idea to sample the left side rather than the right. And the other point is that if you have heterogeneous areas on a CT scan, for example, one part is showing advanced honeycombing and another part is showing some reticulation with traction with a early honeycombing go for the part which has traction and early honeycombing because in advanced disease what you will find in the histology will be scar tissue. It will not be a UIP pattern, it will be just a non-specific scar which can be the end result of any kind of pattern. So go to the slightly less involved part, there you will be able to find early signs as well as the later signs and then the diagnostic differentiation will be much better. Okay, thank you. Thank you, sir. It was really an informative session and an interactive session. Sir, like now we'll be going for lunch. I request every delegates and dignitaries to back in time by 2.10 p.m.
well conventional tbna is just like that driving blindly now this is the sample we take with conventional tbna and this is the sample with ebus so friends it is time that we switch on the line lights and take the sample and in fact be confident that uh, we are reaching the destination with 100% certainty or no, not even 100 then 90% certainty so the answer to this question is should endobronchial ultrasound guide every tbna well probably the answer is yes so there are various indications what are the indications because ebus takes the sample from the mediastinum and so whenever there is any swelling growth any enlargement of the lymph nodes that of the lymph nodes that are attached to the airways that is the indication when we do ebus so one is the mediastinal masses then mediastinal lymph node of unclear etiology diagnosis of non small cell lung cancer negative conventional tbna staging of non small cell lung cancer so basically all these encompass the area that is adjoining to the airways now the contraindication so the absolute contraindication if the patient is not giving the informed consent and when the uh, instrument in itself is not working properly then if the patient is having severe refractory hypoxia and if the uh, there is uncorrectable bleeding diathesis the relative contraindications are if in the past one and a half month that is 6 weeks the patient has had any life threatening cardiac arrhythmias current or recent mi then respiratory insufficiency or failure uncontrolled hypertension poorly controlled heart failure or the patient is uncooperative in fact uh, we also need to look at the medications of the patient like uh, we have to check whether if the patient is taking any antiplatelet agents so we need to stop 4 to 5 days so in order to make you easy and uh, make this easy to understand just remember the magic number 5 because almost in all these the common number is 5 so stop the antiplatelet agent also for 5 days then low molecular weight he heparin 24 hours that is one day warfarin almost 3 to 5 days and clopidogrel also 5 to 7 days and uh, it is not to be done if inr is greater than 1.3 or aptt is greater than 1.5 times and also the five number is also seen when the platelets are less than 50000 per microliter complications in ebus generally it is a safe procedure and uh, so in uh, we encountered in our cases uh, fever cough and in those cases we administered them with antibiotic rest in the literature there are many other complications that are listed such as mediastinal abscess emphysema pericarditis sepsis needle breakage lung abscess empyema bleeding hypotension death complication due to anesthesia although they are quite uh, not very frequently encountered so a very important uh, thing about ebus is because we are going to puncture the lymph nodes so before uh, doing ebus this anatomy of lymph node station should be a muscle memory in your brain before starting ebus this is the slide that is uh, that is showing the mediastinal lymph node anatomy and i think almost all of you have seen this picture before but it is very important to mug it up and remember it first is the supraclavicular lymph node then 2r that is the upper paratracheal then 3 is the prevascular 3a then retrotracheal 3p then lower paratracheal that is 4r 4l then we come to 5 that is subaortic 6 is the paraaortic 7 subcarinal 8 is paraesophageal 9 is pulmonary ligament then hilar interlobar lobar segmental subsegmental now from where are we taking samples are all of these lymph nodes accessible to us in ebus no not all in fact limited number of mediastinal lymph nodes are only accessible to us and these are the lymph nodes one is uh, as you can see there are three procedures from which we can take mediastinal sampling 
वन इज द मीडिया स्टेनोस्कोपी सेकेंड इज ई बस एंड थर्ड इज ई एस सो टू मेक इट ईजियर फॉर यू टू लर्न एंड रिमेंबर मीडिया स्टेनोस्कोपी टेक्स द सैम्पल नोट सैम्पल फ्रॉम ऑल द प्लेसेज फ्रॉम द टॉप वन टू सेवन रिमूविंग द फाइव एंड सिक्स लेंथ नोट एंड देन कम्स द ई यू एस ई यू एस टेक सैम्पल ऑल फ्रॉम द पोस्टीरियर साइड ऑफ द लिम्फ नोट दैट इज द पोस्टीरियर पार्ट ऑफ द फोर एल एज वेल एज सेवन एट नाइन पलमोनरी लिगमेंट एंड द पैराइसोफेजल लिम्फ नोट नाउ दिस इज द पिक्चर दैट इज इम्पॉर्टेंट बिकॉज इन दिस पिक्चर इज हिडन ऑल द लिम्फ नोट एंड देयर एनाटमी दिस इज वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट इफ यू आर गोइंग टू परफॉर्म ई बस so first of all looking at the two r two l stations these are the stations that are on the top so uh, the upper part is the upper part forms the is formed by the manubrium and the lower part of the second lymph node is formed by on the right side it is formed by intersection of the brachiocephalic vein with the trachea and on the left side it is formed by the arch of aorta okay so this you remember this is the second two this is the two and here this is what i'm talking about this is the two r on the right side and two l on the left side now we come to the four r four that is the lower paratracheal lower paratracheal on the right side you can see it is the intersection of the brachiocephalic vein with the trachea upper border is formed by this and the lower border is formed by the azygous vein so this is the on the right side and on the left side 4l that is upper border of the arch of aorta to the upper border of the what is this pulmonary artery so this is the 4r then on the left side it is the 4l now coming down this is, on the right side it is 10r we are seeing So ten R starts with the azygous vein on the top, and on the lower it is the interlobar area region. And similarly on the ten L also it starts with the pulmonary artery and ends with the interlobar region. And the eleven R. So on the right side there are two. One is eleven R superior and eleven R inferior. So when the where the upper border upper uh, uh, right upper bronchus is departing from the main bronchus that is the where the 11 rs is lying and where the right middle zone and right lower lobe is departing bronchus that is where the 11 r uh, inferior is lying then on the left side also in the interlobar region there is 11 l lymph node and where is sub 7 subcranial lymph node lying subcranial lymph node this is not working uh, the subcranial lymph node is that is 7 you can see between the two bronchus right and left in between just the center of the slide so this this is important and these are the landmarks this is how you are going to see it in the ultrasound this is the ultrasound images that are adjacent to the bronchoscopic image coming to the ebus procedure this is the scope that we use and it is quite similar to the bronchoscope the details of the scope we will be discussing on the ebus workstation and the ultrasound processor the scope is attached to the processor and there are few things that are important about the processor there are some manual uh, um, things that you can change uh, while we are looking at the ultrasound image one is like the gain you can adjust the brightness gain is like the volume control of our stereo so you can adjust the brightness of the image then depth depth is important why because because the frequency is frequency decides the depth that means that one is the radial probe it has got the frequency of 20 to 30 megahertz and the convex probe ebus that has got the frequency of 7.5 megahertz that means convex probe has lot got lower frequency and higher frequency is of the radial probe so the depth with which you are seeing the uh, image that is decided by the scope so 7.5 that means lower frequency means the uh, image depth will be increased low frequency more depth 
uh, high frequency, less depth. It's the other way around, opposite. So you can learn by that. And so uh, Doppler is also associated definitely because that only helps us decide whether the uh, flow is going, it is arterial or venous. As well as the distal end of the scope is different as compared to the bronchoscope. This is the transducer. Transducer because this is the area that helps us to see what is in the uh, ultrasonographic image. So we apply a balloon here and remember that we have to put saline water inside the balloon. Air should not be uh, there and the target, our target also while doing EBUS is the same only. Air is the enemy, water is friend. Needle parts are also basically there are four locks. We will be discussing them in the workstation also. One is the assembly lock that is the flange. Then the sheath is adjusted by the sheath lock. Then needle lock is there and the fourth is the stillet. We will be discussing this properly in the workstation. Anesthesia, we generally do it under conscious sedation using midazolam, glycopyrrolate and uh, generally pa patients uh, can uh, easily get this done, get procedure done easily under this LA. But sometimes if the patient is uncooperative, then we have to lay, take the patient under LMA or ET tube. The uh, disadvantage of ET tube is because it is long, so uh, the 2R stations, 2R and 2L stations cannot be approached. So you have to be careful with that. So 15 steps of EBUS workstations, these are the steps, how we are performing it, these will also be dealt in the workstation. I hope I am able to simplify things for you because it is said if you cannot explain it simply then you do not understand it well enough. So hopefully I am trying to make it simplified for you. So it is, uh, this is the basically the, this is the trolley that we prepare. There are slides, then there is vacuolog syringe, suction and as well as this is the syringe. Uh, we are uh, inflating the balloon and uh, just trying that none of the none of the air or bubbles are present in the balloon. So this is how we do it and now the balloon is well fitted. Okay and here also this is a lymph node that you are seeing the isoechoic area and the hyper echoic area on the lower part is the lung and uh, the needle has been inserted inside and it is now taking the passes and the needle is going now uh, after taking the bronchial cells out it's going from one end of the lymph node to the other taking the passes from the entire length of the needle generally the periphery passes yield more I think this also we will be seeing in the live case now talking about a few case scenarios this was uh, 65 years with complaints of difficulty in breathing and cough since 6 months and uh, he received radiotherapy for squamous cell carcinoma mouth in 2008. This was the CT scan of the patient showing left upper lobe collapse as well as the 4 hour lymph node was visible. So we took the passes, we also uh, did the bron uh, bronchoscopy. The bronchial biopsy showed non-small cell lung cancer and you can see that here 7 as well as the 4R showed the metastatic carcinoma. Now the disease, the pathology, the uh, cancer was on the left side, but the contralateral side, that is the right side, was also showing metastatic car carcinoma. This is the uh, photo of a core biopsy specimen. That means the uh, staging has jumped, jumped from N2 to N3. That means the patient is now coming in the 3B group, making the tumor unresectable. Then another case, this was a case of unexplained cough with a 66 year old male who complains of cough for 6 months. He was taking anti-tubercular treatment for last 2 months. He had these mediastinal lymph nodes present at 7 and 4 hour and the EBUS TBNA showed squamous cell carcinoma. Now another patient, this was an unexplained non-responsive cough. This was a 52 year old male with complaints of cough dyspnea since 2 months and the previous FOB TBNA was negative. Media standard lymph nodes were positive in the CT scan as can be seen here and we took, uh, we did the uh, EBUS and this is how we took the cytology sample. 
and uh, so when we conducted the cbus tbna and it was found out uh, it, the cytology was showing non necrotizing granulomatous lymphadenitis now case 4 this was a 60 year old male with complaints of decreased appetite loss of weight since 3 months and there was a past history of att since 6 months the patient was not responding so this was the lymph node that was present in the mediastinal lymph node and again we took the passes and it was found out that caseating granulomatous lymphadenitis was present and later found out to be ntm m chiloni positive on culture a 50 year old another case of, of a 50 year old male who presented with cough for 6 months and decreased appetite and weight loss for 6 months then sputum fb was negative mt was negative in this patient looked like the reports were normal but when we did the ct scan for l lymph node was visible and we did the cytopathology and it showed that uh, there was benign lymphoid hyperplasia but when we did the gene expert it came out to be mtb positive but no resistance rifampicin resistance was seen so this is the procedure tb ebus tbna it had the diagnostic accuracy uh, in lung cancer it is uh, greater than 95% then if it is mediastinal metastasis coming from some extra thoracic malignancy it is 90% non malignant disease it is around 78 79% and in sarcoidosis also it is the same it appears to be uh, it helps in the diagnosis and treatment of mediastinal lymph node and it can be used as a procedure so initially whenever you look at a new procedure it appears intimidating so but, but once you start doing it uh, doing it and uh, doing it frequently then it becomes very easy so it always seems impossible until it's done we have done till now 500 cases and still doing thank you thank you dr nishta for a precise and simplified lecture any questions from audience okay so we have got a live case uh, just after another talk then uh, if you have any doubts and queries you can uh, dr nishta first of all it's a very short crisp and crunchy lecture yes it was fine uh, like 15 minutes i have one question lecture. did you find any correlation between radiological finding and histological finding yes definitely uh generally what happens when we are looking at the uh, especially when we are looking at lymph nodes on ct scan sometimes here we suspect that there may be necrosis in the lymph node and when we are doing ebus also then we find we are always looking whether pus is coming or not and generally in those patients we have noticed that pus comes out and on after uh, asking the pathologist what does she see then most likely tb tuberculosis or sometimes squamous cell carcinoma that is coming out in those samples so there is like sometimes uh, we can see the correlation so, uh, you are comparing your ct findings with histological finding yes the ct scan first we look at the ct scan then we do the procedure and uh, once we are looking at the ct scan we have got a general hint or picture that probably this uh, is going to be this kind probably if like the nodes are quite big and uh, if they are looking very homogeneous on ct scan then we think it is sarcoidosis and if uh, it is like a mass it, and uh, the mm, boundaries are also not very clear if the boundary uh, margins are irregular then we are suspecting as malignancy and generally when we did uh, when we do ebus if it is malignancy we get plenty of material that is the first hint we get that probably this is going to be come positive for malignancy and if it is sarcoidosis the material is very less very scanty so we uh, at that time also we keep on trying ki uh, the material should should be sufficient enough for the uh, pathologist to see lymphocytes only so you are doing staging of the lung cancer patients yes. so you assess all of the possible lymph nodes yes all of the possible see best staging is always done when we combine the procedures together and we combine media stenoscopy plus eus ebus so uh, sometimes uh, whenever it is possible 
that limited staging is also uh, uh, feasible as the oncologist he uh, wants us to perform then ebus we are doing what all uh, lymph nodes are assessed by us we take the uh, samples and we take keep them differently in different compartments in different uh, papers also so that they don't the slides don't get mixed up and uh, uh, so first of all whenever like in this case also if the disease is on one side then first of all we uh, diagnose the tumor and once the tumor is diagnosed then we take the sample from the contralateral side first because if that comes positive then we don't need it to isn't. take samples in between thank you audience any questions thank you ma'am now i request dr govind rajavat sir to give a token of momento to dr nishtha ma'am next our topic will be on rapid on site sampling i request dr arundhati kelkar to the stage uh, dr arundhati kelkar is a consultant in histopathology at precision path lab and she also consultant in histopathology at hcg cancer institute jaipur good afternoon everybody uh, let me begin by thanking the organizers for uh, giving me an opportunity to have this session on uh, rose i'll quickly run you uh, through this uh, rapid on site evaluation before we proceed for the live uh, ebus uh, uh, workshop so rose that is rapid on site evaluation is basically an optimizing procedure whereby we assess adequacy of the diagnostic material that we obtain during different passes in uh, any interventional pulmonology procedure not re necessarily restricted to uh, ebus because the main goal of any of these procedures is basically to get as much material as possible so that we can give the patient a diagnosis so uh, the main utility is basically uh, to optimize the quantity of diagnostic material that is procured during a procedure with the aim of reducing the number of biopsy passes that we need to get that material uh, also to reduce the number of subsequent repeat procedures with the final goal of uh, making this a cost effective procedure for the patient so that he has a final diagnosis and uh, what is coming up in a big way is basically triaging the sample uh, in anticipation of any further testing or studies that may be required depending on the clinical context um, either your microbiology culture studies or if it is a suspected malignancy then going ahead with uh, immunohistochemistry if it is a suspected hematologic malignancy going ahead with flow cytometry or molecular testing or ngs so basically what is done is the specimen that is obtained are your aspirate smears from the uh, fna that is uh, uh, done during the procedure or if you are obtaining a core biopsy then we do touch smears or imprint smears it's a very simple procedure whereby uh, once the smears are prepared we stain them with a rapid stain i'll just show you what all stains we can use depending on your um, setup or your hospital or institute uh, once those slides are stained they are examined under a microscope by a pathologist and uh, general uh, diagnostic categories are given depending on what we see under the microscope 
So it's a very simple workstation with a microscope, the slides and the staining material. Uh, so far there is no uh, standardized staining protocol for performing rows in any uh, uh, various institutes but you can decide what works best with your pathologist and in your institute. So the various stains that are available are diff quick or you can do a rapid uh, pap stain, a rapid HND stain, toledine blue or a brilliant crystal blue. So to, for today's workshop what we'll be using is 1% uh, brilliant crystal blue. So this is just to show you what the cells look like under the microscope with different stains. You know, you have diff quick or HE or pap stain. These are the diagnostic categories that are given once the smears are examined under microscope. So you either have a non-diagnostic or inadequate pass, that is inadequate smears. You have diagnostic or adequate where material uh, is present sufficient for diagnosis. This may or may not give you a final conclusion at the end of your routine testing. Atypical cells are seen but this could be either reactive or it could be neoplastic. Suspicious for malignancy and malignant. These are the uh, general categories that are reported. So it's like a loop in loop. The procedure, the operator gives the pathologist uh, the smears. The uh, pathologist uh, goes through the smears, uh, tries to give a diagnosis at that point or if he cannot give a final diagnosis, gives a preliminary diagnosis and gets back to the operator as to what uh, be collected. So uh, like I'll just give two three examples. Uh, for example, uh, if the pathologist is seeing large number of neutrophils in, uh, in the smears, um, the diagnosis is usually an abscess, either a biogenic, bacterial. So he can, uh, he can tell the operator to collect the subsequent material in uh, microbiology culture mediums or to cell block it in formalin so that we can do special stains for uh, acid fast bacilli as well as fungi. If the pathologist sees a small round cell tumor in an appropriate setting and suspects a non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, further material can be collected in RPMI for flow cytometry or it can be cell blocked for immunohistochemistry or molecular studies. If there is a malignant epithelial tumor that is seen, this material goes straight away in formalin uh, for immunohistochemistry, molecular studies or NGS as the case may be. So basically rows can be used for uh, any of the interventional pulmonology procedures including um, TBNA, both EBUS as well as conventional. It can be used for radial EBUS, it can be used with uh, transbronchial brushing, transbronchial lung biopsies or even on, on thoracoscopic biopsies. So uh, there are multiple studies and uh, many of these have shown a good concordance between evaluation, uh, uh, the initial evaluation and the final reporting as high as a 97% diagnostic accuracy in many studies. So basically this procedure is used to uh, elevate the quality or raise the uh, quantity of specimen that is obtained, reducing the number of subsequent passes, saving costs without increasing in complication rate or procedure time. Uh, at the same time, it gives you a, a consistently accurate report, like I said, almost 97% accuracy in many of the studies. and. Uh, what is important is choosing the patient where you need rows. So rows has been found to have very good utility uh, mostly in peripheral pulmonary masses or in patient groups where you are strongly suspecting lung malignancy. So that was a brief talk on rows. Uh, any questions? Superb lecture ma'am. Ma'am uh, how many passes you need? on daily basis in uh, conventional TBNA or EBUS TBNA? So uh, conventional TBNA definitely as opposed to EBUS will require more, may require more passes for uh, diagnostic material evaluation. Um, uh, if the first or second pass itself yields material that is enough for interpretation, then definitely the sub number of subsequent passes will reduce because you will just need enough material for ancillary testing. 
so definitely ebus guided tbna reduces the number of passes there is no doubt about that so uh, from a pathology side madam uh, what's your experience is ki uh, in conventional tb minimum this much passes should be done in each and every see, it all depends on the diagnostic yield sometimes you have yield in the first pass itself then you you don't have to uh, struggle with you know gaining more material for uh, subsequent procedures but ebus guided tbna usually uh, we get material good diagnostic material in far fewer passes as compared to conventional uh, tbna as uh, many centers they don't have any pathologists at the site so ma'am what is the minimal requirement of minimal study material for pulmonologists to check out the they, they are able to do rows uh, in the in in your lab so um see rows can be done by a reasonably trained uh, technician also provided validation has been done so uh, ideally all places that do tbna should do rows uh, in order to optimize their procedures but uh, what is more important is um, you know uh, when the material is obtained making the smears correctly is what is uh, the onus lies on you because if the smears are too thick or they have uh, you know dried up yielding non diagnostic material the only option left is to repeat the procedure again so uh, during the workshop at uh, this live station i'll just show how to make smears also so that we don't crush the cells as well as we make adequately thick smears so that they are interpretable ma'am i think this is also depend on clinicians and etiology of different etiologies of the lung diseases like Correct. in lung malignancies the yield is very high the yield and is in high, lymphoma yes. and non hodgkins lymphoma and infections the yield is low correct so, so this is depending depend on, on the, the pathologic disease, process disease. also where there is a lot of fibrosis obviously yes. the yield is going to be low yes. but malignancies by far give a very good yield yes. thank you thank you very much any questions from out thank you ma'am thank you ma'am it was a very informative session i would now like to request dr mohit agarwal sir to facilitate dr arundhati thank you sir now i request dr madhu joshi sir to facilitate dr govind rajawat and dr mohit agarwal thank you sir now everyone is waiting for the live ebus session so to start the session i request dr shitu singh dr srishti jain and dr vijayan solangi to the dais so very good afternoon i think it has been uh, an exhausting day um, quizzes and live cases and i think we still have the hands on and now we will be uh, connecting to uh, the ot for the live relay of the endobronchial ultrasound so ebus is an exciting uh, area where you know we always felt what to do with the mediastinal uh, masses and then the from the eus evolved the ebus the landmark paper was the felix hurt paper in chest 
which showed that the yield of ebus guided samples is way better than tbna and you know if you speak to people from the old school they will still vouch for tbna but trust me the yield is much better for all nodes other than subcarinal so other than subcarinal the yield of ebus is 84% versus a tbna of 58% and for subcarinal the yield is 86% for ebus and by tbna it is somewhere around 74 to 76% so uh, it has totally changed the outlook and the ball game for interventional pulmonology so uh, i'll now pass on to dr shrishti to introduce dr r uh, operators thank you so much dr shetu for inviting us here today i would like to introduce these um, the trainers who will be going through the live ebus workshop and i feel happy to say it's all women bar here so dr sonia dalal she is the director at the dalal sleep and chest medical institute at kalyan mumbai and mom is a very experienced chest physician and has been practicing interventional pulmonology for many years and uh, she will be accompanied by dr nishtha singh who is the executive director and senior chest consultant at asthma bhavan jaipur so over and out to the videography team okay so the case which we will be seeing now is a she is a 75 year old lady and she presented with the chief complaints of cough malaise loss of weight and appetite since 3 months uh, there's no significant past history and uh, she is a chronic smoker for the last 30 to 35 years her chest x ray uh, can we display the chest x ray her sputum afb was negative and uh, all right it's all right all right so we'll directly go into the operation theater now anupriya can you hear us madhu can you just call the ot yes anupriya is here Dr. Anupriya, can we see the CT scan? Yes, uh, we'll show you the CT scan. Okay, okay, thank you. Can someone focus over here? So we have an HR and we also have a mediastinal cut. Is the CT scan visible? Yes, yeah, visible. Okay. So if you look at it, the patient has got a lower hilar lesion. Uh, since I'm scrubbed up, I'll not be able to show, but I'll put my finger. If you look at this, there's a lower hilar lesion over here. Similarly, she on an HR. She also has a multi-nodular uh, uh, opacity with some fibrosis around, and she has one right forearm, which is uh, right paratracheal lymph node, as well as a subcarinal lymph node. If I can show you, this is the forearm, and this is the subcarinal lymph node. So what we will do is we will first try to go in in the on the left side and see if we can isolate this lesion. If fine, then we'll take a uh, pass from here. If not, if it is too low for us, then first we'll go immediately to the core R. We'll take the uh, pass from the core R. Our pathologist will uh, do the rows and tell us whether the yield is good, whether the uh, sample is representable sample, and then then we'll go to station seven. Uh, let me show you how we prepare the tray. So this is the tray that we are preparing. Where 
train we will have please focus on the train this is the ebus needle the part i am sure dr nisha will show you during uh, uh, the uh, table so this is the ebus needle this is the shape and there is a needle which is inside what we will do is uh, normally we are supposed to look at the shape and uh, adjust the shape which is just 1 mm outside uh, the bronchoscope when we are putting it against the wall of the bronchial uh, bronchial tube so outside first we will adjust and see show you the uh, shape which is outside and then probably do it inside and check as well can we have the scope please nisha can we switch off the light we have xylocaine we have a uh, saline and we also have a xylocaine for a local anesthesia so if the patient comes the reason for intubating through a low, uh, lma is that it is very important for all of you to know how to intubate through a ebus scope because of the transducer transducer there is a forward angle of the uh, light which is 0 degree uh, in fusion film to 45 degree in uh, the uh, pentex and in olympus we have a 30 degree so what happens is when you try to intubate like conventional bronchoscope you will probably not be able to go into the endobronchial tree in that case you have to pass the arytenoid and you have to go little anteriorly touching the anterior orifice of the vocal cord and then intubate and that's the reason we decided to put the lma in this lady rather than intubating can we have the scope please can you remove the uh, suction suction can you remove the suction please just a moment of interruption i would request dr dk jain to uh, take his place on the dais i think so please we are just checking please carry on yeah we are just checking the position of the chip so that once we are inside and if there is a clouding and we are not able to see the shape the needle will not injure the inner lining of the bronchoscope this is how the shit goes inside and this is busy shot one okay you have two types of and this is how we put it and when you put the push this there is a locking mechanism this will lock the shit inside the whole needle inside the bronchoscope now what we do is we will look at this can you focus over here fine nisha can you just uh, no no you push put inner pocket here if you can look at it this pushing the shit outside if you can see the shit is coming out over here we just need one to two mm of shit outside so that that's it lock it lock it correct so this is the ideal and the correct position of the shit when we are putting it outside so that now even if we don't visualize the shit inside when we are in the bronchus this is not going to injure through the needle now we will try to put in put the needle out and see if you can see the needle now if you can see there is some dragging effect over here when i'm pu pushing the needle the sheet is moving little bit inside for this what i'll do is these are the very important tips that you need to know i'll put the sheet little bit outside little outside so that it doesn't injure fine and now i'll put the needle inside little up to the level of the sheet that's it so now we won't have a dragging effect because the needle is lying over here and it is going to oppose the endobronchial wall any question situ yes so does uh, anyone in the audience have any questions everyone is clear so what we see here is uh, we have to uh, save the scope from injury these scopes are very expensive you need to handle them very carefully not only it is cost but it is you know months when the scope is in service so you will not be able to do the procedure so does anyone have any question everyone is clear about the needle so the needle is made so complicated to uh, have a protection for the ebus scope so that light it does not puncture it light and suction i think they are going through the lma we are going through lma so 
so that we will show you the vocal cords and how you have to have an anterior deflection of the scope through the arytenoids and go through the anterior commissure of the uh, vocal cords. So jelly is still very important so that it reduces the friction uh, when the scope is passing. So I think uh, PIP, we would now like to have the PIP image. Nishtha, we can't hear you well. Yes, better, but it could be louder. Okay, so now we are going. LMA, I gel, and as you people can see here, you can uh, uh, all of you can see the vocal cords now. Are the vocal cords visible to everyone? Ye yes, I think yes. Yes. So now we are, as you can see, we are able to see the an uh, anterior part of the vocal cord. Now crossing the vocal cord. This is also important because it is not that normal bronchoscope. You will yes, always. This is not like you have a forward angle because there is a transducer and the light source is be light is behind so there is a forward angle of 30 degree and that's the reason you will have to probably go anteriorly and then intubate the patient through an ever scope now we are going inside and once we are inside One ml of one percent xylocaine, and again we will again uh, at the carina while we are reaching at the carina we will again put the aliquid. One percent of one ml xylocaine is the anesthesia is very important because mostly you will not be having so much sedation and you will be doing it in very only midazolam probably. So now uh, I think uh, the anesthetist has given a propofol and patient is under conscious sedation under LMA. There is no deep sedation. As you can see I have just inflated the balloon here. Is the balloon visible? It is at the 5 o'clock, 6 o'clock position. It's a, five, it's a small crescent which is away, uh, seen at the 5 o'clock position. If you can see the balloon. I have deflated it a little bit because it was it, it has to be a very small crescent otherwise there will be a lot of acoustic coupling. Ok now I will just scan the area and uh, I will check whether 7 lymph node is present. We can change the view also if the endoscopic uh, the ultrasound view can be a bit bigger. So now then you have to focus on the ultrasound view rather than the endobronchial. We want to see the lymph node and the position that Dr. Nishtha has taken is the 7. Now color can be added. Can we give the color? color Once you see the node, you have to see what type it is, what, what is the shape of the node, so now the is it homogeneous, heterogeneous. Color is basically for the Doppler in order to see whether we are seeing the vessel or it is something else. Now uh, going to see the, uh, can you see the 7 lymph node as it so, this, is this is patient 7, that is the subcarinal lymph node. So, wrist movement here is very important. Even a small movement will, uh, you know, disappear the image that you were looking at. And sometimes when the scope loses contact, there yeah. are certain reverberations. This is 4R. If you can see the, Jitu, can you see I am pointing on yes. my finger? Yes. Right? So that is 4R. So, this is the 4R and this is the whole vessel. And if you put in Doppler, you can see the color. Once you see the node, you see how is it homogeneous, heterogeneous, so the, the size. So there is a nasigus which is draining, that is the nasigus vein which is draining into SVC. So now we are going and so we have got 7 lymph node as well as the 4R. Now going towards, I have entered into the left main bronchus and as you can see it is, the, it is slightly narrow. It is narrow. So now please concentrate on the endobronchial so, view. This is 4L. If you can see, if you can see, uh, this is called a Mickey Mouse sign. This is called a Mickey Mouse sign where there is pulmonary artery and the aorta. And if you can see this lymph node, this is 4L. 
Chitu, can you say that? Yes. The two ears of Mickey yes. Mouse. Yes. This is classical sign pre-PG, like question for your exams PG also. Exam. Yes. And the small lymph node wedge between these two vessels. And it's the most difficult one to access because it is at a right angle. Right? So when you have to take a pass from here, you have to come first in the center at the carina, put in the sheath and then go. Because it's at a cut, at the right angle of a carina and the break up, breaking of the left upper lobe. And many times what happens is when you put the needle inside, the vision goes. Yes. Because the uh, scope that becomes very rigid, less flexible. So it's difficult to maneuver at that point. But this the uh, EBUS that uh, Dr. Nishtha is using is a thinner one. The earlier conventional was 6.8, very thick scope. The, this one is 6.1. Am I correct? Yes, yes, yes. 6.6 millimeter and earlier one was 6.3 millimeter. Yes, yes. You can go here. What do you see? Uh, can you be louder? So, so this is this is a lymph node. This is eleven uh, L. This is eleven L. So uh, she's gone into the left lower lobe, and she's put uh, the scope into the uh, left lower lobe, the junction of the left left upper and the left lower, and rotated on the left side at nine o'clock position. So this is eleven L. So probably we can. that was visualized they had very irregular margins they were not very clear there was a lot of areas of necrotic so it was not homogeneous so once you see it you see for areas of necrosis you also see central hilar structure and you also see for some necrotic areas like coagulation necrosis sign so once you have that sign positive the chances of malignancy become very high the other thing that you need to see is the vascularity of the lymph nodes so if you have a very vascular node and especially the big vessels, the even it has an impact on the survival for the patient. So, so higher uh, the vascularity, over over to you ma'am. Yeah, uh, uh, we have started taking the first pass. So some of the points for the PG students, you know, the needle has got a stylet. Now this stylet with needle in will be very blunt. So when you want to take the, uh, the pass, you need to withdraw the stylet little bit so that you know the uh, bluntness of the needle goes away. Right? And then uh, she will put in the needle with a jabbing position. Sometimes what happens, you know, you can encounter cartilage uh, in between. So the person who is helping can also help in, you know, stabilizing the bronchoscope at the LMA level or even at the endotracheal level or even if you don't do anything at the mouth level. Once you stabilize that, then you go with the needle with a jab. You uh, have to, you know, rinse or uh, take uh, the stylet three or four times because while going inside, you probably have encountered lot of epithelial cells of uh, uh, of the bronchial mucosal uh, bronchial mucosal epithelium. You shed it off, and then only you take the pass. The other thing is, first three pass should always be without a negative suction, because what we need is we need good cellularity. If it is a very bleeding thing, and there is a lot of bleeding, then there will be a lot of hemodilution, and there will be you know uh, the cells probably would not be visible. So what Nishta has done is. She's withdrawn the stylet little bit. Now she's doing a jab, and I'm I'm holding this very tight so that the movement of my bronchoscope does not occur. I hope I'm clear, Shetu. Uh, look very carefully. These are very important steps. If you miss any of them, there will be you know damage to the scope, damage and you don't the want that. 
damage to the scope and you will also make the lesion right the and dr arundhati will tell us okay only bronchial cells and then your patient will come back to you oh, what did you do doctor On the so this is the crescent of the side. balloon. Can we have a focus over here? So this is the crescent of the balloon. If you can have a look at it, and that's the you know that is the uh, you know sheath which is out with the needle which is thin, so that we are avoiding the dragging effect which I talked about. Right? This is the balloon, and this is the sheath of the needle. She is withdrawing a little bit, so that we won't want uh, this to push against the wall, and the needle would not go inside, and there will be a movement of the sheath at the bronchial wall only. Okay. This is the point of the entry for the needle. If you look at the green dot over here, from here the needle would enter. The sheet would be over here, and whatever lymph node we are isolating will be isolating over here. The other thing is, if anyone is interested uh, knowing about the frequency which we had said, or the you know, uh, or the contrast and all, normally, uh, I mean, we can talk this at the table as well. Do you have to have a sink with this and this? So four R is uh, at, uh, you come with the scope at the carinal level, and from there you start good rotating sweeping movement. So uh, once you are at carina at twelve o'clock, then you start rotating the scope like this. At nine o'clock would be four R. And slowly and gently, when you are rotating, you will come across the anterior paratracheal lymph node. So all those groups are fora. Above that is the brachiocephalic or the indominate artery, and below is the azygous way. And for indominate way, so here you see way. a very beautiful lymph node, right? So this is the lymph node that we can see. Look at this, and now we will stabilize this. There is some vascularity, not much, but there is some. And I will. And I'll show you the doctor as well. So there is no vascularity. So no, they are excluding out any major vessels that can, you know, you bleed and puncture. So one, uh, the lesion, the lymph node has been localized. Then what should we do? Is first of all check to check whether the lesion is blocked and is in correct place. The tooth is also in the correct place. Then we will. Yes. Yeah. And normally you have to move the needle from cortex to cortex. Now see, she is, uh, you know, rinsing this, you know, so that uh, you know we are dislodging all the bronchial epithelium. And now he is coming out. He is taking this off. Correct. Despite this, there may may be some cells still left inside because once you apply suction, those may, those may come back. But that's okay. It's acceptable. So in the first three passes, we are planning not to apply suction so that no. Uh, Not a lot of blood comes inside the sample. So there are two concepts. One is uh, people who favor suction. Other people who you know just use the stylet and take it out very slowly, which creates a negative pressure. So both are okay, and uh, the ones that do not use the suction, they have less of bleeding and less hemodilution. See too. Correct. As you can see, the needle is going from one end of the lymph node to the other end. So it is. It is seen that more material comes not from the center but from the periphery of the lymph node. So it is very important to sample the periphery of the lymph node. And around 20 passes are doing 20 times in and out, uh, up and down movements of uh, is the correct term to be used. So it is useless move up and down from one 
periphery. If you can see, there is some dislodging of the cellular material over here. And so again, once uh, I have taken 20 jars, and now I will, what I will do is, as the suction is not there, I will take uh, take inside. I will pull out the needle. So the needle is pulled out, and the lock is. Then the flange lock is unlocked and the needle is taken over to sonium and So now we will show you how we give the material for the rose. Can mm -hmm. we have a focus over here? Can I have the needle? So the first thing is we will take the needle out. So as important as it is to take the sample, but it is also important how to know how to collect the sample appropriately. So we will take the needle out, first we will put the stylet in and whatever material has come will come on the needle, uh, on the slide. Can you please focus on the slides we can't see? Ca Madam, Cameraman, can you zoom in please? Can a bit, bit more, slide? yes. Can you take it on the slide, please? Yeah. So during the EBUS training, we also learned how to make slides. Yes. So that's also very important. Meanwhile, that's you can okay. see Dr. Nishtha ma managing the uh, hemo, uh, maintaining hemostasis on the right side. Now, uh, you know, Dr. Arundhati will show you how the slide is to be prepared in case if you don't have a pathologist for a rose. You can also do a prose, which is physician oriented, you know, uh, how to make a slide and how to look whether the material is adequate or not. So you can see material, that's important. And the thing is that if you put too much material on the slide, it will go away on the side and you will waste material. So it's very important you have a very minimal invasive procedure to save the tissue and the material. So are we ready for the second pass? Kiti ved lagla? Doctor? Kiti ved lagla? Kiti kiti ved lagla? But what happens? How kidney there lagegi? You are a Marathi, no? So, so two Marathis talking to each other nice, na? <laughs> We don't have a dialect. So, uh, generally there is not a lot of bleeding, but in the first pass we saw some amount of bleeding. So that happens because there are blood vessels inside the lymph node. And uh, by experience, we generally see it uh, in malignancy cases because the malignancy lymph nodes are very vascular. Generally it happens that way. And so the blood vessels are also inside the lymph node. So now, uh, as you can see, we have another lymph node here localized. See, it's huge. It's the same one. Can it's you huge. show the vessels also, please? Colors. So these are the vessels you can see inside. So probably, uh, probably so small vessels, you know, but more one. ones. Can we take one more pass? Yes. You can take Let's check one more pass. pass. We take one more pass. And then if need be, we will take a negative suction. So if it's three, then we will go to subcarine. Whatever answer. What do you think? Is it the lymph node or is yes. it this is the... Oh, this is the lymph node, Shitu. Mm -hmm. We are at 4 hour. I mean, anterior uh, paratracheal. Yes. Again, the 4 hour ranges from 9 o'clock till 12 o'clock. That's so right. You, uh, and especially these big nodes, they may, you know, encroach upon other areas as well. It's very important. And this, this is, this is SVC. Now again, ensuring that the seat is out and, and the entry from here. You need to.
to see the sheep so that you don't puncture the skull. Beautiful jack, it's almost as if I'm uh, doing commenting for a cricket match. <laughs> and again, uh, the cells, the bronchial cells that had come inside the lumen were taken out by the cells. So try to, you know, sample as many lymph nodes as possible and from different angles. That increases the yield of the procedure. And there is one more thing, Shitu, that everyone needs to know that if you want to prove a malignancy, you have to move from cortex to cortex mm. because there is always a subcortical, uh, you know, infiltration of the malignant cells. So if you are in the middle, probably you might miss a malignancy. That's very important. I think it's uh, yes. the fastest has been taken, so please. And just look at the, uh, the clicking sound. Before the clicking sound, don't try to withdraw the needle because that means the needle is still in outside the uh, hub, right? Whenever there is a clicking sound, then only, then only dislodge and, uh, you know, uh, release the lock and remove the needle. Both, this and this, both. Many times, like, you are seeing there are reverberation artifacts here. These are the hyperechoic lines that are still visible. Non-small cell carcinoma. <laughs> So even before we did this second pass, that's the beauty of Rose. It shortens the procedure time. Otherwise, you will be like slogging on for an hour. We will, we will show you on the microscope also. We can focus it on the microscope. Uh, so ma'am, we can show you the cells. Ma'am, I understand. Just a second, ma'am. Can you? Uh, okay. Ma'am, I wanted you to show how the sample is taken in saline because okay. that's important. Right. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, can someone focus over here for us? So you are going in and you need sample for uh, tuberculosis as well. We are in a country with lot of prevalence and many uh, papers have shown that in India most common diagnosis is either sarcoid or TB. So you need to take sample in saline, send it for molecular testing and cultures we'll for tuberculosis. Show me the saline. Where is the saline? Uh, ah. Cameraman please wo dikhaiye. Camera ka image Camera dikhaiye. I think he has gone outside. No, no, he is here. We can see the microscopic image only. Ah, can you, can you see this? Better, Shitu? better, better. Yeah, yeah. So this is, we are collecting into saline. This is the material that we are collecting into saline for microbiology. Gene expert and everything. This is very, very important. You have to have sample both for uh, the tuberculosis as well as cytopathology and histopath and also if you could demonstrate in a couple of for his uh, the core biopsy as well yes and we can also show you uh, can you see this this is a nice chunk which has come out malignants you get lot of material and yes. even on looking on the slide you can say yeah this is you know so this is this is a fantastic material and uh, even for the you know microbiology we have collected a nice material Now you can show the uh, slide, uh, slide, 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 slide. So I think times are changing and it has become so exciting. Within, you know, five minutes you have a diagnosis. So this rapid on site is a beautiful and very um, exciting thing. Uh, only thing is you will have to give another needle now. Or else uh, we list. only see some cells. Yes, Dr. Arundhati, uh, can you be a bit lo louder? Yeah, Sonia, ma'am, yeah. uh, we are can hearing you? more of you, less of Dr. Arundhati. Yeah, can, am I audible now? Clearly? Yes, yeah. yes, yes. So, uh, the cells, they are better, better visualized under the microscope, not so good in the transmission. But what I can see is clusters of cells, if you can identify the round mm. nuclei, and variability in size of the nuclei. There are some cells which have multiple nuclei with very prominent nucleoli. So this is uh, typically non-small cell carcinoma. I don't want to give a definite diagnosis of an adeno or a squamous at this point of time what because right now our aim is only to uh, see that the material is sufficient for diagnosis. So 
what will you need for you know uh, a more better diagnosis so uh, a better diagnosis can be uh, obtained on a core biopsy specimen uh, sometimes the carcinomas are poorly differentiated and it's really difficult to say whether they are adeno or squamous so in that case on the core biopsy specimen we proceed with an immunohistochemistry that can help us to differentiate between the two Uh, can uh, one more pass be taken and uh, can uh, dr nishtha dr sonia demonstrate how we take a core biopsy okay uh, now we'll go to station 7 because we have obtained a negative section with uh, coda do that we'll take one negative so that we can show the core biopsy we have so, a diagnosis but we still need more material so shetu what we are now doing is we are doing it with negative section okay great ma'am so what do you expect with uh, a negative suction so the material will be more and that can be used for uh, hp and they can make a cell block out of that as you can see here there are these are this is a core art lymph node and i will inflate the balloon a little bit again give you the same procedure we had taken out the scope That's the crystal. Yes, that's the crystal. And these lines, the ultrasonographic lines, are the red of the lymph node, are the red. Because the balloon is not touching the bronchial wall. Now we have inserted the lesion inside, and we can also see the. Slightly outside, so I will pull it a little bit inside so that a proper crescent will be formed. I think this is yeah. okay. Now again, localizing this can be will be applied suction, and uh, can we put the balloon? If anyone has questions, you know, you can put it up at this point. We can ask the faculty. So the needle is inside. Many times, what happens that you encounter resistance, and the needle doesn't go inside. So that time, uh, try to change the angle a little bit and try from a different angle, because cartilage is often encountered. So now, if you look very carefully, they are going to apply negative suction. This is a vacuolog special syringe in which you can set a pressure. So if less material is coming, you can put more pressure. If more material and you are okay, you can put a pressure minus five to minus ten. So, uh, can you please, uh, you know, focus on the vacuum lock syringe? See, this is open, so this is a suction which is being given. Before you remove, you will have to lock it again and then uh, remove it. Otherwise, you are going to take the normal cells inside. So this is how uh, he is locking before he is taking off the negative suction. Now they will be showing how a core biopsy specimen is taken out of it, and how do you send it for a uh, histopathological examination? So uh, can you please focus on how the sample is retrieved? Can you come little near, please? What a nasty guy he is. So he is taking the sample on the butter paper, from which Dr. Arundhati will make a button, and from where the cell block will be prepared. That that's good material. That's a good material. So malignancy often you have good material. The problem comes when you have diseases such as sarcoidosis. Even in lymphoma, it's a big challenge. So, any inputs from anyone in the audience? How do you circumvent the low yield in 
like sarcoidosis anyone dr mohit you know how many of you are doing ebus currently ha so what do you do rahul kya lag raha hai matlab bahut mush kai bar aata hai bade bade nose hote hain kuch aata nahi hai i think you do question? multiple procedures uh, we were discussing about the low yield of you know sarcoid so uh, dr rahul here he is currently doing ebus so we were just discussing okay. that multiple sampling you know take blind endobronchial biopsies do trans bronchial lung biopsies and from the same uh, lymph node from different angles mm -hmm. yes different. and the most we important thing is ki to first take ebus every uh, every time and then go for trans bronchial or an endo bronchial mm. because if there is a bleeding then there will be a lot mm. of problem getting the endo bronchial i mean uh, the uh, endosono image and you you just saw how an ebus Dr. is done Sito, minimal one more bleeding thing i wanted to say yeah so uh, depending if you are doing rows depending on uh, the setup at your place you need to uh, keep done. the smears keep the dry or keep it immediately i have a positive so today what and, we did was to get it there. dry and use the uh, brilliant crystal is entry no but if your pathologist is more comfortable with the rapid hnd then you need to fix the smears immediately okay. and then uh, take them up for screen that's important me and dr arundhati you know they, we are always communicating almost on a weekly basis your smears were dried up they were drying artifacts and that is how we have improvised so be in touch with your pathologist they will give you inputs which are valuable in improving the yield of your procedure Ethanol is the best fixative uh, that you can use for uh, the HNA smears. Also, uh, keep in mind that as the season changes, when humidity increases, the purity of ethanol or methanol by itself reduces. So you may have to change your fixative solution very frequently. I remember Dr. Situ and I we discussed this problem also. We did a lot of brainstorming and we said, "Why is this a problem? Why is this? Why is it only problematic?" Chitu, do you want to take us station seven now? Yeah, that will be great, ma'am. One okay. more station. One more station. So, uh, and right now we are at the seven lymph node, and uh, this seven lymph node again we will be taking the party. So again, you see it is very heterogeneous. See the uh, here to add to the heterogeneous sign in the middle of the lymph node that is. Suggestive of malignancy. It is a hypoechoic tumor that is visible and it is highly specific for malignancy. So that region is visible. Uh, so taking a core is also important for diseases like lymphoma. So lymphoma, you need a biopsy. F N A C, nothing comes. So again, always try to take core as well, sample in saline and some slides as well. I think the more the merrier, as many samples from as many sites, especially like even sarcoid, you take sample everything. You can increase the any size. Any questions? Can, any questions from the audience? Just going in the center. Yeah, but you can go all the way. Yeah. Yeah, you have to go from cortex to cortex. Yeah. Tubercular nodes, when you sample, they are somewhat very hard, and especially a tubercular patient on ATT. Yeah. 
Yes, Rahul. We have a question from the audience. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I just wanted to ask, are you always inflating the balloon uh, while approaching really. every station or only during the uh, four hour when you are approaching the four hour you tend to uh, use the balloon and in case of like uh, station seven, uh, there's no need to use the balloon? That's correct. That's a brilliant question. There is no need to inflate balloon every time. I normally don't inflate the balloon even at four hour, but it comes with the experience. No need to inflate balloon every time. Eleven are inferior also. So, uh, what That's are we nice. doing with the sample, Dr. Sonia? Like, uh, can you see this? This is a fantastic material. And what are you going to keep it in? So, this is a button we are making out of the butter paper, and then we'll fix it and put it in formalin and make a cell block out of this. So, it's going to go in a formalin. Currently, I think, uh, are you keeping it in formalin? Yes. We are collecting it in a butter paper, forming a button. It forms a button, which helps in doing a cell block. You get a lot of material and it formulates a small button, I think. What I get? So, usually, if you have a very peculiar station, uh, Rahul, then I think you need to inflate the balloon again. Seven, sometimes you don't need the balloon as well. And you just simply inflate it in the beginning and, uh, you know, check it when you don't have a vision. I think uh, we did not demonstrate how the uh, there is a small sleeve of balloon. Did we, did, did they show we, that? We did, we, did, we did show you how the balloon is inflated and the crescent is formed. Okay, but not how to put the balloon, right? You want to see how to put the balloon? You can do it at the end. Uh, no, but you can show it during the tables, right? Yeah, we'll do that. Yeah, sure. you do it during we'll the do tables, it on yeah. the hands-on. Yeah, yeah. Correct. So it's like a small sleeve over the ultrasound probe. And you need oh, to have some saline inside. If Maybe you have air, it right. is not clearly visible. So once that is there, that gives you a good vision. So for ultrasound, you need to have saline. Air is not a good conductor. Are you taking more passes? Yeah, this is the last one, uh, Chitu. Okay. From station 7. It's not visible. Every time see to it that you can see, uh, you have to see the uh, shape outside. That's the one. If you don't see the uh, shape, you have to adjust every time. So you can access the seven both from the right side and on the left side. Can so anyone tell me what is this? Come on, who's going to volunteer? What's this? She's from the left side. What's this? You mean to say, uh, ma'am, what are you asking? This, this vascular structure. What is this? Yes. Now, who's going to answer? What's there behind behind the lymph node? What is there? You're on the left side, and uh, you have seven. Imagine, imagine the anatomy. What's this? Anyone? Okay, uh, Varun, do we have chocolates? Varun is also tired now. Okay, so the chocolate is due, you'll get it tomorrow. Anyone answer, na, this you'll is a get the chocolate thing. tomorrow. It's such a pulsatile thing. Come on, what is it? So, Aota, someone is saying Aota. Who? Anyone else? Do left atrium? Yes. So, who answered actually? Who uh, said left atrium? 
Dr. Anirudh. He has to take us for a party. We, uh, no, ma'am, we have promised him a chocolate. <laughs> okay, look at the needle, uh, needle entry. And did you see that uh, when we were swerving out the cell, there was a white fiber which was doing a form outside the needle. It was, those were the bronchial epithelial cells. And again, here we are taking the particles from one cortex. Tomorrow there are going to be a lot of questions from Ebus also. And the quiz winners will be announced very soon. As you can see, this is the green dot. Green dot is the head end. Basically, it is the head end of the tooth. So now you can see it. Are you planning more passes? No, I think it's enough, uh, Shetu. Yes, ma'am. So we have taken three passes from uh, four hours, including uh, the four, I mean, anterior as well as the four hour at, uh, uh, on the lateral side. And uh, we have also taken three passes from uh, station seven. Uh, two dried and two, uh, I mean, one uh, with the negative suction. And station seven, three with negative suction. Right, Nisha? And we have got adequate material we have collected for uh, the rows, we have collected in normal saline for microbiology and we have also uh, made a, uh, you know, a button from which we will do a cell block, collected into a formalin. So enough material has been given to the pathologist so that she would not have any you know, query that the material is inadequate. A check bronch here reveals that there is no bleeding and generally ebuses do not bleed because it is such a ultrasound guided, Doppler guided procedure that you never encounter the bleeding that you do in cases of normal routine bronchoscopies. However, you should be ready with the cold saline. So remember the slide from morning. Be ready. Now we are pulling the scope outside and we have to do continuous suction while we are pulling it out. And this will ensure that the vessel is getting deflated. And I'll also request uh, Sonia ma'am to be, you know, uh, back in the hall, yeah. everyone is excited for the debate. So I think wonderful uh, case that you had and I think the beauty was the, you know, diagnosis that came even, you know, when we were, before the second pass was completed. So now is the era of, you know, very targeted and specific therapy and uh, with good tissue chunks, you can I think uh, get uh, tissue for IHC tumor markers as well. So I, uh, you guys are wrapping up from the OT. Is it a done? Thank you. Thank you so much. So I'll now pass on the mic to uh, Dr. D.K. Jain. Thank you very much for nice demonstration of fever. Thank you so much, Dr. Nishtha, Dr. Sonia, and uh, Dr. Arundhati for such a wonderful live demonstration. I think uh, all the students here, you, are, are, you all are really lucky that you are working in the era of such uh, technology where the, um, where the interventions can be showed to you in the live. Otherwise, during our era, Shetu, when we were learning, it would be like a bang on fight that who's going to enter the OT. So six out of 50 people would be allowed to enter the theater. So I think it's a wonderful opportunity. And congratulations to the whole Rajasthan Lung Center team for organizing this. I think this is happening for the first time um, in Rajasthan that you all are doing this. So amazing job. Great. Had a wonderful time seeing this. Just to ask, what is the safety profile of EVAS? Like we are, we are seeing this. It was approaching the big vessels very near. So have you ever encountered the complication like that mediastinitis or bleeding in the mediastinum?
पर्सी अ वेरी सेफ प्रोसीजर एंड आई ऑलवेज मैंशन इट टू माई पेशेंट दैट इट्स सेफर देन अ ब्रॉन्कोस्कोपी सम हाउ द कॉम्प्लिकेशन इट इज मिनिमल द ओनली थिंग दैट कॉमनली वी एनकाउंटर इज फीवर a uh, few cases of mediastinitis just they resolve with normal antibiotic courses uh never had a death bronchoscopy you can sometimes but for evers it's quite a safe nr is fine nothing will happen and even if you enter these major vessels nothing happens generally in fact nowadays uh, the nodes beyond the para the aortic arch also are being accessed with the help of the needle the needle going through the arch of aorta and ac across to the nodes and they sample that also so uh, the bleeding risk is minimal even if you enter a vessel nothing to worry just withdraw and don't enter back again so i think that wraps it up and uh, now uh, we will wait for the debate which will start within a couple of minutes thank you uh thank you sonia ma'am and nishtha ma'am for the wonderful session it was a brilliant session with pulmonologist and pathologist side by side and diagnosis in hand now i request dr shitu singh ma'am to uh, give momento to dr uh, vijayan solanki dr srishti jain and to dr dk jain dr srishti jain I repeat, Vijay and Solangi sir, to the stage. In few minutes, we will be starting with the debate, and the debate will be moderated by Dr. Suresh Kolwal.
before starting the debate session, now let me welcome Dr. Suresh Kolwar, sir, to the dais. He is the former senior professor of respiratory medicine, SMS Medical College, Jaipur, and he has been a fellow in Royal College of Physicians, Edinburgh, former president in, of Indian Association of Bronchology, former vice president, Indian College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology, co-editor, current medical friends, editorial board member, Indian Journal of Allergy, Aller Asthma and Immunology. Organized two international level conference on allergy, asthma and immunology in Jaipur. And he was an organizing secretary in it. Received Rajasthan Gaurav 2015 award. Received Dr. A.S. Paintal and Dr. R.C. Jane Oration award in NAPCON 2016 from Mumbai. Received Dr. T.N. Sharma Oration award in Raj Palmokorn and received the presidential oration in Brongokorn. Member of the National Committee to Frame position statement on transbronchial cryolung biopsy. We welcome you, sir, to the occasion. Dr. Raghunath is here. Okay. Uh, uh, good evening. And the session now is the interesting debate on the sampling methods uh, on peripheral nodules. And uh, there are two speakers. Dr. Raghunath Anand believes that CT guided uh, approach for the peripheral nodules is better as compared to the interventional pulmonology. So I'll invite uh, Dr. Raghunath to speak in his favor. Uh, Dr. Raghunath is Master of doc uh, Doctor of Radio Diagnosis. He has many fellowship in MSK MRI. He is visiting fellowship in musculoskeletal and uh, neuroradiology from the Duke University, New York, USA. And he has fellowship in vascular interventional radiology from Tata Memorial Center, Mumbai. He has been trained in EVR by Medatronics and his fellow course in radio frequency ablation, Zutendo University, Tokyo, Japan. And uh, also uh, he has taken stroke intervention training from Spain and also training in the neuro intervention from Germany. Dr. Ragunath, please. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Dr. Ragunath and I am working as an interventional radiologist in RHL since last five, uh, two years and uh, before joining to RHL I was, in, uh, uh, I was working as an assistant professor in interventional radiology in DMH uh, Mumbai and uh, when I got uh, this letter for this, this topic is there and I am sharing a stage with uh, Dr. Sonia Dalal ma'am I did my research a little bit and then I got to know, I was surprised and uh, honestly to say, rather than surprised, I was scared a little bit uh, by seeing that uh, she is doing all these procedures since very long time. So I, first slide is, I charted the experience wise. So ma'am, <laughs> Ma'am was senior, regi senior registrar in KEM in 2000 and at that time I was in 10th standard. And in 2001 to 3, uh, 2003 ma'am was in Hinduja and I was in my 12th. And in 2013 I saw ma'am's CV. So in 2013 ma'am was invited as a faculty in Chicago and at that time I completed my MD in radio diagnosis. So basically it was like, oh my God, where, I'm, uh, where am I landing in, in what situation? So it is my sincere and humble request that be uh, kind with, to, with me in the rebuttal session for next, uh, in, otherwise the situation will be like that. <laughs> so moving on to the topic, 
that image guided lung biopsies plays a very important role in diagnosis of the uh, different kind of lung conditions that uh, may be the malignant, benign or the infective etiology. Traditionally, and to the date, peripheral lung masses are sampled through percutaneous technique and uh, the lesions, those are involving, involving the trachea bronchial tree uh, are uh, approached by the bronchoscopy and the lesions which are in the subcarinal or paratracheal uh, area, those are accessed with the help of e uh, The Most of the chest lesions that uh, can include the uh, lung wall lesions or the uh, chest wall, bone, peripheral lung nodules, central node, uh, nodules or in the subcarinal sub nodes also can be accessed by the uh, uh, CT guided approach. But uh, the most important thing while going for the diagnosis of the lung lesion is to have a well clinical radiological picture of the disease and choose an optimal modality of the a biopsy for uh, how to go about it. Uh, basically it depends on the whether the lesion is uh, located, whether it is in the deep parenchyma, in the per peripheral parenchyma, whether it is adjacent to the bronchus or whether it is uh, adjacent to the great vessels or all these factors needs to be in the con consideration to uh, find the proper optimal mod modality of the choice for the biopsy. And of course the local av availability of expertise al is also required for different kind of situations. The, all of you must be knowing the all the uh, indications of the biopsies. The most common are the for the diagnosis of the benign or malignant lesions and second most is for the staging of the disease. Uh, rest of the things uh, you must be knowing. So in short, I'll be uh, briefing the biopsy technique. So uh, basically, uh, after taking patient to the CT, ta uh, say CT table, we uh, do, do the marking under the CT guidance stand from, uh, which, uh, from which section or from which area we need to take a biopsy and we do a uh, marking on the skin. After the marking, we do a uh, preparation of the uh, patient's uh, particular area and that is under sterile condition. And after that, we again put a uh, small needle that is usually by uh, the uh, 22 gauze needle at the site and we take a CT scan whether the, whether the marked area is appropriate or not uh, to enter into the lung. And uh, after giving a local injection, the, this one is the coaxial needle. We, uh, before entering inside, we ma measure the distance of the lesion which is uh, from the skin surface to the uh, periphery of the lesion and we mark it uh, on the needle with this uh, rubber band. It comes in uh, with the needle uh, itself only and after putting that inside, after this, uh, I have not included city pictures in this but after each of this, uh, this step, we took, uh, take a uh, city cut. This this is how we uh, this is how the sample. This is how we take the samples. Uh, that uh, uh, the uh, the good samples you can see a, uh, a, a long two centimeter core with uh, white tissue inside, and the small the if we getting if we are getting a such uh, scattered or fragmented tissue, uh, these. Uh, usually indicate the necrosis we are getting the material from the necrotic area or either the uh, tumor is so uh, spongious in nature. So I am uh, showing some cases which we have done in past uh, few months over here. So uh, these are the biopsies of uh, so, uh, so these are the biopsies uh, from the solitary pulmonary nodule which are located in the periphery of the lesion, uh, periphery of the lung. We are uh, getting a sample from the uh, percutaneous approach on the both sides uh, uh, in the prone position. And the uh, 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 these type of biopsies are very easy to uh, do and the sample size or the sample uh, quality is very good in this uh, such type of lesions. The difficult lesions are uh, like cavitatory lesions or uh, the lesions having uh, large necrotic inside and uh, necrotic area inside the lesion. These are some difficult uh, biopsies that uh, the lesion which is just adjacent to, peri adjacent to pericardium on both the sides. Uh, these, uh, 
are these are quite difficult and avoid to risky procedures because uh, the uh, risk of puncturing the pericardium is quite high in these type of cases this is an interesting case uh, in which the twice the uh, ebus was done outside somewhere in delhi and uh, it came negative and uh, it was a primary uh, it, it was a case of uh, treated lymphoma and they wanted to get some uh, uh, this was this was the picture paraortic some soft tissue was there on the and it was showing a pet uptick so it was referred for the biopsy and, and the ebus was negative twice so we took a biopsy from the uh, under the city guidance and the, we can you can see the biopsy our bi biopsy needle just between the aorta and the bronchus these these are some more uh, cases that uh, small nodules of uh, 10 12 m 12 mm nodule in left ap apical region one more lesion is there in the anterior uh, anterior mediastinum we did uh, the extra pleural we uh, uh, did the biopsy to the extra pleural approach in this region and uh, one more interesting case was there this, this, there was a large subcranial node and uh, patient was actually referred for ebus but uh, uh, the patient was primary case of uh, ch base of tongue and there was absolutely no mouth opening was there so we did the biopsy with the uh, hydro dissection and the uh, hydrogel technique so coming to the topic this Uh, radial ebus versus ct guided um, biopsy this this was this is an article with the 160 patients uh, study and it was showing in conclusion that both radial ebus and the ct guided biopsies are very good diagnostic uh, diagnostic uh, tools for the solitary pulmonary nodule but uh, the experience located in the uh, medial half of the lung fields or were those were adjacent to the great vessel are uh, very well fitted for the ebus uh, radial ebus and those uh, uh, nodules which were located in the lateral half of the lung field or near the, the near to the pleura uh, those are more suitable for the ct guided biopsy uh, this article was published in uh, 2016 sh uh, showing that there, there is an 88% sensitivity rate of the flexible bron bronchoscopy in case of central region but, but uh, the uh, sens sensitivity is quite lower in the peripheral region it also stated that the radial uh, endobronchial ultrasound has an sensitivity sensitivity higher for lesions more than 2 cm also the uh, it has shown that ct guided uh, procedures used for the diagnosis of primary uh, tumor particularly in case of peripheral lung tumor which are uh, uh, better in uh, the yield uh, rather than the bronchoscopic procedure uh, one more meta analysis uh, showed that the ebus uh, trans bronchial lung biopsy is safe and relatively accurate tool in the investigation of uh, peripheral uh, uh, lung lesions although the yield remains uh, the yield uh, remains lower than the ct guided biopsy in such cases however the potential risk like uh, uh, hemorrhage or the pneumothorax were uh, uh, more in the ct guided biopsy this is an uh, uh, this uh, this article is on the western data showing that the almost uh, it is e economically equivalent <laughs> so economic economically equivalent that e was uh, tvlb and ct guided percutaneous biopsies are uh, almost uh, causing uh, al almost at the same cost but it is it is in it is a western data and we'll discuss in the rebuttal <laughs> no no <ma> <laughs> and uh, last article is uh, from uh, india only that uh, the Uh, radial ebus guided uh, uh, transbronchial lung biopsies and transbronchial brushing are excellent modalities in the evaluation of peripheral lesions however these techniques cannot access lesions that are located adjacent to the bron uh, pr proximal bronchus due to presence of cartilaginous wall these those are some uh, disadvantages or the uh, we can say that uh, the limitations of the ultrasound if we see the thick structure or the bone or the cart, uh, cart, uh, cal calcified cartilage we cannot see beyond that 
or if uh, there is a uh, uh, large or the significant length uh, width of lung parenchyma between the nodule and the probe then also it is difficult to see so uh, basically the uh, the debate will go on the uh, complications of the ct guided biopsy because overall the articles are showing that yield or the efficacy is almost similar in the ebus guided procedures and the ct guided procedures but overall uh, uh, if we see the complications are more in the ct guided biopsies rather than the ebus guided procedure so moving forwards how to minimize these complications there are uh, previously the complications uh, it was uh, the data was limited till the complications only but later on the uh, uh, how we uh, calculated data with that uh, 25% overall in this is uh, this study is including meta analysis meta analysis is including almost 23000 of cases and overall uh, the range of uh, pneumothorax if we see is from 3 to 29% the mean is around 25.9% uh, and out of this 25% of pneumothorax the chest pain requirement was in 6.9% of the patients so uh, so the uh, uh, basically the uh, most common and important complication in the ct guided biopsies is the uh, pneumothorax Uh, the pulmonary hemorrhage and pain are quite manageable or the not uh, <coughs> frequent in the uh, current situation so how to avoid pneumothorax so now the uh, there are some certain methods this one is the oldest method to avoid the pneumothorax uh, in that the uh, this was particularly uh, described during the procedures post procedural pneumothorax in the lobectomy it is uh, in this procedure uh, the uh, the autologous blood patch is we remove the 10 to 15 ml in cases of biopsy uh, uh, in cases of post biopsy persistent air leak we remove the 10 to 15 ml of autologous blood from the intra intra venous line which is already there in the patient and we put that uh, same blood into the chest cavity to form the coagulation and it uh, the it is having a very good results in stopping the persistent pneumothorax to uh, to prevent the pneumothorax is the gel phone in injection while after doing the biopsy after getting the pores while coming uh, while coming out of the lung uh, we inject the gel phone during the tract so the uh, the it prevents the possibility of entering the air or the leaking the air into the pleural cavity this is the recent most recent article which is which was published in 2022 and uh, it it was the pearl study which was conducted in us and uh, it showed that uh, it, uh, they give us uh, some particular criteria uh, to uh, to avoid the pneumothorax in which uh, first one is the uh, positioning down uh, position uh, the biopsy when after the biopsy we just patient uh, uh, turn down to the same side which from where we have done the biopsy the uh, second point is the uh, removing of the needle during the expiration then autologous blood sampling which i have seen, uh, shown you previously the rapid door uh, roll over and the pleural patching is uh, again the uh, autologous blood patch only one more thing is uh, which is uh, important in the if we uh, if any of you going to do a ct guided biopsy then uh, we should you should keep the angle between the pleura and the needle as uh, as right as possible because whenever we decrease the angle from the near, uh, which is this angle this is the this is the pleura and this is the angle of the needle if we if we may calculate this angle and if this angle is less than 80 degrees uh, then there are the, it increases the chances of pneumothorax and in, in less than uh, 50 degrees it uh, gives the, it is very high chances of pneumothorax in such cases i think is an approach it is it is like uh, uh, in in our institute uh, we are doing the same thing 
we are discussing each and every case with the pulmonologist Shitu ma'am and uh, their team that whether uh, they want to go for whether the this lesion is uh, approachable with the uh, ebus or with the bronchoscopic biopsies or we should go from the city guidance sometimes uh, uh, it happens that uh, patient is uh, the sample is coming negative with the bronchoscopic technique then we go for the uh, city guided and if uh, the city guided is not feasible or city guided is uh, the uh, not uh, required then we ask ma'am to go for the bronchoscopic biopsy yeah, thank you, Dr. Agnath. Uh, according to you, uh, if a lesion is uh, in the lateral half of or the end pleura, can be easily approached by CT guided, or if there are complications because of CT guided, can be prevented with certain techniques. But Dr. Sonia Dalal thinks that it is not true, and she thinks that IP is better than uh, the CT guided procedure for sampling peripheral lesions. So, Dr. Dalal has worked as senior registrar in the Department of Chest Medicine at KM Hospital, Mumbai. She took special training in the respiratory and critical care at Beach Candy Hospital, Mumbai. And uh, her field of interest are sleep medicine, international pulmonology, severe obstructive airway disease, and ILD. And she was conferred with fellowship of American College of Chest Vision in 2008. She has presented posters on asthma and COPD at European Respiratory Congress, and she was invited as faculty at ACCP Chicago in year 2013, Dr. Dalal. Yeah. Thank you, Lordship. I think this was a debate. Uh, my learned friend was trying to convince, uh, and he in, fa in fact has uh, accepted the fact that there are a lot of complications of city guided biopsies, and how to tackle. I mean, look at the old age era of blood, uh, autologous blood patches, and uh, uh, how do we tackle uh, those pneumothorax? So he probably keeps himself busy tackling the complications. Uh, your Lordship, it's my job to prove, right? What is better and what is not? Look, again, I'm not here to fight with my learned friend. I'm just trying to prove my point and prove my point to all of you. What you should decide, as he rightly said, only thing which I agree to him, and unanimously you also should take this point, it has to be a multidisciplinary discussion, which is very important. That you all discuss forgetting your egos, forgetting everything, and which is the best approach for the patient. Let me start with my presentation. Dr. Kulwal will agree that this was this is a debate. Right. Okay. Fine. All right. So before I start, ladies and gentlemen, I have a disclaimer to make. This debate is strictly professional and nothing personal. Okay, there is no intention of hurting anyone's feeling, especially this gentleman who's such a nice fellow who was in the school when I was a graduate. So I don't intend he's like a kid in front of me. Right? And political correlations included uh, in this in this presentation are strictly humorous, and they don't don't represent any individual bias. So, my dear friend, outside this room, we both are friends, right? You remember Hamtum? We are just like that. Okay. He forgot the basic stuff. What is a peripheral pulmonary nodule? The talk was how to approach peripheral pulmonary nodule, right? So we. Till date, in 2022 also, we don't have a definite definition of peripheral pulmonary nodule. Okay, so what is it? Peripheral pulmonary lesions are generally considered as lesions in the peripheral one-third of the lung, although precise definition and radiographic anatomical landmark separating the central and the peripheral lesion does not exist. Right, so it's anyone's pick. Okay, it's anyone's pick. The radiographical detection of such lesions has increased significantly with the adoption of lung cancer screening program. And these lesions are directly visible, uh, not directly visible by regular flexible bronchoscope as they are usually distal to lobar and segmental bronchi. Your Honor, I agree and I admit that if I use a simple bronchoscope, I'm not going to have an access to this lymph node or to this nodule. So this is how a peripheral nodule 
what uh, my learned friend has shown would look like. Okay, and that is how we need to take a biopsy from. And what's the ideal clinical pathway? Initially, you know, what happens if there is a simple nodule without any mats or anything? If it is malignant, you resect it. But then you need to prevent the lung wave, and you have to prove that it is a benign lesion. That you have to prove before you do a resection. All of us have grown up reading Alice in Wonderland, right? So it is said that if you don't know where you are going, any road will take you there. And this is very important. You need to know. So any all the learned all the upcoming you know pulmonologist, whenever you are doing any procedure, always make a road map. How we are going to go through that? Discuss with your colleagues. Make a road map and then only do that procedure. This is very important. With plan A, plan B, and the complications you can encounter during this. So, how do we approach a peripheral lesion? A solitary pulmonary nodule often are challenges to endoscopic. I agree again, Your Honor. Uh, approximately one fourth of the lung primaries they present as SPN. To, and to make the diagnosis, tissue we always need a tissue. And pathologists are always in hunger of more and more tissue. A tissue is always an issue, right? And the standard options to obtain these tissues have bronchoscopic, transbronchial biopsy, a CT guided biopsy, transthoracic needle aspiration. By or uh, you know uh, biopsies and surgical biopsies. What are the limits? My friend has already agreed that there are a lot of complications to a CT guided biopsy. 15 to 28 percent are reported, and we and also have a poor predictive negative value. So PET is promising, but sometimes it has a false positive and negative uh, yields. Yield for standard bronchoscopic techniques are very variable. Look at it; it varies from 18 to 75 percent. It is highly influenced by the size and the location, which is already, con you know, set. If it is less than three centimeters, the yield is poor, right? Just so, just don't get standard scope to the lesion. Again, I agree and I admit. Not that I'm going to lose the case, right? I agree to what he said, but I have my own counters as well, right? So, how do we overcome this? How do we? Because we have to give an answer to the patient, right? So, attempts to improve is CT fluoroscopy. Virtual bronchoscopy, ultra thin bronchoscopes, electromagnetic navigation, and of course, a radial ebus. Ladies and gentlemen, there is always a light at the end of the tunnel, and now we have moved way beyond the COVID era and now in, into 2022. So, Your Honor, all the PPNs are not chased by CTs, right? And I have my only five counters multimodality approach. Staging and rows, diagnostic yields, the complications, and the cough. Let's debate, my dear friend. Yeah. So this is my counter one. Okay, is this too simple? Is this all very simple? For him, it's going to be so simple. You know, he'll just put in a needle and give you an, uh, uh, give your diagnosis after 72 hours or a 48 hours, right? But what about this? What about this? Look at the size of the nodule, where the arrow goes. What about this? What about this? This and this, right? What What do you do in this? I'm sure he one. I mean, he is a very talented radiologist. Is going to do. I saw him going into the mediastinum, right? With when the um, mouth was not opening. But there are a lot of radiologists who cannot do it, right? Let us be very honest. We don't get nagvegars everywhere, right? So there are people who are not going to do it. I mean, if you have a small nodule which is less than three centimeters, what are you going to do? Are you going to going to give to a radiologist who probably doesn't know even that he go pick up the nodule, right? And then tell me one thing, uh, all the PG students, which cavity is benign and which is malignant? Can anyone tell me which cavity is benign and which cavity is malignant? Very difficult to say, right? Right now, if I do a CT guided biopsy of a cavity, I'm not going to miss lot of lot of important things. Simple lavage is going to give me an answer in case of a benign that the patient is AFB positive. Right, so that is the multimodality approach. When I put in a scope, I do everything. Right, I take a lavage, I do a biopsy, I do an EBUS. Right, so this is benign, and this probably would have a tuberculosis or you cannot say on a CT scan, right? And if you have a positive bronchus sign, right, then you can take a lavage, you can take a transbronchial biopsy, you can do a radius, you can do an electromagnetic navigation, and if you have lymph nodes, you can also do a linear ribus. But the 
इश्यू इज यू हैव टू गिव द डायग्नोसिस टू द पेशेंट राइट पेशेंट आएगा वो बोलेगा यार मेरे मुझे आंसर चाहिए बाबा कैसे भी करो राइट वेदर रेडियोलॉजिस्ट इज गोइंग टू डू और पल्मोनोलॉजिस्ट इज डू गोइंग टू डू इज नॉट द क्वेश्चन द क्वेश्चन इज पेशेंट वॉन्ट्स आंसर so this is a 72 year old male smoker he has got a nodule in the right lower lobe but look at the hilum look at the station 7 can you see the lymph nodes can you see the lymph nodes we did we did uh, ebus just an hour back can you see the lymph nodes now if you do a ct guided biopsy what are you missing what are you missing hum logo ne itna kharab ebus kiya kya situ koi bolta nahi hai So if we do, if if Dr. Nagwekar is just going to give you a tissue with a pneumothorax or a bleeding, right? What are you missing? You are missing the staging. Look, I am going to get. No, no. Look, I am not talking about IHC. What I am trying to tell you is, I'll do a radial ebus and I'll do a linear ebus, right? When I do a linear ebus, I know that the patient is malignant. ओके यस आईएचसी आल्सो वी टेक कोर्स आईएचसी उसमें से इट यू विल गेट कोर्स सो एवरीवन इज नॉट अरुंधति आई एग्री एंड एवरीवन इज नॉट नागवेकर राइट बट नो विथ इबस आल्सो वी गेट गुड कोर्स एंड इफ इट इज मेलिग्नेंसी वी गेट गुड कोर्स सो वी रोज इज गोइंग टू टेल यू इट्स एन एडिक्वेट मटेरियल नंबर 1 and then we take out the uh, you know uh, every uh, the course and do it go for histopathology make, make a cell block yes we do a cell block no no we are now we are very good we know what the pathology wants we know that they always give me more so we give them my thing is uh, your your core is doing a cell block and our core is that the actual core of the tissue so but we are giving through a radial biopsy a radial yeah, ebus yeah dr raghunath well. you will get time yeah. uh, 2 minutes to explain yeah we are going a rebuttal <laughs> yeah rebuttal so i am not being opportunist ladies and gentlemen i am an honest to my process i you know my profession not opportunist i'm sorry i again said uh, this is just a political humor okay we have so many things in our armamentarium right we have if we use judiciously we can give a good answer and the yield is good right okay uh so we have a bronchoscope we have the radial ebus we have electromagnetic navigation we have a linear ebus we have a cryo probe and now we have a 1.1 cryo probe through which as you rightly said we can take an ebus 1.1 uh, you know F, uh, fna or a biopsy from the lymph node as well right and a transbronchial biopsies so we all know what is radial ebus it allows the real time imaging of the airway walls and beyond uh, there is localization and sampling of the peripheral nodules as well as the masses and it also helps in uh, localizing all those lesions which have got positive bronchus sign that is airway invasion or versus compression that is the sign to stop and this is how the equipment looks like you know uh, i'm sure uh, shitu would show it on the table uh, do we have radial ebus no okay, fine so uh, we have uh, you know a, a balloon and which has it has got a, a mini 2.8 mm working channel and uh, here the frequency is 20 hertz and you can visualize 4 cm 4 cm around and the probe rotates it's moving continuously 360 degrees and it is going to pick up the lesion when it is passes through the bronchoscope so this is how when the sheath goes in there is a, a probe which probe goes here it is going there is a transducer it is going to isolate this and then the probe comes out the sheath remains inside it marks from where you have to end, uh, you have, uh, how much you the forceps or the cryo probe would go and this is how the biopsy forceps or a cryo would go and you can get the material so if it is inside the airways it would look like this this is the mass and if it is compressing the lesion this is the mass my counter two you give it to the radiologist they will give you the answer after 48 to 72 hours our radiologist or any radiologist when we do any procedure they give us within 5 minutes right so the thing is it's rose we do a rose also right so differentiating the granulomas differentiating caseating granulomas differentiating 
uh, adenocarcinomas, squamous cell carcinomas, lymphomas, all these things we would come to know when we do a rose, right? So rose technique allows bronchoscopies to obtain viable and adequate material for diagnosis of histopath for, uh, histopathology and provides them with an on-site preliminary diagnosis, okay? My counter three, the diagnostic yield, right? So diagnostic yield, as he rightly said, is good. So I don't have to prove myself. He himself has accepted. The diagnostic yield of a CT-guided biopsy as well as a radial EBUS is more or less the same to the tune of 77 to 88%. Just to show you some of the papers, uh, what it, uh, uh, EBUS and SPN, this is by Felix Hirth, and he is the, uh, is the one who is instrumental in uh, the radial EBUS. Uh, he is yield in SPN less than 3 centimeters is pretty good. Right, he has diagnosed 48 out of 54 lesions. He is localized with EBUS. 38 out of 54 were had a good diagnostic yield, and he saved a surgical procedure. Two were sarcoid, three were TB, two metastatic disease, and two small cell carcinomas. What about peripheral tumors? Again, 150 consecutive patients, single center study with peripheral tumors. Scope advanced to the bronchoscope of interest. Guide sheet introduced as I, as I showed. Probe in advanced until resistance. Radial EBUS performed. The yield is 77%, and if you combine brush and the biopsy forceps, the yield is 81%, as good as a CT-guided biopsy. Right, so over here, you are doing a lavage, you are doing a biopsy, you are doing a brushing, and if need be, if there is a lymph node, you are also doing a linear reverse. Right? He said size, right? So size of less than 3 centimeter, my dear friend, even the CT-guided biopsy, even the CT guided biopsy is not going to give a good yield, a less than 3 centimeter. Right? None of the studies have shown a less than 3 centimeter CT guided has a good yield. But here, if you look more than 3 centimeters, the yield is to the tune of 92%. Let's talk about the new kid on the block, electromagnetic navigation. I'm sure Dr. Mahindra is coming tomorrow, he's going to talk on that as well. And he can highlight what it is. It has a software in the uh, CT scan where they'll help you in mapping and mapping and identifying the lymph node and then there is a virtual bronchoscope and it will guide you through up to the peripheral lymph peripheral nodule and look at the diagnostic yield through electromagnetic navigation and combining forceps tbna brushing and everything the yield is to the tune of 88 percent this is a small video from my dear friend who is going to come tomorrow how he has done I, is it visible So this is how the mapping is done. There is a nodule over there. The green one is the nodule. And that's the electromagnetic navigation. That's the mapping which is done. And that's the virtual bronchoscopy through which it will guide you how you have to go. And if you have an ultra thin bronchoscope along with a cryoprobe, you can go up to the 10th level or the 10th generation also. how the radial ebus goes and it takes a biopsy and uh, can you see the lymph uh, the tumor which is there surrounding uh, the radial probe and there the forcep goes and it takes a biopsy from the peripheral lymph uh, peripheral nodule and you get the malignancy so my counter four is you know the uh, is a cohort study my dear friend has already shown electromagnetic navigation bronchoscopy versus city guided percutaneous sampling of a peripheral nodule. Look at a, after the CT guided, look at the pneumothorax. He himself has agreed, so I don't have to prove my point. The uh, complication rates uh, following a CT guided procedure are more compared to a bronchoscopic interventions. Look at this, the complication of as a function of biopsy, there are significant more pneumothoraces which is identified in the CT guided biopsy than an electromagnetic uh, bronchoscopy guided biopsy after adjustment were made for the risk factors and also more hemorrhage post city guided biopsies. One more uh, from China where they compared endobronchial ultrasound transdermal biopsy and city guided trans uh, 
thoracic uh, lung biopsies where they, this was a meta analysis and this meta analysis shows that uh, you know the procedure has a higher risk with city guided compared to the ebus i'll go in the interest of the time and this is my last yeah. counter counter 5 that's the cost and this is the study which is out of australia melbourne right where they have shown that city guided biopsy is cheaper compared to endo i mean the bronchoscopic procedure but when you look at the complications and tackling of the complications both becomes equal so there was a sensitivity analysis which says that when you encounter complications through a ct guided the cost is higher compared to that of a bronchoscopic procedure and this is how the graph is if you see when you look at the complications the i mean the procedural charges of ct guided procedure is more so my take home points ladies and gentlemen is full diagnostic yield of 70% higher than traditional bronchoscopy techniques of the new technique diagnostic yield for guided bronchoscopy techniques lower than t for ttna however adverse event rate also significantly lower in bronchoscopic procedure compared to a ct guided procedure yield depends on the size of the lesion use of virtual bronchoscopy radial ebus guide sheet may have a greater influence on the guided yield so ladies and gentlemen you have everything please don't allow your patient to suffer right ye mera hai ye tera hai don't do this right at the end of the day who is suffering it's the patient right so it's very important that we have a multi modality approach right we discuss i said i agree when it is a big nodule which is touching the or which near to the chest wall i would 100% give it to nagwekar right but if you think that this needs some lot of things then you do a bronchoscopic procedure so ladies and gentlemen at the end i would like to say choose but choose wisely okay i rest my case your honor yeah dr dalal has put her points very strongly and as she said the multi modality approach can be used uh, with ip like she can uh, with the newer techniques like uh, electromagnetic navigation radial ebus it's possible to approach a smaller lesion at peripherally situated and the complications rate is also uh, not more, more than that of the ct guided biopsy and the yield is always better as compared to ct guided biopsy as uh, suggested by dr dalal now in um, favor of your points dr ravunathan what do you want to tell you will get 2 minutes to say the yield is uh, the all the articles are showing the yield is better in city guided biopsy the complication rate is higher in city guided rather than ebus and this technique you have shown that uh, elect uh, electromagnetic or the bronchial mapping uh, does everyone knows that how does the virtual bronchoscopy is done yeah i know just i am asking for virtual bronchoscopy you need to do a ct if you are going for the ct then why not going for a ct biopsy it's it's matter of hardly 2 and 3000 rupees that is the last point ma'am i think uh, one more thing that uh, the on site uh, this that is a good we also in tata all started for 5 years back that on site we had pathos, uh, the the microscope in our department interventional radiology but uh, the thing is uh, because this procedure is to cumbersum or the it is it is done in the uh, uh, the the on site the starting of on site uh, reading of slides was started in our setup for the uh, in the purpose of uh, the Uh, the, as the procedure is endoscopic, the anesthesia has, has to be given, and then after that, if we send these slides and it comes negative, uh, then the procedure, the repeat procedure is quite difficult in the EBUS. That's why the, it it was started in the department that on-site uh, microscopy microscope was uh, uh, the kept available, and the the rose I think rose uh, rose protocol was started. so if if we if uh, same thing is uh, available with the radiology or uh, in any setup it is just uh, like we, if we are putting a needle inside 
we can do a FNAC also, that is not an issue. And we can get a, this uh, report in at, on the same time only, that is not an issue. The, uh, uh, the, I am agreeing with ma'am with one, only one point with the complications. Uh, that is uh, uh, the because uh, the that but uh, nowadays this all the after reading all those articles and after doing so much of cases uh, the uh, complication rate is so much lower it is not like it's in all every uh, every alternate case you will see the pneumothorax in out uh, we, uh, in fact we are seeing uh, pneumothorax in uh, we have seen uh, out of 100 cases, we have seen 2-3 cases only. And we are almost, we are just not doing biopsies those uh, of those nodules we, which are just less than 4 mm. Otherwise, we are doing the biopsy of every nodule anywhere it is placed. And uh, we are avoiding, nowadays we are avoid, uh, uh, our, if the purpose of patient should go for the EPS. That is. Thank you. Uh, now, uh, I'll leave the conclusion on the floor because you have heard both the speakers. So, how many of you believe that CT guided biopsy is better than IP for peripheral lesions? Raise your hands. Nobody believes. One. <laughs> No fight, no fight. <laughs> and how many believes IP is better uh, as compared to? <laughs> so there are pulmonologists who are wants to send their patients to interventional radiologists. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shitu, for inviting me. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dalal, Dr. Raghunatham, for a nice debate. Thank you, the entire team. I think everyone will be out of sleep now. And thank you, Sonia ma'am, for your dynamic vibes. Now, I request Dr. Suresh Kolwal, sir, to give the moment to Dr. Raghunath and to Dr. Sonia. request ma'am to give the certificate to Now I request Dr. Nishta Singh to the dais to felicitate Dr. Uh, Suresh Kolwal, sir. Sorry, Nishta ma'am is not present here. I request Fido ma'am to facilitate Suresh Kolwal, sir. We'll be shortly displaying the quiz winners in the screen. We have selected eight of them and divided into four teams and the main round will be tomorrow. Team won by IRD Dr. Aditya Agarwal and Dr. Ru Rubal Nair. Team 2 by Dr. Jaipal. Dr. Jaipal and Dr. Jitain. Team 3 
गीतांजलि डॉक्टर रौनक एंड डॉक्टर अदुल लोहारी टीम फोर डॉक्टर हर्षिल अलवानी एंड डॉक्टर राहुल अलवालिया now we will be having the hands on work station for which the everyone was excited from the morning itself for your own session so now let me invite dr sheetu singh to the stage she will explain more in details of the procedures so i hope uh, everyone enjoyed it has been a hectic day with live sessions and uh, debates and now finally the hands on i think all of you are awaiting that because this is when you get to experience how to de do these procedures so we have made it very streamlined so that each and every one of you can do the procedure on the mannequin or the pig model so we have three stations uh, the basic bronchoscopy and the cryo lung biopsy station which is outside just behind you then the uh, one in front of the lift is the eba station and third but not the last is the thoracoscopy station so i would request um, i think there are 33 uh, people here so there will be 11 in each uh, i think dr harshil is sitting behind yes so uh, he is also one of the finalists tomorrow so i think one uh, the first row none, no one is sitting the second and third row can go to station 1 the fourth and fifth can go to station 2 and the remaining rest of you can go to station 3 i think that sounds like a plan so before you move on to your station there's some tea and uh, cookies and high tea so i would request you to move for that and like in 10 minutes time we will start the station thank you for uh, one last announcement we have dinner at marriott hotel starting at 8 and this is uh, a, also accompanied by a very exciting image challenge all the interventional pulmonologists have to have nerve of steel that means you all will be encountering difficulties how you bypass them and how you showcase uh, your talent that how it can be managed so we will be having some luminaries you know defining their cases how they went about so it is again going to be an exciting round so let's meet at 8 at marriott after we close today thank you